Welcome back, Smite fans, to the Road to World playoff event. We just had some great action to start off our day. You've got Frog, you've got Inbound, keeping it going on the desk. And after that, that J Dragon sticks Ferryman said, I, I'm just, e I'm eager for some more action. And I want to go back over it, just just in case you're just joining us, right? We're, we're talking through a couple of it, how this event works, right? We've got all best of five, very similar to the Road to World phase up until now. Top four teams qualify for the Smite World Championship main bracket. So we just had one qualify up there. The winner of this next match will also qualify to that, and then two other teams throughout the weekend. The bottom two teams who don't make it will head down to the group stage bracket. And at the end of all that, once we decide the group stage winners later on in January, the top seeded teams here from this event will get to choose their matchup. Number one seed will choose from any qualified team from the group stage. Number two seed will get the next choice, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. So these matches, much you know, a little bit more important if you want that seeding advantage. Right now, in that one versus two matchup, right, the Sticks Ferryman they just qualified to Worlds. They're going to be contending for that first and second seed, right? We're going to see that matchup on Sunday. As for who they're going to be playing, it's going to be this next matchup on screen. Oni Warriors versus the Atlantis Leviathans is coming up now. And we talk a lot about momentum, and momentum matters a lot when you get to the end of the year. So winning this, going to play against the Ferryman for that number one seed, you'll have all the momentum in the world heading towards Worlds. But until then, one set at a time. You want to win as many as you can, obviously. And we got, a, we got a great one right now. This is going to be a wonderful set. This is going to be a hard-fought set. You've got the number one seed from the Chaos Division, the number two seed from the Order Division, Italy, Atlantis, Leviathans. Levi, of course, they're coming off their win from yesterday. So they have a little bit of momentum just as, as so far as this weekend goes. And the Oni Warriors, they're, they're coming off a hot season. But if I recall correctly, these teams have only played once in that cross-divisional play. And I think it was the Levi's who took it in that one matchup. Yeah, Levi's took it 3-1. So that's something that you're going to have to kind of think about a little bit. It was a while ago or a little bit of a while ago. So it's not going to matter as much. And the Warriors and Levi's, both teams, have looked fantastic recently. As recently as the end part of Phase 2. So... I mean, this is a battle of probably two of our top three teams we've seen through this entire phase. Even if one is number two seed in the division, it's because they played with the Ferrymen who've looked great all year. So, we're going to have a great one. Yeah, I think that the Leviathan's going to be battling back. They're trying to, you know, follow through on some momentum, whereas the Oni Warriors may be coming through with a small advantage. They obviously got to see the Leviathans play yesterday. So, have a handle on maybe what they're prioritizing and some of their own ideas for this new 10.12 meta, but we don't have to. We don't have to guess. We can hear from the team themselves. We got Panatom standing by for an interview. That's right. Panatom joins me here for the interview. Uh, Panatom, I want to kind of get your thoughts and maybe your team's thoughts on, on the current meta. We talked to a lot of different players so far, and we've had some some mix. We've had some players saying that a lot has changed, not much has changed, or maybe nothing at all. Uh, what's kind of your current take on the meta with this patch? Um, it is the weirdest time to play STL. Like I don't even know what is good or bad right now. So. I don't know. It is hard. Yeah, it's a little tricky. We're still trying to dial things in uh, over with everything. I want to talk about this matchup here because, as mentioned by the desk, you guys have only played against Leviathans once this phase. That was all the way back in September. It was Leviathans win at this time. Uh, what's changed for your team now that, that thinks that you guys can give you at the edge and try and win out in this set? Uh, the difference now is that my team is screaming properly and they want to win now, basically. <laughs> that's just the difference? You finally want to get those wins? Yeah, basically. That's it. Now, for this matchup here, I mean, this one, you guys win this, you go to Worlds, you're guaranteed first or second seed, you lose this one, you still have a chance. How much more important maybe is it for you guys to win this match and get that top seed versus still being able to qualify at the end of the day? Uh, I don't think that's much of a difference, but always it will be nice to go as first seed or even second seed, it will be nice. So. Well, good luck to you over in your match, Pantom. I'll let you get back with the squad. I'll throw it back over to the desk. I think, I think the biggest takeaway there, you heard the second question, right? What is the driving factor? What's the different vibe like for this event? And, and Panatom goes, well, our scrims are actually feeling good. For once, like they're actually focusing up on, uh, on this event, perhaps. And, and man, that's a scary thought. If the Oni Warriors haven't been focused for the Road to Worlds phase, and they're just like, oh, we've hit the, the playoffs, we're going to focus up now. That's a scary thought for the Leviathans. Yeah, and they could even level up beyond this because he said they didn't even know what the meta was. He said <laughs> this is the most awkward time. They don't know anything. So they probably learned a little bit from this previous set today and then a couple of the games yesterday. 
And we talked about it at the first or at the beginning of the day during the first set. Where are teams going to pry out kind of some of these higher pry out characters? Panatom, one of the best players in the world. Is he going to be taking this Maman, Maman Brigitte? Is it going to be picked at all? It started with a lot of prio at the beginning of uh, of yesterday, and now it's not even getting picked or banned. Yeah, I mean, game game one and two there, we, we saw it from the Dragons, and then all of a sudden just falls out of favor because the Sticks Ferryman don't value it as much. This time, though, two completely separate teams, and ones where I, I think the Maman fits a little bit better, especially for my money in the hands of Pagon. We've seen him maybe almost drive some of this assassin mid meta back when not everybody was doing it. It was really Pagon doing it on the Susano and, and other picks like that. I mean, this might be a pick that is right up his alley. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good point to highlight. And then even beyond this, this team has so many players that like playing these 1v1 characters. If I told you Solo or Troll was the one that took them on, you wouldn't be yep. that surprised. That'd be pretty fitting for him. Yep. Yeah, pretty pretty fitting. Maybe a, me a mechanical challenge for Solo yes. Patrol for for once, and he gets to press the, all the buttons and and pick the the new fun god. But I mean, you heard it from Panatom as well. It's 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 a mystery. They could pick pretty much whatever comes out of the word work. We've already seen some spice this weekend. We saw Persephone solo in yeah. the last set. We saw Vulcan pulled out. We saw even more spice yesterday. So as for what the Oni Warriors are going to bring to the table, this is going to be the, the first time we get to see their idea of the meta since that double header they had two weeks ago on the previous patch. And we've also seen a lot of mage supports in this previous three sets. And he, Genetics, their, their support is not a big mage support player. So maybe some Yemoja, some Sylvanas, maybe more Mike yesterday than Mike's today's picks. So something to look at there. And then the opposite side... I mean, the king. I mean, the Levi's adapting. When you talk about the, the Levi's, you talk about how, just kind of how hot this team has gotten at the correct time. Everything seems like it's being put together. They are dominating those lower end teams. And they're really putting like the mark on this second phase as like the team to beat along with the ferrymen. Because this team beat the ferrymen. This team is one of the few that did. And adapting is maybe the perfect player to talk about because so much of the Levi's meta has been revolving ar around this player. Adapting has continued. He, he just picks the Thor, and I'm never complaining about adapting yep. Thor. He picks the Mercury, and I'm never complaining about the King on Mercury, right? It, it's like just the comfort for the Levi's. I think you heard yesterday in an interview with the coach Slaney when Gore asked him, how has the meta changed for 10.12? And Slaney was like, it hasn't. Nothing has changed. They're just playing the same old smite and going back to what works for them. And man, it worked yesterday. It worked pretty well yesterday. They looked pretty dominant in that 3-0 set versus the Kings. Yeah, and it wasn't really on the Kings making a, a like bad plays or anything. It was adapting, running most of the games. Uh, this Willix looked great. We also saw Final K on this Poseidon, which got banned a lot today. So curious to see what happens kind of with that mage and solo lane. But adapting was playing stuff that, yes, we've seen it before, and it still looks great. It does not matter kind of what he's playing out. The Willix looks great. The Rat looks great. So curious to see if there's any maybe bans happening towards adapting and forcing him on something that maybe he's a little bit more uncomfortable with. But he's looked so good recently. And then Shinto on this Doth. We saw this get picked by by Paul today. Just, yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> right. The damage coming out, man, is something to talk about. Shinto has been so adaptable just in the set yesterday. In three games, he plays the Assassin Mage, the Standard Mage, and then the Hunter, right? So much flex potential for the Leviathan's team, and then adapting can go from prime damage dealer to facilitator, and then you get the, the mage solos and go back to the warriors as well for a fine okay. There's just so much power potential, so many flex players, and, and like anybody can can really pop off at a given moment for, for this squad, for really both of these squads. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point to highlight. They have multiple different styles of play. There's Shinto's able to play multiple, adapting, fine, okay. So they have a bunch of flex potential also with their picks. Now that we're jumping into P's and B's, Mage Solos, something to talk about. Maman, Brigitte, Chernobog, a bunch of strong characters available, and Warriors on the first side. Yeah, they do select that first pick position. 
And off the bat, we're getting, uh, you know, an immediate, like we said, in, in best of fives, you know, you get your own little meta that forms. We just saw the Dragon's Ferryman meta form through that four game set already off the bat. A little bit different in terms of the vibes here, starting out with the bands as the Levi's take away that Kepri from genetics. Don't want him to have that extra life potential. And they ban away the wow. Uller as well, going a, a little bit off the beaten path here in the first couple of bands. Meanwhile, the Warriors stick into uh, what's what's been top of the meta, taking away the Opwash, the Poseidon. Still a lot of value left up on the board, though. Those top supports, Athena, Yamoja, Maman, Chernobog, a, a ton of things you have to focus out here for both squads. Yeah, there's so many strong characters, you could have kept going for another four or five gods. And you'd still be <laughs> correct with these are like the top tiers. Levi's going for a few more. They're kind of attacking the players more so than attacking like the top meta bands. The Warriors on the opposite side, as you said, these are like the top kind of characters in the game. Opwash, a lot of value, Poseidon, a lot of value. But now with this this last ban available for the Warriors, this is kind of like setting the pace kind of for the, the game that's available because a Ryzen ban here means there's only really one mage solo left in that Morgan. So there's kind of a little bit of potential for them to drive what the P's and B's are going to look like. Also, Bog, I think, is something I want to touch on. And with the Emoja band, only one strong support left. And she was basically permabanned earlier today, basically permabanned yesterday. It's that Athena. Now the Levi's are forced to match those supports or give up the Athena first. Yeah, been so heavily prioritized this week and throughout the last couple of weeks of the Road to Worlds phase. Ganesh, we saw last set as well. I mean, there, it's not like the, there are other support options, especially the mage yeah. supports, right? If you, if you want to go in those alternative directions. But Athena, certainly one you're, you're hard pressed to let go. But that being said, I mean, it's not just Athena. It's 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 Bog, it's Maman Brigitte. And at this point, if you're if you're the Leviathans, I'm almost thinking that you maybe give away like another another almost throwaway ban. Like you take away the, the Rat of the Erlong or something, right? Not necessarily the top of the tier list pick, but now if you're the only Warriors, you pick Athena, you give away two strong picks to the Leviathans as well. Yeah, and we've seen this Athena flexed by the Warriors. We saw even in those highlights, Panatom was playing it also. But then you look at the Levi's. Yes, you get the Athena. We're going to match that global with Chernobog. So far, not officially locked in, but Maman Hubbard, now locked in, can also match the global if she dashes into the Athena. What a strong top two. Actually, I'll, I'll say top three gods are all very, very powerful, but this Levi's top two, Bog, Brigitte, so strong. Yeah, a lot of mage potential here too. Raijin and Morgan Le Fay still left unbanned for both of these squads. So we'll have to see how the Oni Warriors want to round out this top three. Imagine you get the Athena. Of course, it brings a little bit of global pressure, but also that taunt so big for some of the follow-up that you're hoping for. And I thought we might see that. I thought we might see a standard mage to try and play off the follow-up. I got to tell you, though, this Ixchel is, is not what I was expecting to see in terms of the standard mage category. This is a god that we've talked about a lot outside of like being on desk just in the back. We'll talk about how we think Eshel is a strong character right now, especially with those buffs recently. And now we get to see her with a a god that provides her that engage, and she can also use her ultimate on both who's ever getting taunted and the Athena. So good little fit right there. Also provide right. ultimate to help the Eshel if she's ever getting collapsed on, if it, whether it goes solo or mid. But the opposite side, the Levi's locking the Ryzen. Seen this a ton, mid or jungle, or sorry, mid or solo, can be played in either, but so far, so very strong top threes, both a lot of global potential on both sides, so we're gonna see probably a lot of big macro plays. Now for the Warriors, where would you rather see this East Shell? Do you, do you expect it to go solo, or do you think it's more of a, a standard mid lane pick in this meta? G give me each. I, I think Eshel solo is so good and so underrated, and I wanna see it really badly, and I think solo would play it, solo or troll would play it, but I, I wouldn't be too surprised if it was also played in mid. I think it's very strong in that mid 3v3, especially when you add in the dash taunt that Athena provides. I'm just happy to see it played because I think she is a little bit underrated. But to answer your question, I guess, with just one answer, solo is where I'd prefer to see her. We see the band start to come through. Looks like the Leviathan's not totally convinced as to where that Eshel's going. Want to make sure they take the Morgan Le Fay off the board as well as that set away maybe from from Pagan trying to pull out that assassin as we've seen him do before but that on her taken away from the Oni Warriors 
maybe in, in the Charon as well. Perhaps looking to... That on her is an interesting ban for me, because that on her being banned tells me that they're not convinced that this Chernobog is going to ADC. Perhaps you could put the Maman in, in jungle, but I mean, that speaks to like... We're, we're sitting here on the desk like, I don't know where these picks are going. Yeah. Certainly, they don't necessarily know where these picks are going. There's still so much flex potential, especially for that Levi's draft. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this even before getting into P's and B's. The flex potential of this Levi's team, you'll see Final K, Final K play a bunch of different styles. Adapting can, Shinto can. I mean, even Panda Cat has pulled out different styles into the, the ADC role. So, a lot of open picks there. And with the Nox locked in... Not as much flex potential in the Nox, most likely going to support, but it leaves open that last pick to be still flex potential somewhere. This Bog can go multiple different roles, Maman can, Raijin can, so it kind of leaves open the rest of the draft. I like the Nox lock-in. I like the support lock-in, but not necessarily loving the Nox. Yeah, I mean, Le Levi's holding on to that 10th pick to see what the Oni Warriors round out their draft with. Have to imagine if we'll see a mid lane mage here, perhaps a mid lane assassin, if the Warriors want to throw that East Shell on Solo. You're certainly missing out on that jungle pick though for the Warriors. And it was Panatom in the interview who said, I don't really know what we're playing right now. Like it's 10.12, it's you can play pretty much anything. I'm not sure that there's been a meta this season though where Thor has been bad. Yeah, Thor's always been at least an okay pick and a lot of times he's been better than okay. And with that Thoth lock-in, kind of see the Warriors comp making sense of where everything's going to go. Athena Hachi into the dual lane. Most likely Thoth mid, but I will say, Solo or Trolls played Thoth solo. So it is always possible to put that over there and the E-Shell goes mid. But I do think it makes a bit more sense to put the E-Shell in solo. Thor jungle, Thoth mid. And then the Levi's getting last pick value on this Ratatasker, which we've seen a lot of prioritization towards. Means Maman mid, most likely at least. I think most likely, Muman mid, we saw Shinto on it yesterday. Panda Cat going to be piloting that Chernabog if everything goes where we would predict it to go. But, I mean, I was going to mention this global pressure, semi-global, from the Thor getting locked in late there, immediately matched as well on that Ratatosker. Just like the Athena gets top picked, you immediately match that with the Chernabog as well. And I think that sort of speaks to what could potentially be a very high-octane, high-action game in game number one just because it's going to be so difficult to take a fight anywhere on the map without immediately having like half of the enemy team join you yeah i think it's good to point out that early mid should be a lot of maybe scuffle starting and then finishing off with 4v4s or 5v5s and then we get to that late game i mean we've seen teams play around their globals very very well Athena ults, Chernobog ult, we have half globals with Thor, Rat. I mean, even Nox and Maman Barjit have potential globals with their abilities to dash into either enemy gods or ally gods. So a lot of just big macro potential in that late game, which is exciting to see as a viewer. And then there's a lot of cool combos just to be had. We've not really seen too much E-Shell. Every Maman game I've seen so far has been really interesting just to see how they kind of build, how they kind of play around team fights. So overall, just a really exciting game. I mean, this draft rounds out for the Leviathans. I think, you know, all picks that we've seen before, especially this Maman we, we saw yesterday. My eyes go towards the Solon a, a little bit, though. I think that Raijin especially something that we've seen pretty often over the last couple of weeks, matched on the other side by the East Shell. Do you think that that newer East Shell pick can bring a lot of the same things that Raijin brings, or is it slightly different mage solo value? Yeah, I think it's it's somewhat similar. I think instead of CC on the ultimate, it's it's damage, it's utility, it's healing, it's stuff like that instead. But I think the landing phase should be both fairly safe. Both have fairly long channeled ultimates that give them a lot of CC immunity. But both junglers have really good one-shot and dive potential. Thor, Rat, can just get to that spot. And if you don't have great ward vision, it's not even they're going to be coming through the jungle. They will be coming through the air, and your ward vision is going to be very important been on the junglers for both of these squads to be the drivers of aggression. We'll see how they drive the game in game number one. Oni Warriors, Atlantis Leviathans, and we'll throw it over to the casters. Thank you so much, Frog and Inbound over on the desk. It's Jamek, it's Mifflin, and it's Doug here to bring you game one between the Warriors and the Leviathans. We're seeing E-Shell once more. A guy that we haven't seen very much of over, ever since her release. Saw it a couple of times on, on initial allowance of the SPL. Then I've only seen it sprinkled in here and there. I think one of the most recent ones has been BMT playing this one, but 
not too much on this god so far. So, so Miff, I guess I kind of want to open up and get your initial thoughts on this god, and especially this god over in the solo lane now. I'm not the most familiar with Ixchel and solo, but certainly does have potential to leverage a lot of boxing. I, I, I think that is the primary strength of Ixchel, is their ability to just spam abilities, continually output that poke, and then leverage a bit of that healing. I know the discourse, is, 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 is Ixchel a healer? Is she a sustained god? Not really. Not, not exactly. The ultimate's decent for it, but for the most part, you're going to see that utilized for DPS. The, the other ability, pretty decent, I suppose, but that's mostly out of combat healing. Will help out a little bit against, like, poke from Raiju, but not exactly what you pick her for. So I imagine we see SOT just playing aggressive, prioritizing poke over wave clear, and trying his best to keep fine okay at a low HP. As far as just overall strength, though, I think Ixchel's in a pretty decent spot since we'd last seen her. Maybe we've seen her once since the buff, but has a little bit more damage mitigation in that ultimate. Makes her just that much harder to deal with. Gotta point out the switch of the start for the Oni Warriors. Adapting, doing his usual thing, Cloud Speed buff. But it was the red and blue pulled together by Sot and Pagon, and the red actually going to SOT here on this first wave, blue buff going to Pagon. You think maybe this is just a... Maybe help Ishell get that extra little bump of clear in the solo lane. You think that Thoth is fine without that red buff in this early game to kind of make that style of switch? I mean, Thoth is going to have really decent clear regardless. Panatom taking a lot of poke there. That's the strength of Mabon Brigitte throughout the early game. I think I would have preferred to see Pagon have red buff, though. Just having that additional poke potential up against a god like Mamon that doesn't have the range to deal with you would have made it even more difficult for Mamon to hold her own in lane. We'd seen this exact matchup, I believe, once already this weekend, and for the most part, it was Dardes struggling to just hang out in lane. We'll have a little bit less of that struggle here for Shinto. DC Genetics dash into the wave. No taunts available yet for the Athena, so CC a bit lacking on the side of the Oni Warriors. Meanwhile, for Leviathans, still decent CC that can come from this Nox more than anything. And, and I think maybe it's surprising that we're seeing so much Nox this weekend when it felt like the entirety of the phase, the only mage supports we were really seeing. We saw a little bit of Baron towards the tail end. Maybe this is the value that we're seeing. Surrounded by three, the silence is down. No and way. a dash to get out. And then a dash by Panda Cat follow to make sure wrong you has got the distance. Maybe there's the value we're seeing in the Nox coming back. It also prevents that very linear initiation, right? If it's dash taunt every time, you don't need to hit, hit the root on Nox to prevent genetics from fighting multi-man taunts. It's just, I'll throw the silence down, all of a sudden, you don't really have the follow-up, right? We saw it just there. Rongyu standing in his own silence and says, well, I'll probably survive. Even holds on to that meditation, I believe, until a little bit afterwards. So good survivability in that regard. Great long distance initiation, which has been a weakness, I think, of these lacking warrior drafts. It's, how do we start the fight? You know, we, we, we don't have a Mulan that can just ult in, or we don't have a Hercules that's going to pull for us. We've got a Raijin. We've got an Ixchel. So things like Nox should help out a good bit. Just... Hold down one guy, have all that range damage right behind you. The follow-up will certainly be there. And then something the desk had highlighted just briefly, some of the synergies that Nox has with the rest of the Leviathan's draft. I mean, so essentially just another global now. She could hop on the rat or onto the Chernobog and be a part of the map anywhere on the map. Yeah, I think that's one thing that the desk highlighted was the global and semi-global that both teams have to match each other, but then you throw in the wrong you could jump in, make it an uneven fight. Sheen Toga jump to an enemy and then jump over with another fight. Ultimate by Sot. Gonna be canceled Whoa. out early. But the blind shot after with the threads do end up missing. No kill on the solo lane just yet, but Final K starting to feel a bit of the pain from these lower cooldowns that Ishell has access to. And has elected Final K that is not to pick up teleport, so should miss out on at least two or three minions on this wave. Another slight advantage over to SOT, who grabs himself the totem and should pick up this cooldown buff as well. It's that poke potential. It's just high boxing output from Ixchel. Makes it very difficult for guys like Raijin to just hang out. And Raijin won't be able to match the stain nearly as well. Once you finish up Pythag's piece, it doesn't necessarily really matter uh, that Ixchel's got sustain and kit. They're both going to be full healing off wave regardless. So I like seeing Sot try and throw his weight around where there was actual kill potential. And maybe if he hits one or two more ticks of that ultimate or if that ability connects on the tail end, we're talking about first blood, so thin margins keeps fine, okay, afloat. So gonna put some poke, goes in for the ultimate, because adapting is on the way. Beads by Sop, but adapting misses the ult, now there's an Athena gonna come crashing in. Duncan by Panatom off the mark, but the stun is there to adapting. 
to trade out and get his beads. A lot of ultimates thrown around between the two teams. Even a 3v2 on the right side for the Warriors. Uh -oh, but no uh -oh. blood spilled there. Instead, it's the mid lane. That's the most dangerous spot. As Pagan's used his ult, but still not enough follow-up to kill Shinto. Yeah, but Shinto's going to have a hard time clearing wave here. Doesn't have any true ranged abilities. And I think realizing that, we'll have to sacrifice the archers on his wave. So, advantage over to Pagan now. Who's going to be able to keep up that pressure. And this lane does not get easier from Amon Brigid. It gets easier in that... As the game develops, you don't have to hover the mid lane nearly as much, but as long as they're both lined up against each other, that though is going to have a massive advantage in just the ability to bully out Shinto. So keep your eyes on Maman, slowing down her build. Significant. Let's go for a bit slower build too. Talent in first slots. A lot of power, a little bit of sustain, but it's going to take a little while. We've been seeing a few different kind of starts for the Mammon. If you're in jungle, we've been seeing things like Doom War. For Love midliners, that. we were seeing Book of Thoth or Typhon's Fang has kind of been the, the two startups that we have seen. Shinto going to go for that sustain option. It's adapting, wraps around. Stun is good on the side. About half his HP removed. And now a final K on the way. Saw tries to turn it around, but he just doesn't have the damage with the ultimate. It's first blood going over to adapting. Maybe some follow-up on the left side. Only Warriors get aggressive around purple buff. Unable to steal that one away. But at the end, it's first blood for Leviathans. Man, Adapting's really putting a lot of focus over on that right side of the map. And it makes sense. It's one of the easiest lanes for him to gank. Haven't got too many opportunities to talk about the duo lane, but Hachiman's one of the safest hunters in Smite, and Athena can just leave the map, right? Just go anywhere else. So Adapting rightfully identifying, well, if I'm going to kill anybody, it's probably just going to be side. Even Pagan with Evade and Punish able to close gap on about half a lane's length. So... Maybe we just see Sot under pressure going forward. Panicat forced back in towards that tower. We'll need a rotation from Rongyu to alleviate some of that pressure. Rongyu will rotate in. Panicat going to sit at the back of the tower. Silence dropped by Rongyu. Root thrown down. But a quick dash into the wall. Gets Panicat away from the taunt of genetics. And now Netroid charging in with ult. But it's up into the sky for Netroid. He'll avoid the damage of that ult and back into the wall once more. Really utilizing the cooldowns of that Chernabog. But adapting. now it's the semi globals. The junglers on the way. Adapting off the tree and on the ground. Netroid half HP. But genetics with the ultimate. Make sure that he's got the mitigation to stay alive. And it's Shinta showing three up man. three man. Oh, the triple taunt in the back line. It's adapting to the sky. And Pagan charging ult. Cool. It misses everybody though. And that might be the call off from the Warriors to bail out of the fight. Man, these fights are on the knife's edge. Both teams going for wild haymakers nearly. Making individual plays to completely separate the engagement. The three-man ultimate from Shinto gets no follow-up because Gen X matches it with a three-man taunt on the other side of the engagement. Clean stuff there. But Gen X struggling to find some of those impact taunts. That initiation on a panic cap behind the tower, if he just waits out the dash, a little bit easier to secure that kill. Instead, throws out the taunt a bit too early. Wrong you. Taking a lot of poke here. Had to use meditation a bit earlier on, so damage going to stick this time. Good stuff. Great rotations from both sides, too. I really like the ultimate timing from Genetics to prevent the damage from adapting, from knocking down Netroid. If that's not there on time, Netroid likely dead just immediately. And then afterward, Panatom, great wall to separate the whole fight. It's only death so far this game. It's over on this right side of the map, despite how much fighting just broke out over in the duel lane. That has still net, though. The only warrior is a bit of a lead. 700 gold up for the team. Maybe some of that coming over towards the mid lane. Feels like every time we pan over to Shinto in mid, he's under tier one tower, losing minions. Pagan's built himself about a one level lead. It's like the whole Gotta imagine you that's where pretty much the bulk of this lead's come from. Yeah, and that's not gonna change anytime soon. Shinto, I think, just wants to spend as much time outside of that lane as possible. Departure from the standard. It's not Book of Thoughts, it's not Typhons, it's Bancrofts. Wow. In first slot. Maybe it makes a little bit of sense. You get a little bit more power depending on how much HP you've lost and Pagon's going to make sure your HP is lost for the majority of this game. And it will help out a bit and sustain too, but sacrificing some of that penetration early on will slow down his ability to actually knock down some of these tanks. That said, tank's not exactly tanky just yet. That's only Gauntlet of Thebes for the two supports. Nitro's going to try and zone Pandacat away from some farm. Quite a large wave that Nitro's built up of archers at the very least to try and deny some of this gold. Genetics rotating over means that Panicat's going to need more help from Wrong Yu. He's just losing farm after farm. Fast silence from Wrong Yu. Does exactly what you called for earlier. You're going to see a dash taunt come through from Genetics. Drop that puddle at his feet every time. 
It's going to stop that initiation. Yeah, it's going to be very frustrating for genetics, especially come team fight time. Because when you look at how the Leviathans are going to play the five on five engagement, I'm seeing a lot of counter initiation or isolating individuals. Wrong you. Needs to play a bit safer than all that. Netroid's already got a good deal of damage to play with and zones the entire wave. So if it's up to the only warriors who initiate the majority of these fights, Genetics is really the guy for it. Panatom can do a bit of it, but so long as Wrong Yu is playing heads up, what we just saw will continue to happen. Maybe that does restrict Relic selection. Genetics might feel like if he wants untelegraphed CC, he might have to pick up something like a Blink. So much farm denial on the left side. I think that's the third or fourth wave we've now seen zoned away. Wrong you under fire. Throws the ultimate on Netro in a fast silence. And a dash back to Panda Cat will stop the fight on left for now. As both junglers again rotating over. To try and bail out the dual lane. And finally, for Panda and Wrong you able to get some farm just now hitting level nine for Panda Cat. Meanwhile, Netro has been at 10 for some time. Jax rotates in. Dash taunt does connect to Panda. It'll jump into the wall. No dive way. Dive under tower by Ned. But now you got adapting on the way. Does land on top of Panatom to bail out Panda Cat once more. But Panatom still got ult. Genetics is moving forward for the dash taunt again. There's no beads for Panda Cat this time. But it's adapting, getting taunted back by Genetics. Gets the beads off the Ratatosker. And that's the Leviathan's down two major relics. And I'm telling you, Athena is just ridiculous. Pagon forced back under his own tower. Returns a good deal of poke immediately afterward, but does not benefit from the same amount of sustain that Shinto will. So Shinto, given the opportunity, can heal up in jungle or on wave. That's the duality of that mid lane matchup. If Shinto closes gap, Pagon will lose the majority of his HP in the flash of the eye, or blink of the eye, excuse me. But good luck. Good luck walking through that artillery strike. And then we give an interesting matchup on the left side of the map in that did genetics hit taunt? If yes, you're probably just dying to the damage output from Netroid, which should be boosted pretty significantly with that executioner finished up. Or is Rongyu playing the counter engage well? We see now that genetics is really trying to force those engagements when Rongyu is either showing himself in mid or, or hovering the jungle. Because otherwise, there, there aren't really great answers to the taunt on the Leviathans. It's almost entirely up to this Nox pick. I wonder how far into cooldown genetics will invest as well. Already starting off with a little bit with that prophetic cloak, but when we saw Panatom play this pick in jungle as get to 40% as soon as possible, get as many dash taunts as I can in, in the span of 10 to 20 seconds, keep these fights rolling. So I wonder maybe for genetics, if he invests into more CDR after this, maybe Pressplate, Pridwin, something like that, to try and keep him going and, and really be able to stack up the amount of dash taunts he has access to. I wonder if he's willing to go in towards Breastplate of Valor. He definitely wants the CDR, but Breastplate against all these mages would be tough. Pagon locked down. Shinto doesn't have the damage. Dunk back in from Genetics and adapting in response. But Pagon's low and Pagon's gone. There's a dunk from Panatom on top of two, but he gets stunned out instantly. Has to use the adapting. And The first casualty of the fight is Pagon, and immediately after will be adapting another taunt by Genetics to pull the jungler back in. A one-for-one one trade. Leviathan strike first, but the Warriors have their response. A little bit overzealous there from adapting. Don't often see him get that greedy for a kill. Pre-beats from Shinto. Does he have the damage? Dashes into Genetics. Needs one more hit. He taunts Wrong you back, and Wrong you has got the enhanced. Metro dashes forward, but now both the Leviathans go back to the safety of the Tier 1 tower. That was a Gutsy play by Shinto to pre-beads to make sure he can get the dash off, though. Not even just get the dash off. If I apply my passive, you're probably just dead. And the only way I don't do it is if you taunt out my first ability. So pre-beads just makes it work. Avoids the stun and blinks out. Shinto playing very well here. Netroid dedicates the ultimate, comes up empty. Panatom seems to be fishing for that wall hammer. But with Rongyu there, that should just spell the end of the fight. Shinto sitting to the back of the tier one tower to make sure he can't go for that. And as soon as the support shows up, he knows he has a bit of safety to jump back up out of that tower line. Pagon on the thaw. Bit of a casualty in that fight. A lot of dive and a lot of commitment to him. Tower? But now channeling that ultimate. Cancel it for a moment, but a commitment to the tower from the Warriors because Netroid has not left the mid lane. Fine. Now gives an option here. His final case caught out in the jungle. Beads from the Raijin. Gives another target over to Genetics. It's two people now without beads on the Leviathans. 
as the Pyromancer is pulled. Yeah, Adapting's up. in the sky. He's on the ground. He's hit three. And the follow by Final K is there. But they need more damage from Shinto. He's inside of Panatom, able to dash out. But Pagon waiting to let the damage rip through. It's Shinto who gets the first kill with his passive. And now Sotby collapsed on his Final K. Thunder crashes in place. Only one kill this time going the way of the Leviathans. But can the Leviathans do anything with that kill? Oni Fury, or excuse me, Pyromancer off the map. Tier 1 tower. Can't really push it when there's a Thoth sitting inside of it. So I think significant win there for the Oni Warriors, who are just playing so fast. I was wondering myself, why is Netroid still here? Three splitting, two waves in mid. What's going on? Very slow telegraph push that Final K tries to respond to. But unfortunately for him, steps over a ward and loses out on his beads and 50% of his HP before the fight even starts proper. Leviathans, been doing a great job in the PvP. Just look at the slash lines, you'd think they're winning cleanly. Then you start to look at that gold and realize it's the only warriors who've been winning out on that macro farm experience as well. Starting to favor them too. I wonder now, do you just go ahead and force the gold fury? Soul enters don't lie. SOT on the left side of the map should be an indicator of intention. But it's slow play. Haven't pulled it just yet. Lions have a couple of tools to get to that fury, which has been pulled by the warriors. Panda Cat already on the scene, halfway on the health bar they for the Fury, it. but it's been reset. The ultimate canceled by Pagon. The Gold Fury will be secured by the Warriors. Panatom zoning, has to use the beads to get away from wrong use combo, but fine, okay. Throws out the Tycho drums, heals from Sot, make sure to keep Panatom alive, but he's gonna be bringing a teammate with him, or I should say an enemy in Shinto, right to the back line, but that's a hand delivery to the Wolves of the rest of his squad. Shinto's still alive though, Pagon under fire, good. gets a heal from Sot, and that's just enough to keep alive for a moment, one for one trade. It's the mid's gone, but Panatom falls after Netroid low, and drop down, it's a double for Panda, and give it a triple kill to the carry. The Leviathans have gotten four, and it's only Sot left alive. Leviathans gotta act fast, it's 20 seconds on respawn for all of the war. Warriors. Takes about 10, 15 seconds to walk from base to fire giant. That would give them a 20 second power play for the only warriors to get there as well. Move quickly. You might be able to net yourself the largest neutral objective on the map. That was overcommitment from the Oni Warriors. Panatom positioning very far up there, trying to just create space around the Fury, cost him his life. There's a peel attempt from Genetics that goes punished by Rongyu's lockdown. And it all leads exactly to this. Fire Giant pulled, but not exactly going fast. It's got to be faster than that, or maybe just a kill on Asat instead. Locked in the silence puddle, but there's just not enough damage going on Asat yet until Panacat gets a couple of crits. But with Pagon back on respawn, it's still a little time till his ultimate. Not worth the risk from the Leviathans. Panacat nearly caught out by Genetics. Dash in from Genetics gets the response by Panacat to go to the wall. And the Leviathans disengage from fire. Man, that's clean play from SOT. Don't think he needs to use the Aegis there. He'd already bought so much time for his team to rotate through, and it was very unlikely that he makes it out of there alive. Utilizes the Relic anyway and buys his team about two more seconds to rotate in towards that Fire Giant and does at least prevent the Leviathans from knocking down the objective. And this has been an issue now with the Leviathans for the last 18 minutes. They're doing a great job finding the kills, but because the only Warriors are playing so fast on map, having stripped away what you do after the kills. Their, their, their PEMDAS is all messed up, man. It's usually kills, then objective. Only Warriors skipping a step. Oh, adapting, stuck behind the wall that Panatom threw out. Unable to go for the kills, or even really the fight afterwards. This shield buff for Netroid. In a much more even game now, only about 900 gold separating the two teams after the last scuffle on the left-hand side. Would have maybe have liked to gone for a little bit more after the kills, but Fury was already down. Tier 1 tower pushed out at that point. So for the Leviathans, where's their next response in? It's back to Sot once more. Panicat on the way. If he's got some big crits, he's brought his support with him. But now it's Genetics joining in. Silence Puddle keeps them both trapped in there for the time being. But there's just not enough damage flying to these two. Final K goes into tower. Uh -oh, Panatom uh -oh. shows up in the middle of all of it and forces the dash and the escape out. Adapting shows up. He blinks behind everybody to go for Pagon, who gets dropped down. But it's a one for one trade, which Shito on the scene might be the damage that they were looking for. But after Shinto, it takes about 75% of his health. The rest of the Leviathans have got to bail out. Can the Leviathans make it out of there? Chase down, not exactly good. But Genetics sticking around seems to indicate to me that he wants to continue this chase. A taunt onto anyone should just result in a kill. And some of that sustain from Ixchel. Keep a Genetics healthy enough to go in towards that tower. Knocking out a Tier 1, not exactly the most valuable, but a little bit of global gold. 
could go a long way. Leviathans not willing to give this one up. Playing with fire here. I mean, look at the relics, J-Mac. I'm seeing a whole lot of beads down on the Chaos side. And a Pyromancer. That should be a free grab. Wrong you. Doesn't have ultimate to steal this one away. Does have the silence. Drops in the middle. The Warriors will get the Pyromancer. It's another objective over to the Order side team. But this is now the second time that the Leviathans have collapsed on top of Sot. And it just feels like they're not doing anything any damage to him. It took all four to kill him at the Fire Giant. It cost a lot of ultimates to do so. Even in that fight with Pagon, or with Panda Cat swinging away with Enhance, just felt like Sot's health bar was not dropping down. Yeah, I'm starting to turn around on Ixchel's self-sustain, healing up a whole lot there. Also, we saw, I believe, two three-man knockups just to self-peel. When you're all stacked up on top of them, easier for SOT to line those up. But it's the timing of Athena's ultimate once more. Stacked on top of Ixchel's ultimate. That amount of damage mitigation is just ridiculous. The Oni Warriors utilizing that Athena ultimate to survive these dives every single time. Leviathans, I think, need to figure out an answer to it. It's either force the Athena ultimate and then disengage, wait a little bit, then go all in again, or try and separate the map and utilize split push. The globals that the Leviathans have for their team just a little bit better at separating the map. Genetics can go split push, but that's a support, and he doesn't have any damage. He's not threatening towers. Panda Cat can do it, and he's threatening just, I might take your map away, and I could also still get involved in the team fight. So I'd like to see a little bit more of that from the Chernobog. Separate from the rest of the team, maybe play on his own a bit. What is a group up around right side for Leviathans? Shinto sticking around mid, the rest of the team heading around Fire Giant Pit. As the only warriors now go for their response. Panatom just now leaving base with a Heart Seeker finished up. Big burst damage now afforded to the Thor for the Oni Warriors. Leviathans are playing a little oddly right now around this right side. There's a three-man group up to push out a minion wave. Grab this cooldown buff and then a whole lot of nothing after that. Now I see another return group over to this tier one tower. Not the most valuable tower to defend. The Leviathans will just give this one up to the Oni Warriors, who now feel like they just regained map control by not only taking this tower, but kind of scattering the Leviathans around. Doug, let me look at the healing charts for a moment here. SOT's found a, a good deal of value. Just barely beating out the meditation that Rongyu's picked up for himself. But still, 4,000. Pretty significant considering he's only really been in the team fights for the last five or six minutes. Does knock down the tier one tower on the right-hand side. But have to play trepidatious now on neutral objectives to both of these teams. You could very easily on either side knock down the Oni Fury. But with Fire Giant up and how quickly both sides could burn it. You need to be concerned about a counter rotation there. Shinto starting to hit some pretty significant power spikes himself. Has been initiating a lot of these fights with his ultimate. So Mirrodin makes a good deal of sense to me. Probably wants to get that Typhon's Fang finished up before he takes this next fight, though. So for the Leviathans, slow things down. Make sure Shinto gets that power spike, then look for the engagement. For the Oni Warriors, force the fight. See if he can burn through some of those relics. Because all beads being up for the Leviathans does not bode well for the Warriors. Wrong. You rooted. Hit by the blind in the knockup after. Will be fine for the time being. Does have that fully upgraded Meditation and Bracer available to him. The beacon has jumped up. This is the third beacon point now. And currently being capped by the Oni Warriors. We'll send the Titans down the lanes and marching around. We've seen some kind of back and forths for these teams. Do you fight around the Titan? Do you walk all the way up to enemy lines, push out their Titan, then head to an objective still? It's had a lot of play around those ever since their introduction. As Panatom and the rest of the Warriors collapse on a wrong, you use the ultimate instantly, and it's a collapse back in by the Leviathans. It's Ventroid in danger. Tycho drums out of range to kill the carry. This time, Leviathans have done a great job of forcing out ultimates, but they've also used every single one of theirs. Uh, maintain the beads, though. So should be able to take another fight, especially considering HP bars as they are. So Levi's take the Pyromancer. Fine, okay. Takes a lot of damage in exchange. Just tries to poke out a bit himself, realizing now that Pagon hits real hard. Fine, okay, taunted back, can't jump over the wall. Great follow-up from the Warriors to collapse in on the soul lane of the Leviathans and now opens up the door for the Fire Giant. Leviathans scattered a bit, adapting on his way. Shinto doesn't have ultimates. All ults are down for this fight except 
Persaud's coming Ronnie. back up in just a moment, but wrong use low, wrong use gone. It's SOT with one, but Netroid's in danger. To Shinto goes down to the damage of Panda Cat. And Shinto, in the middle of everybody, has got to bail himself out. There's just too many classic, but a no massive more. stun by adapting won't be enough. It's two for Sun, and the Over sky the for Panatom dunks down, misses his target of Panda, but still gets it with the hammer after. The Warriors knock down four. Pagon is an animal, J Mac. Evaded punish over the wall to secure the escape path there. Make sure the Leviathans aren't allowed to limp out of that engagement. Now it's all on adapting. World on his shoulders. Needs to stop this fire giant from going down, or maybe just play for the steal. It's on top of a ward. Can't do Get it. Get spotted out. Beads forced. Has ultimate if he's willing to risk for really? it. He does. He does have final K on the way shortly. Failing as much time as he can he up wouldn't. on the tree. Heal is there by SOT. He'll dunk on top of Panatom who spins for the immunity and slammed in the dome by Pagon. But now Final K trying to steal Fire John his own, but it's just a turn and burn right back onto the solo uh -huh. later. Final K will go down to SOT's ultimate in just a few more hits. But Final K's taking one with him. Genetics gone. But that's support for fire on four. I mean, nice try to the Leviathans, but I think base defense being as good as it is for that, that with that composition, and it not being an enhanced fire giant, maybe would have just been better to allow the Oni Warriors to have that one. Now fine, okay, and adapting, fall down again. Adapting actually worth a good bit of gold there, considering his slash line was decent up until that point. Does at least get some resources off of the Oni Warriors. Relics maybe not in as good a position as they would have been otherwise, but... That was long shot odds to take away the Fire Giant. I think, though, the Leviathans have learned a valuable lesson from the last two team fights, and it's there's one guy that needs to be dealt with. It's Pagon. 1 3 and 8, not an impressive slash line. We've seen much better from Thoth, but damage output and output in team fight has just been ridiculous. This Thoth is an issue, especially considering what he's doing to the tanks of the Leviathans. And fine, okay, sure, off tank, mage solo, this, that, or the other. He's also one of your primary initiators. You need that Tycho drum to start up your fights. You need that taunt. You need those fears to separate the engagement. And if he's dropped down to 50% on one ability rotation and killed immediately afterward, you're really not getting the value from your Raijin. Warriors start their siege up left side. Sot will tank it up. It's that way. Can be knocked down by the rest of the team. Four-man grouping, Genetics now joining in, makes it full five stack for the Warriors on left. Leviathans slow to group up in, but the Phoenix not under too much threat. Pagon channels ult for a moment. Really? Spino K jumps in and throws out the Tycho drums, taunts back a couple, but not enough follow-up. Adapting is going up into the sky. Where will he crash down in the middle of? Everybody's already bailed out of this fight. Adapting probably can't join with this ultimate. He heads back over towards mid as Pagon dashes uh -huh. in and slams into Final K. With a bunch of damage, the Warriors, they're perfectly healthy for this fight. And nobody on the Leviathans wants to eat the ultimate from this Thoth. Fine, okay. Force use the beads and narrowly avoids the Thoth ultimate, but still loses out on the bird. That leap forward from the Raijin into immediate Tycho drum really sped up the pace of that engagement. The Leviathans were not ready to follow up, even with the taunts being good. Adapting heads up in the air and says, hey, man, it just happened too fast. I can't get there in time. Netroid's already all the way on his side of the map. No way we could chase this one out. And the only Warriors say, oh, okay, well, they've used literally everything. Just go ahead and knock down the Phoenix and do exactly that. Tier 2 tower falls down as well. Got to draw your line in the sand somewhere, but it's happened again. Fine, okay. Thunder crash out. Tycho drums to try and bail him away. Panatom feared away, but he uses the beads. Now Panacan here to try and bail him out, but they Panatom got him. can't get to the sky. The duo of Shinto and Panacat take him down. It's wrong. Yulo CC with the root, but Genex goes in for the taunt. Gets the beads away from Panacat, and Shinto under fire, and Shinto dead. Timeline brings it back. The silence is enough to keep him alive, though. He jumps inside the enemy. Pagon doesn't get anything with the Omens adapting back on the scene. Fine, okay, nearly takes down Pagon as Sot will have to sacrifice his life for the rest of the team. Adapting low, adapting still out. It's only Netroid left alive and Fine OK and the rest of the team will march right in and take him down. Dia's side and a double kill for Panda Cat. What can the Leviathans do with this time? 15 seconds left on Panatom's respawn. I don't even think they get a tier two tower. Maybe if they stick around, but everybody's low HP. Fine OK, Panda Cat should have the damage for it. So tier two will go down. Pyromancer as well, massive swing. Over to the Leviathans who overcommit. Or I should say the only warriors overcommit onto the Leviathans. 
trying to chase out their kills. Fine, okay, limps himself out of there. Shinto, alternate timeline, finds some immense value. Timeline got a buff, but that's not why it worked. It was that silence placement from Wrong Yu that just keeps them alive. And the Leviathans find their punish game. But because the only warriors have pushed up so far, because they were deaths were desynced so much, it's not exactly the largest swing. It's not exactly a game-changing play there for the Leviathans. Left side burn, still down. Fire waves still starting to move their way over towards the Leviathan side of the map. Fire giant a minute out from respawn. Only warrior is still in the driver's seat here. It's now where the warriors go. Pyromancer's down, fire still. Another 15 to 20 seconds. And Fury coming up almost the exact same time afterwards. The only warriors will start heading over to the left side of the map where that Phoenix has already been knocked down. Nobody from the Leviathans is really starting to group up this way. Final K is over towards the middle of the map, but seems the rest of his team is more prone to go towards Fire Giant. As Panda Cat heads back to base and will rejoin his team to the right. So, team split on which side of the map they want to control. Warriors over towards Fury, but the Leviathans are already at Fire Giant's side. Yeah, but the Leviathans don't know just yet exactly where the Oni Warriors are either. Have not stepped on a ward. Have the Oni Warriors reveal themselves in mid now. You got eyes on Genetics and Pagon. I don't believe Panatom shows up on Wave there. And so, Leviathans have some semblance of an idea that the only Warriors were fishing for a kill on that left side of the map. They come up empty, but the Leviathans, not benefiting from the bird's eye view that we have, weren't quite able to pull that Fire Giant for themselves. Just you wait. I'm worried about that left side Phoenix. Once Final K shows himself, or if Final K shows himself, the only Warriors were likely to just immediately go for the fight. Adapting doesn't have the same level of global presence as maybe a soul lander with teleport, but having a global on rat means should a fight erupt, he can make a rotation relatively quickly. But all the while, the only warrior is still fishing for their own engagement. Wrong you. Jumps over with fine, okay, to escape. Five versus four. On the right hand side, still adapting. Split pushing on left. Last fire wave has spawned in and will meet up, so adapting gonna let that one be and head over to join the rest of the team as fire is pulled by the Warriors. Reset immediately. And now, trying to get away. Monaco goes into the ult to make it some damage to the back line, but not what they were hoping for is Panatom up in the sky will dunk over towards Adapting, but misses the target. And instead, now it'll be a reset around fire. Still an enhanced minion wave on the left-hand side. Gonna generate a bit of threat there. Wrong you, too far forward. Taunted back, loses the ultimate, but maintains his life. Left side, Bird, just going to lose its life to minion wave passive push. Leviathans not able to defend their base here. Now fine, okay, and a bit of danger. Same with Sop, but he's got an Athena ultimate on top of him. Beats and Aegis used Whoa. and able to narrowly avoid the ult of Pagon, but Panda Cat's low. Fine, okay, slow. They've got to get out of the fight. Well, there's three still healthy members of the Leviathans, but three is not enough to go against the full force and the fully healthy warriors who jump right back to the Fire Giant, two back at base. Panacat's got ult though, can jump in, adapting up onto the tree, but where is his target? The Fire Giant is still in a nearly 50% health. Panacat will dive in with his ult as collapse on the Netro. He gets the Aegis, but he's taunted back and adapting. Force out of the fight as Sot tries to take him down, but the great end is not enough. Maybe Panatom can get the job done. A crash to the back will remove Panacat from the game. Panda down, Panatom with one, Genetics leading the charge to the right side of the map as Adapting and Wrong You cannot stick around any longer and they will not, it's Wrong You gone. One more kill for Sot, who's taunted back under tower, but he's got the rest of the team standing by. Panatom fishing for his own wall, finds it on a Shinto, damage is good, forces the beads out. Shinto immunes the taunt there from Genetics, but it's the only Warriors who once again take a clean team fight Adapting too far into the back line. Fine, okay. Dashing in hyper aggressively. Wrong you. Caught early. And it's Panda Cat forced to ult back in. Try and peel out for that Fire Giant. Puts him in no man's land and the Oni Warriors. Remind him why it's called that. Fire Giant pulled once more. Three members of the Leviathans on defense. Shinto's on a war and they know he's there. Can he even get into the pit with Fine Okay to try and steal this one away? Five versus three, the bubble is gone. Shinto tries to take it away, but it's fire to the Warriors. Panatom in the sky, but he wouldn't. just to keep eyes on where Leviathans are, he'll dunk back in right to the Pyromancer. It's the only Warriors with fire, enhanced fire giant at that, and a Pyromancer to add a Runic Bomb to their pocket. I don't know, Shinto's stuck around, J-Mac. Genetics gets eyes on him. Could just be a free pick. Adapting playing with fire, too. I don't think the Leviathans realize 
the Oni Warriors are still playing this far up. Fortunately, adapting his game sense will lead him to safety. But is this a fast enough push? They just get this bird for free? Panda Cat, nowhere to be seen. Same with Wrong Yu, they're over on the left side while Right Phoenix is under fire. They Final got it. K tries to ult. He taunts back three different players. And she just got good CC and damage to follow up. Genetics has got to go down here, and he does to Panda Cat. But it's adapting with two in the back. Netroid now gone. And SOT with low health bars will be collapsed on, too, for Panda Cat and adapting. Goes for the solo play against Panatom to the sky. Pagon, he got Lazy his back, back. he can't get out. It's Shinto with another one. Only Panatom left. And he's going to try and 1v1 adapting, but a fast dash out gets away from the hammer. The Leviathans, though, they've got 40 plus seconds to play with. And if adapting keeps Panatom busy, that may have just been the turnaround that the Leviathans needed. They're marching up mid. Stops his back. Panatom baited just by adapting, being close by. Will make his way back here, but I'm not sure if he can stop these guys. They're all so healthy. No ultimate for Panatom. One versus four and 15 plus seconds till the next one up. Panatom will do all he can, but one team fight was all the Leviathans needed to break control back to their side, and they will take game one over the Warriors. Only Warriors beat themselves a bit there, playing a bit too quickly on the right-hand side. It's the... Narrative, the desk is pushing so much. It's that global presence on both sides. You can knock down the Phoenix, but you are not walking out without a fight. Now with that much global presence, double dunk from adapting, locks down the Oni Warriors, and they knock them down from there. That's tough stuff. I would have thought the Warriors would try to play it a bit slower, leverage the, the damage output from Pagon, just keep them in the back line, keep the damage rolling, play through sustain, but expediency, panic, not end, panic Phoenix, I suppose, cost the Warriors this one. And I also got some props to find, okay, during that fight, while the taunt damage from the drums not doing a whole lot, keeps two people back with yep. him, and then we see Adapt and get the dunk immediately after that. I mean, they were essentially knocking on the potential game ending door at that point. Only Warriors get the Phoenix. It seems like, okay, maybe we can just get out of this fight, but great CC and great follow-up. Now nets the Atlantis Leviathans a win here in game number one. We'll see who can get, get themselves on match point, or do we have a tie in game two? Right after this.
Welcome back, Smite fans. Some fantastic action there in game number one. And if you missed out on any of the action in, in game number one in, in the set earlier today and the sets yesterday, you can head over to our YouTube channels and check out all that action that you missed. YouTube.com slash Smite Pro slash Smite VOD. You can see all of the fantastic pro action that you missed as well as some, uh, some, some fun bits between us. We've done Telestrator stuff. We do player interviews there's a there, who, who's who's the best player to talk to you in your mind? Who's who's the most fun that you that you've seen? I'm, solo solo is really funny to talk to. Yeah, <laughs> solo is really funny to talk no, to. No, solo or troll, it does provide a lot of the players provide a lot of fantastic content. You can see him in game a little bit more on our YouTube channel, Smite Pro and Smite Vada. That first one though, I mean, if you're if you're here live, this is where you want to catch the games. And that first one was one that was pretty good to catch a, a barn burner so back and forth even pretty much the entire game finally the oni warriors they 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 win a fight they they break down the walls they get efg and then the, the leviathans run it down and they kill everyone kill the titan and end the game and just like that i mean it was a big win for the warriors getting that efg they played the fight they were you know dropping aggro onto the enemy killing dropping back to fire confirming fire and it was all Warriors, as you said. And then it was just too much, too fast. The Warriors get punished. And then the Levi's value picks in that late game provide so much chase down potential that it, if you're losing fights, you're, you're not getting out. You're not running away from double assassins, Maman, Rat. You're not getting away from the Chernobog ult. Ryzen's got some of the lowest cooldown dashes in the game. He also has cooldown reset on his passive. And then Nox can dash in any of them who she ever she wants and, and follow up with. So if you're losing fights, you're going to be losing the fight even harder because of the chase down potential. But even through that, a lot of this game, I really thought the Levi's just had the fights in control. It was just objectives and minion waves and stuff like that was just handled better by the Warriors. And macro overall, I think, was handled by the Warriors. But a lot of fights was went the Levi's way. Yeah, I mean, you, you get those jungle fights really in the advantage of the Warriors, two different Fire Giants they're able to take down, but both times you get the Phoenix Siege attempts from the Warriors, and it was a, a fight back early on where the Leviathans got that Tier 1 and Tier 2 tower and that game-winning defense on the left-hand side where I think, if I'm correct, they, they still lost that Phoenix. Yep. But it, it doesn't even matter, right? Uh, Final K hits a huge taunt. You get that engage that you're looking for with the Raijin. 
and a ton to, I mean these were fun comps to watch you get a, a lot of interesting interactions a lot of global pressure the dash is inside I still was like waiting for the point where you get the the Nox dash inside of the Maman dash inside of another player with a global ultimate and you were like you get sort of combine all the yeah you were begging for that during the <laughs> game like please dash into each other and dash into someone else <laughs> just stack all of the interactions on top of each other I mean, me and you were talking about it a little bit while watching the game. The interactions between these junglers, we had global pressure, but man, I felt like adapting looked a lot more comfortable facilitating and making plays on that Ratatosker than Panatom did on the Thor. I'm not sure I was sold on that pick. Yeah, I mean, agree 100%. I think the Thor was was fine, but I think there was much better picks available. And I think even taking away the Rat would have made a lot more sense for the Warriors because, I mean, that was a last pick Rat for the Levi's and they got a lot of value from it. But going into P's and B's, Warriors taking the first side again. Last time we saw an Athena first pick traded out for the Chernobog Maman. This game, bands flying through already. Mostly the same so far. We have Yamoja was the next one by the Warriors. That has changed. It is now going to be a Chernobog. Now Chernobog taken away begs the question if the Leviathans want to change anything up in this slot game number one. They took away the Erlong. Just some targeted bands here. Maybe not considering any of these picks that the Kepri, the Uller, the Erlong. Not necessarily top, top of the tier list. But... Targeted picks taking away from the Warriors. We've seen Sot especially have a lot of success on the Solar Genetics. Goes back to this Kepri quite a bit. And so taking away those comfort picks from the Warriors, trying to force them onto the meta. And the Leviathans, I, I think they're pretty happy with how they're, they're playing the meta. Even in that game, I mean, to, to, to win a game where the enemy team has the EFG and just took your Phoenix, right? That's your winning moment is when the EFG, you, you win the team fight against the EFG team. Like that's gotta be a momentum builder. Oh yeah, for sure. Especially when previously to that, the previous five, 10 minutes were almost all warriors. And then it just, that was the one turning moment. And now you feel like you were in control most of that game, even if you really weren't. Now looking at their final ban, the Athena. So trading out that Yamoja ban for an Athena ban, a Chernobog ban, opens up a potential Yamoja first pick, a Maman, and it looks like Maman Brigitte over the Yamoja. Now we've seen kind of this, this split on how people prioritize this Maman. Some teams first picker, some teams don't even pick or banner the entire top 10 picks and bans. Yeah, I think these two teams are instances where you are going to see this pick prioritized. I, we have not seen it on the Warriors quite yet, but we've already identified a couple of players, three at least, of, yeah. that can play the Maman, or at least would would like to think that they could play a play styles matchup on the side of the Warriors. So, no surprise you get a little bit of value there after seeing how the Maman performed in game number one. The Leviathan, so that opens up, you know, a couple of interesting interactions on their side where they get the Yamoja they also get the Baba Yaga. First time we've seen this pick today. Prioritized seemingly top two, which is where I feel like it should be all the time. But then we just get drafts where you, you just don't pick it or ban it at all. But and this is something the Leviathans have liked in the past. Yeah, it seems like the stacking nerf that she got has affected her a lot more than you would have expected. A lot of teams are prioritizing her now a lot less. But this back line of Baba and whoever ADC you go with it, a lot of peel with this emoji, a lot of survivability already. And the Oni Warriors on the opposite side with that Amaterasu lock-in, which we've seen in jungle and we've seen in solo a lot, so some flex potential there. And Izanami, really the only player picking Izanami still, is Netroid wanting to get that uh, auto attack, just basically just free lane. I was going to explain what Izanami does. She, she basically just wins lane for the entire first three levels with her auto attacks. So that's what Netroid goes for. It gets a little bit of guaranteed pressure over there in that dual lane, which is pressure is what the, the Warriors like to play with. They had a little bit last game with that Athena this time around. Won't have access to that same support. On the other side, the Leviathans go back to the Raijin. I think Final K looked, looked pretty comfortable on this in game number one. We talked about it a little bit, maybe lacking some of that traditional engage when you have that sort of backliner support and also this, this mage solo that you know, feels comfortable, wants to dash in, but it's hard to dash in when you're just a mage all the time. That being said, it brings begs the question, a little bit surprising after that game number one, that the only Warriors don't continue to value an, a, another mage solo. I, I thought solo or troll looked 
decent on the East Shell, and, and with Morgan the Face still being up, thought that might have been prioritized. Yeah, I mean, I agree 100%. We haven't seen any value or any prio on this Izanami. A little strange to see them go for this, but maybe this means the Warriors don't think those mage solos are, are as strong as the rest of the teams do, especially with the Levi's going for this Ryzen back-to-back and banning out that MLF in the ban phase. And with that MLF ban also going for that Sobek ban, which is something we've seen kind of rise and fall. It kind of comes forward for a couple games and then leaves for a few games, and it's a... It's a weird pick, to say the least, because you see Aegis so back. How many times do you see Aegis supports? It's very rare. But then on the opposite side, Warriors opting for the Rat, a Will Expands, taking away some of Adapting's best junglers from the past two days. I think these two stick out to me as ones he's looked really comfortable on. Now we're going to have to dig not too deep for junglers, because really only two Assassin bands. A bunch of bands actually spread out across the board. Yeah, I mean, these are the only two junglers that Adapting has played thus far this weekend, right? It was a, a wheelish and then two rack games yesterday, I believe, and then just the rack game that, that we saw now. Of course, a deep god pool for Adapting, and he really doesn't have to go that deep to, to go back to his signature Thor, which I don't, I don't feel bad calling signature at all at this point. We have seen him fluctuate a little bit on this pick throughout the, the Road to World season thus far. I think we've seen him have like dominant Thor games, and we've also seen him have, have you know, a couple, couple off days here and there, but taking the Thor away from Panatom, going to force Panatom onto a slightly different pick, and with this lock-in, if it is the Tiamat, it, it looking looking like Panatom is going to be piloting the Maman Brigitte. I mean, yeah, but there's also like, we've seen a bunch of Ama jungle. So, d I mean, we've talked about it already. Maman three solo? Yeah, three players can play this Maman. But I would have to agree. I assume it's Ama solo, Maman jungle. But I'm, I, the Warriors always draft what you don't expect. And whatever you expect is usually what they don't go for. So something where they take that Maman, put it in solo lane. But I will agree that I do think it is going to be Maman in the jungle. I just want to put it out there that there's always potential for the Warriors to do something a little funkier. And then last pick for the Levi's, Martikris, which is really just a Panda Cat pick. It's, nobody else is really going for it, and he likes it in this lower end of P's and B's. And he looks comfortable on it. I, I think it's a, a strange ADC because it plays very weak early game, and I think a lot of the ADCs picked currently are pretty strong laners. I mean, Hachi, strong at five, strong at four even. On her, I mean, I don't have to really speak about on her, kind of <laughs> the dominant ADC. But this, this Marty is something that where he really just wants to go late. And if you see the late game of this Levi's comp, there's so much strength across the board. Yeah, there's a lot of team fight potential for the Levi's just in general. You get the semi global pressure, you, you really have two carries that can kind of press W in a team fight, tankiness from the Baba and, and that immunity coming from the Martikras. On the other side, a, not not necessarily as cohesive, but also For a sure. lot of, of team fight tools, right? You've got that front line, just drop ultimates, and, and you have this big area of control. And I think if it does go where we expect it to go, if it does end up being Maman in the jungle, that provides a little bit, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to lock down that pick in the jungle and with how hard it is to lock down Maman already. <laughs> like, you're going to have a harder time keeping track of that jungler. Yeah, I think my only true worry with this Warriors comp is the lack of easy engage. There's no hard, uh, like, Athena dash taunt. It is a, a slow from Ganesh with the alt field, and then maybe a stun with Tiamat, and that's really it. The rest of it is very long channeled alt timer with the Amaterasu. The uh, ultimate from Amon, I can't remember the name of it. Very telegraphed, obvious, with what it's going to be doing. And then the party trick, also the one, the sun is very short range. So I'm a little worried that the Warriors, if it goes late, the ease of access in these fights is not there when you compare it to the Levi side. Yeah, I mean, this almost feels like a, a sort of a counter-engage composition where you, you want to drop the Ganesh pillars at your feet. You want to be prepared for them to, to run into you. But that, especially on, on a knife's edge match like this, we just saw a match that was almost like within 1,000, 2,000 in gold, even as we got to those later stages. It sort of sets up for those teetering on an edge, fire giant fights or, or, or dances, right? Where you can like get to 30 minutes and then there's just five minutes of stalemating around the fire giant. Yeah, and I would expect it to go to that point again too. I don't think either of these teams want to play to like 
you know, rushed the early game like we saw last game. Last game was rushed in the early game, and it was still a 1-2,000 to 2, gold lead. This game, I expect a slightly slower pace from both sides. If there's going to be something level 5, I think for the Warriors, maybe some potential to start, you know, hurrying the game along. But this Levi's comp just scales infinite, I infinitely into this late game. Curious if Maman can even kill anyone in the back line with the Emoja Baba and the Marty, so we'll have to see with that. Well, scaling for both sides here, and we'll see who takes game number two. We'll throw it over to the casters, J-Mac and Mifflin. Yeah, thank you, Frog, and inbound over on the desk. That's right, it's game number two between the Warriors and the Leviathans. It's J-Mac, it's Mifflin, and it's Doug here to bring you the action for our second game. Now, one up for the Leviathans. But in a game where it really felt like it was the Warriors controlling the pace of the game for almost the entirety of it, it was just an overextension at a right side Phoenix team fight that goes to the Leviathans and a 4-0 and a 4-0 sweep at that. So a very close game all throughout game one. And now as we jump into game number two, we do see the Thor back in this time, but instead of in Panatom's hands, it's over towards adapting. And we see this Maman pulled out of mid and back into the jungle one more time. And I am a fan of Amon Rajit Jungle. New strong god, put it in the strongest role in the game. That, that's generally my MO, so good to see the Oni Warriors want to do exactly that. It is a slightly different damage curve to, to maybe some of Panatom's signature picks where it's uh, a whole lot of like Susano, a lot of Thor, a lot of Erlong Shen. Just I want to be involved very early. Feels like Maman Brigitte a little bit more so mid-game slanted, wants two or three items before she's got all that one-shot potential, but still not damage to scoff at throughout the early portions, and certainly capable of clearing out some of those waves quickly. It's the inconsequential damage from Mon Brigitte that it makes her so dangerous on the first couple of waves. I'll clear the wave, but if you get hit by the dot, you will lose out on the majority of your HP too. Nice little double tap from adapting. Equalizes the damage a bit. Speaking of, a little bit more of a mid-game slant. Shinto going towards that Baba Yaga is going to be a little bit slower, but Tiamat on the other side similarly a bit slower too. So I don't imagine we see too much action on the center of the map. These mid laners both playing for the scaling. Shinto playing for the Prophetic Cloak. Pagon just playing to get more general damage items online. More than anything. Even with the hits to the Baba Yaga, I thought we'd still be seeing a lot more priority towards her. First day, really didn't see any teams kind of opting towards the Baba. It wasn't until I think almost a ninth or 10th pick the first game she actually got through. So not seeing as much priority towards her anymore with some of the nerfs that came her way. But it's not like they really nerfed her damage output. It was just how fast she stacks up some of these key items she's been going towards. Yeah, so we'll still be able to get involved. And I'm sure we'll be doing exactly that. I'm curious about this Martikaras pick, and I think the Des does a great job highlighting it a, a good deal. It is a slight departure from the standard ADC meta, which is pressure, 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 pressure. But does play well into pressure, and, and certainly we'll have to do that here up against an Izanami. Good luck forcing waves into Panicat's tower. Acid Rain from downtown. Just slow down the wave. Deal with it from range. Has that ability to remove himself from the play field once he gets access to the ultimate. I think should play well. Hang on. Nearly connects the stun. Or has the stun connected onto him instead. Makes himself scarce. I wonder. Where do we see the action first? Is it really just going to come down to where does the jungler go? Maybe duo lane would be a good place for adapting to start putting some of his own pressure, considering how far up the Oni Warriors are playing right now. But it's not exactly any free ganks for, for either jungler. I'm, I'm looking across the board as Milan. Maybe you can be a bit annoying into Marty because of the delayed damage from the dot. Could catch him even when he's off play field, but otherwise still is one of the, the harder gods to gank. Even in the du solo lane, Raijin a little bit more difficult too. Okay, and a bit of danger, stunned out, silence, but SOT walks okay. into the tower, takes a tower shot, fine, okay. Down to a couple hundred health, falls back to pick up the blue buff that adapting help drop down. Wrong you went for an invade to try and slow things down. Fortune X and Netroid is able to bail himself out in the 1v2 scenario. It's wrong you still trying to play aggressive on this emoji. A pick that we haven't seen, and I'll say, we haven't seen enough of from Wrong you over the year. Maybe it's a product of how good the god is and how often she's banned away, but which is like every game, pretty much. But after we got to see like just one game from Wrong Yu Jumoja just in the last week of SPL, maybe it's the week, even though actually it's the technically the week before is in week six. I said, man, he still got it. He he was once heralded as probably the top Yumoja player in the world for a for a good duration. 
and seeing him back on it. We'll see if he's still got it this game. Adapting in the sky in Whoa. the Tier 1 tower. Misses the dunk on SOT. Just a little too far out of range, even with Final K standing by. Not one to stick around for the tower dive. Man, Sot's game sense just through the roof there. I, I can't believe he realized what was coming his way. Plays deep in the tower and avoids that dunk. If Dunk connects, CC Chain would have likely just secured the kill. SOT has access to the ultimate, but if Tycho Drum is used properly, would not have had an opportunity to channel it. And so, narrowly escapes once more with his life, makes his way back to base, and picks up a little bit of defense to alleviate some of those laning woes. And generally, Warriors in Origin have a good deal of those woes. Slows the stun off the mark, but a Dharmic Pillar forced out of genetics to keep the chase away from himself. No Omi left from wrong you after that stun to keep up that chase. Leviathan's trying to play aggressive in the duo. See if they can find a pick on the genetics, but just not quite enough damage there. Really, the, the early game woes of them, Marty Cross is highlighted by the deaths. Not the strongest early game. Good wave clear, but not the best poke on enemy gods yet. No, but he'll get there eventually, especially if he likes to go down double stack. And looking at the build, I'm assuming that is exactly what he is planning on doing. And once you're at two items deep on Marty, I mean, your laning phase is just played for you. He's just going to acid rain the wave. It's going to clear it. He'll build up his stacks, and he won't ever have to put himself in a dangerous position. That could open the door to wrong you, making a bit more consistent rotations. If Netrid wants to keep playing this pressure role, genetics likely will be, will be locked to playing in that dual lane with them. So we'll see. Could be just a smart answer from the Leviathans. In a, in a pressure meta, I'll just put someone over there that can hold their own and be safe, and Marty certainly fits that role would mean that you'd like to see the Leviathans play a bit elsewhere on map and already haven't seen Adapting make, I believe, two attempted rotations over towards Soul Lane. That does seem to be the case. Seen Panatom stick around this right side of the map pretty frequently in these first six minutes of play. Made two rotations over, only one time he steps in the lane. Genetics walks up to steal the purple buff away, able to grab that one from under wrong you, silenced away. Can't use any abilities to try and confirm that one. So a nice little steal by Genex and Netroid. Grab the purple buff away from Panda and Rong Yu. And deny a little bit more experience that lane that's already struggling a bit. Level 7s for the Warriors duo versus the 6 of the Leviathans. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. Shield buff should go over to the Oni Warriors as well. Panda Cat not going to be looking for any engagements until Transcendence and maybe Soul Eater as well is stacked up. So... Just about slowing things down and making sure you don't lose out on too much. Could be that Adapting makes some of those rotations over towards Duo on next purple buff rotation. Just try and prevent the Oni Warriors from locking that down consistently. It's not about one invade, it's what you do with the timer. Adapting, dunk on the sod. CC Chain is there. Dash the wrong way for SOT, but maybe it's the right way to try and bail himself out. The dot's not enough. The hammer's got to be there. And the spin from Adapting will notch first blood for the Leviathans and taking down SOT. Yeah, Sod is just not going to have a fun time in this lane. Does not have sustain to match up against the Pythag's piece and hasn't had the same level of jungle presence either. Panatom's been doing a lot of this on map. Just taking away any bit of farm that he can find. A little speed buff invade will help him out a bit, but we're starting to see some of those leads developed. Shinto's had a free laning phase up until this point, so already starting to get some decent stacks in that Book of Thoth. Fine, okay, has been benefiting from a lead and will only continue to do so because SOT is not going to have any boxing potential anytime soon. I wonder now. Need to see Panatom get involved somewhere on map just to be a threat. And with Doom War finished, he is going to have a bit of that threat. Really, it is a, a two or three item spike that you're looking for from Amon. Panatom soaks up a little farm on left. Rotation from adapting early before this purple buff is even spawned back in. Gets spotted out by Genetics and Panatom walking through the jungle. The only Warriors trying to strip any farm they can. Snake thrown out, but a quick wall and a spin from Adapting takes about half of Panatom's HP. Makes him think twice about sticking around inside of the jungle. Shinto a bit low. Can resustain a bit, as long as his house has a couple of stacks available to him. But already working now on that Book of Thoth, nearly stacked up entirely. A huge power spike towards Shinto. Fast, fast. action in duo. Panda Cat's quick reactions get him up into the sky in time to avoid the Dharmic Pillars. Yeah, Panda didn't take a tick of damage there, playing so quickly. Realizes, surrounded, and doesn't want to be immediately up in the air. And that's exactly what we're calling for. Adapting does make rotation for this spawn of the purple buff. And we'll be able to secure it for his team. So slows down the only Warriors duo lane ever so slightly. 
still, you need to find somewhere for the Leviathans where they can put some of this pressure. 500 gold separating these teams. The only Warriors slowly pulling ahead. you got to assume that entire lead coming from the dual lane, maybe a little bit in mid. Pagan at a slight experience advantage there. As Shinto just now takes over to level 11. A bit of parity. But Pagan hadn't cleared out his own red buff just yet either. Leviathans. It's a very slow game. It's reminiscent to like Season 8 Legacy Leviathans. Just play it slow, wait for that team fight phase. And, and their team fight is strong, but you don't want to allow the Oni Warriors to get too much before that point. Maybe just controlling those neutral objectives to make sure the Warriors aren't confident in their gold fury. Adapting. Goes up to the sky. Immediately ults back towards the safety of his buff. A couple of pings from the Warriors let them know where Adapting has gone towards. But having some good CDR in his kit already from his build means that ultimate will be up relatively soon for Adapting. Uh, but I guess kind of going to your talking point there, is this a comp for the Warriors that scales a little bit harder for themselves in the late game? Is this one that can really stand up to the more scaling style of comp the Leviathans have drafted for themselves? The Warriors have got really strong initiation, they've got great threat on objective, and they've got a standard mage in mid. So, I mean, this is a, as good as like a classic smite composition is going to get. But looking at what the Leviathans have got, I'm really worried about what that Yamoja is going to bring to the team fight. That's what T just accosted over in that soul lane. I'm worried about the Yamoja, the scaling of Martikaras, and the, the ultimate, the Death from Above, having so much penetration on it and defense shred should make it easy for the Leviathans to go for single target initiations. If Rongyu decides, yo, Genetics just used his dash, he's stuck in my walls, Panda Cat hit him with the ultimate, let's dump our damage, it'll just work. Whereas the Oni Warriors, I think, going to struggle a little bit more so to deal with the tankier targets of the Leviathans. Rongyu... Finds a double stun. Bubble slows things down. Another stun only hits Genetics. We use the reverse rebuke to separate the team fight. Shinto on the way. Does a his ult towards Genetics, but Genetics fine for the time being. But adapting in the sky, his target might just be Genetics. The dash is down, but adapting misses the ult. Darmic Pillar used by Genetics in the silence. Not going to get what he wanted because the beats by adapting. That's a second kill for the Leviathans, but it's still a small gold lead for the Oni Warriors. And after all that, Netroid's still healthy and has ult to try and push up for this invade. But maybe we'll think twice after seeing Rong Yu stepping through the jungle. Yeah, shouldn't invade on his own, but this is an issue the Leviathans ran into in game one, where they were controlling the PvP throughout the early game, but couldn't quite find any opportunities to look towards objectives. Exact same position there, considering it's a four ultimate dedication just to knock down Genetics. Genetics holds on to his relics. No other beads burnt on the only warriors, so the Leviathans can't just stick around and force another engagement around the Fury itself. So, the Warriors, and just keeping up pressure on map and playing aggressively, ha have restricted what the Leviathans are capable of doing even during their own wins. That said, Leviathans are not exactly overly concerned with the, the early game. It's just about mitigating loss. Need to mitigate this. Oni Warriors, Gold Fury pool attempted, but spotted out quickly. Panda Cat, heads up. Let's drop down Sentry Ward. D Ward's above the Gold Fury pit. Just keeps eyes what the Warriors might want to go for. Wrong you. Spots out Genetics roaming through the jungle with Netroid. Meanwhile, Shinto by himself with Pagon. Just chipping away at the enemy mid laner while starting to work on capping up the beacon while the other three of the Warriors joined by SOT go to the Gold Fury. Wrong you's here. No Rivers Rebuke and Atomic Pillar by Genetics. This Gold Fury will go to the Warriors. But where's the response now from the Leviathan? Shinto getting dove. As Panatom goes for the ultimate, tries to predict Shinto's landing but it's just off the mark with doing so. It's the Warriors with a Gold Fury and Whoa. adapting with a double dunk in mid. Silence out though by Sot, who goes in with his own ult just to try and bail out the team. Stun is good, but with Shinto's ult in response, now SOT trying to bail out. Yeah, that's a great rotation from the Warriors. We'll see if they can make it out alive though. Wrong you. Positioned very aggressively, still has access to that ultimate. Dashing for fine, okay, all for the beacon. Beacon, hot contest right now. Netroid even drops his own ultimate in the middle of the platform, but it will still go to the Leviathans. Oni Warriors, who had a great fight around the Fury, I should maybe say, lack thereof need to fight by taking that Fury with little to no contest from the Leviathans. The Levi's who get the beacon, and now Panaton pushed up to fight. Okay, pre-beats early. 
Dash from Final K gets away from Panatom. Baruz Rebuke have now kept three people inside. It's a dive in onto Shinto. Baruz have collapsed in, and it's Shinto going down first, but adapting. Trades out and grabs Panatom all the while. While hits Peg on double slow. tap is good. That's half HP. As Final K Thunder crashes in, but has to use all of his relics just to stay alive. Doesn't have access to ultimate as Nitro is just swinging away, free casting with his basic attacks. As Final K stunned out of the Thunder Crash, barely able to get out. Sot but Sot's going to chase on in ultimate. Only the first swipe needed to get the kill. Man, the Oni Warriors, they just play so well at this portion of the game. The 13-minute soul lane rotation. Netroids out of his lane, getting involved around that Pyromancer, turns around the engagement. Panicats on the opposite side of the map, so there's no way the Leviathans find themselves in even footing. And the Oni Warriors, once more, take a neutral objective. That is tough stuff, man. Fine, okay. Trying his best to stay aggressive. Found a lot of damage in that fight. Dashing in twice, maybe thrice, adapting, double tap on a Pagon. Everything's starting to look good. And then you realize, wait, hold on. Who is that shredding, adapting? Oh, it's Netroid. Why is he on this side of the map? I guarantee that's exactly what the Leviathans are saying to themselves as well. As they lose out on once more on an engagement. The Oni Warriors put themselves in a very good position. All of a sudden, that, that scaling problem for the Leviathans, the, the need of time, going to come back and bite them. Panic Hat still working on his second item power spike. Needs to stack up that Soul Eater. Metroid's already doing a ton of damage with a standard ADC build. Executioner, Defense, Shred, all looking very good. Shinto has slowed down his own build. Diverges from double stack immediately, but does pick up the Prophetic Cloak in third. Will need some time to stack that one up. All of a sudden, the Leviathans are starting to lose confidence in their ability to take the PvP on map. His Fableless Hoops as well for Wrong You now. Good item. Picked up. Very strong item. Did get a little bit of a nerf this patch. Has that bit. internal cooldown. Realistically only affects gods like Yamoja, who was able to exploit the item pretty nicely in the previous patch. But the rest of the numbers to it, not changed. Still a nice health shield afforded to you from those heals on top of the shields you were already getting from the Yamoja. Saw a bit of danger. Collapsed on by Final K and adapting, but... Still healthy, has access to those heals and that death's toll to give him that extra bit of sustain. Not too much commit from the Leviathans. It felt like in that last team fight, they ran into a bit of the problem they had in game one where they're just not quite doing enough damage yet to some of these tankier targets of the Warriors. I mean, that'll be shored up once Pandacat gets involved in the fight. Have that ultimate to turn things around, but need Pandacat in the fight for that to be true. Slow rotation over towards the right side of the map, perhaps. Trying to make something happen around the Fire Giant. Only Warriors have hit their classic MO of knock down mid tier 1, control neutral objectives. So there's not much to fight over for now. Primal Fury going to be the next POI. Wonder. We see the Leviathans group up for that, or if the fight happens beforehand. Genetics gets from tied to the back line, but he's already used his ultimate all the way at the back of the fight. Panicat up to the sky. Raining a bit of damage in, but not too much at this stage. Wrong, you're trying to mitigate some with the healing. Panatom loses about 30% of his health from the combo out of adapting. Leviathans turning tail and backing up. Panacat's ult gone. Only relic used. Wasn't even a full relic. It was just the shard from Wrong Yu. As the Primal Fury now goes to the Oni Warriors. No contest. Nobody from the Leviathans even aware that this is happening. It's been this objective play from the Warriors this phase that's been the real big kind of turnaround for this team. Where you look back at phase one. Not a whole lot of objective play or the, the calls to go for them. This phase, adding genetics to that roster is really up the awareness of that map for the team. Yeah, and it's the side lane rotators, I think, too. SOT and Natura are just so aware of when they need to be in the lane and when, they, when they're allowed to not be. Leverage it very well there. SOT makes his way all the way to the left side of the map. Grabs his team, the Gold Fury, with the help of the ADC. And the Oni Warriors keep those neutral objectives desynced. And that's the most important thing. If they wait another 15, 20 seconds, a Pyromancer's up on map. Sure, the Oni Warriors are favored in a Gold Free fight, but the Leviathans would at least be able to knock down a neutral on the other side, put a Runic Bomb in pocket, and find a bit of parity on map. But because they're desynced, the Oni Warriors can head back to base, spend up that gold, regroup, and do it again now on the right. And, and it's this willingness as well to pseudo-swap lanes. So often, Netroid leaves, and Panatom says, well, someone's got to get this farm. So he'll be pushing out the left. But Netroid's the threat on objective, and because he's here on the right-hand side, the Leviathans have to show up in numbers to respond. Saw to the back line. 
Doing a lot of damage to adapting and fine, okay, but starting to take a bit of his own. Wall keeps him from an immediate escape out. But he'll be able to dash back, no problem. Pyromancer there. Playing on a ward. He's going to be able to re-sustain, but the Leviathans know that this is happening. Sot steps forward. So it's getting chipped away by Fine OK and by Panic Hat of Riptide. And a River's Rebuke catch him in. But a fast Phantom Shell will bail them out. Adapting is up in the sky. The Shell has now faded away as the Pyromancer pulled once more. Adapting crash in. Wall on two. But no follow-up from the Leviathans. It might be Panatom to reinitiate for the squad. He walks up, but he's spotted out. Speaking of Panatom, he's had a free ride this game so far. Hasn't had to take just about any fights on map. Nearing the bottom of the damage charts, but has hit some pretty significant power spikes. Polynomicon, third slot, so a little bit more burst to play with. Has got a little bit of that penetration, too. And it seems to me that he's happy with his damage output. Going to pick up a little bit of defense to allow him into that back line. Darmic Pillars locks out wrong you, but he's able to rip tight to try and bail out. Second one there, third one on the way, but now adapting spins on top of Genex. He gets some good damage. Silence is keeping adapting locked in for the moment. But he'll be able to walk himself back out. Genetics is falling low in health, and Panicat trying to zone with some extra damage. It's the Warriors right back to the Pyromancer, the Leviathans. Can't do anything about it. Have to give up the objective once more. Yeah, once Adapting uses his ultimate, once Rongyu uses his, the Leviathans really have a hard time taking space. Uh, have you seen that? The only Warriors, once they get through those resources, say, okay, let's just get back to the Pyromancer, and I dare these guys to walk into me. And the, the Leviathans have either been unwilling or incapable. And so, the only Warriors take yet another neutral objective. Two Runic Bombs in play now. Means that they could go knock down a tier one tower on right or left. Probably just right, so they can stick close to the fire giant on map. Leviathans need to find an answer soon because this gold lead is starting to balloon completely out of control. Power spikes are starting to line up. I'm looking at the prophetic cloak for Shinto, but Shinto's been playing so far in that back line that it hasn't even really been allowed to leverage his more defensive stats. The die potential needs to get some sort of boost here. I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact that Panicat has been forced into death from above defensively uh, from the offset of just every single one of these engagements. I think that ultimate is just so key to the Leviathan's team fight and ability to punish either SOT, Pagon to a certain extent, and genetics. That having taken it away every single time, the Warriors that ha ha that is, they've just removed so much of the threat that the Leviathans have got to play with. If Panicat can just maintain it and keep present in that team fight. Keep Adapting's ultimate available as well. Things will start to look a little bit better, but that's all hard asks, considering how far ahead the Warriors are. And that's how it does manage to pick up a Magi's Cloak along with it, so extra CC immunity for him. Not the worst tools, but also not the best tools to Leviathans to really break that. Fonike would have to dash in. I guess Adapting's wall, probably the best option, the best answer. To try and take that one away from Panatom, but he's been playing... Kind of on the outskirts of a lot of these fights. Even get spotted out by Shinto. Well, there's an easy one. You get a nice little bit of RNG with a silence. That breaks that one immediately. Three, two, but two. it's a tier two tower for the Warriors. They can just walk up and take this one. But Shinto, not going to give it up so easily. Jumps up into the house. Throws out some of those fire bolts and adapting to the sky. Dive on to Pagon. But Pagon jumps over it right away. And now there's no further fallout from the Leviathans. The Darmic Pillar already used. And the Riptides from Wrong You get the Leviathans out of danger. Towers are a zero sum game. Still there for the Leviathans, even if just by a pixel. So no global gold over to the Oni Warriors, who had the opportunity to drop at least one of those runic bombs. Try and knock it down instead. Got a little bit greedy. Try to hold on to it. Come away with nothing. Gold Fury, though, once more. I mean, just standard practice now for the Oni Warriors. Should be able to knock it down. Leviathans can't send anyone over to the left side of the map because they're worried. But Fire Giant on right. And so just a little bit more to line the coffers of the order side team, who have slowed their pace considerably, uh, as opposed to game one, where they established their lead and started setting a breakneck pace, forcing fight after fight on map. Seems to me unhappy with how game one had ended. Have really righted the ship. At this point, though, I think the Oni Warrior is far enough ahead that they could just go ahead and start forcing some of those engagements. Maybe waiting on some of those ultimates to come back up. All back now. Relic's in a pretty good spot, too. Just group up around that Fire Giant and start chipping away at the Leviathans, I think, likely to call here. Or even group up on right, force that Tier 1 tower. Plenty of places for the Oni Warriors to throw their weight around. Pretty big gold disparity between the two junglers, though. Panatom, level 20. Oh, he's farming. Upgraded his starter. Has that Magi's. You look the opposite side. 
Still the base starter from adapting and only tier one in that Heartseeker tree. We'll see if the Leviathan is imposed of a defense against the Fire Giant that the only Warriors have started up. It's Panatomp walking forward first, but immediately dashing out. Panacap being dove on by Sot and is forced to the sky defensively again just to bail himself out. Still holding on to all relics but beads from Shinto as they got forced out in the last fight. And the Oni Warriors go to fire one more time. Saw trying to zone. Fire Giant down to 25%. Final K up in the Tycho drums and getting some good damage. So the Warriors get the adapting. fire and adapting up in the sky. Where will its target be for the crash? Down. It's on top of Sot, but Sot's healthy for the time being. But a Riptide and a River pulls it back in. A dive in by Final K. He's going to use the beads to try to get away from the He's going to get stunned out by Sot. Two of them stunned. In fact, it's Panatom. Is taking a taxi to the back line. Has to get himself out. The Leviathan's still healthy. They're being sustained back up by Wrong Yu and a dive on Still Genetics alive? Nearly takes him down, but it's low health bars from the Leviathans as they're starting to fall apart. Peg onto the back line. Gets one, gets two before he inevitably goes down to Shinto. He's still alive. You sure? Still kicking. Sot takes him down. Shinto can't get the job done. It's Netroid with another and only Panda left alive. SOT on the chase. He'll make everyone around him just that much faster. Silence from Netroid for the double kill on the Panda Cat. And the Oni Warriors take the objective of the team fight after. Leviathans try their hardest to lock down a chase down, adapting great walls. Fine, okay. Finds multitudes of leaps, but just not enough. And it's that one team fight, deja vu, but in the inverse, that gives the Oni Warriors a massive dub. Two seconds on Wrong Yu. Can he hold out on the Titan for a little while? It's low health bars, but Wrong Yu's just throwing bubbles, throwing stuns. That's not enough. The Oni Warriors tie up the set one to one. Leviathan's got to find an answer to this objective style of play, man. I mean, Gold Fury goes down, 13 minute mark, Pyromancer at 14, and it's just repeat on cooldown until eventually the lead is so significant there's, there's nothing left for the Leviathans to do in the team fight. I liked what we were seeing in the actual execution of the team fight from the Leviathans. It's just so far behind that it didn't matter that they were hitting all their buttons. All right, Pagon playing like a man possessed that game, diving in on the Tiamat. Ridiculous. 1v3, gets a double kill, should have died as Shinto cuts off his path, and Pagon says, why don't I just path back to the rest of my team and get the bail out there? Sod helps him out, and Netroid comes up big. The only warrior is able to tie this set up. Keep us interesting and at least guarantee us a game four. Should do. And the Leviathans have always been a team that have been praised for their adaptability. The, the, the willingness to switch who they're able to play through. Now we need to see their adaptability to enemies. It, it's not play your own game. You need to address what the Oni Warriors are doing. And that, what they're doing is you highlight the best was objective play. Got to see a little bit more from the Leviathans on their objectives here for game number three. We're going to take it to a quick break and we'll be right back with that game.
Welcome back, Smite fans, to the Road to World Playoffs. Game number two goes the way of the Oni Warriors. You still got Frog, still got Inbound here on the desk to break it down. And I think Miff said it best in the, in the, in the post-game bit, the objective play from the Oni Warriors, just too strong to stand up against. They look controlling in that game number two. Yeah, very slow game overall. We didn't really see much until that final fight, but... The macro play and just the ability to show up to objectives, blow them up, and then get out really benefits the, the Warriors very well. It's kind of almost like the Dragons would opt to do. they just go to the objectives. As soon as the objectives are done, they'd split out, and they wouldn't take the fight after. I mean, we're talking about six kills till 20 minutes into this game. And on the back of it, 
This Amaterasu in solo is allowed to just do a lot more stuff than she is in jungle. When she's played in solo, she can sit on the objective, she can tank it permanently, and she can also increase DPS. When you have it in the jungle, it's not that same type of threat. So I really like seeing Solo Troll opt to take this instead of the jungle uh, option to give it to Panatom. And I want to see it continuously be prioritized and continuously be played around because we saw how insane that objective potential is with this pick. And then this last fight here, the, the engagement that felt like it went on forever Too long. in that jungle <laughs> corridor. The re-engage and then the counter-engage and then the counter-counter-engage. And then Pagon looking like a superstar jumping over the wall. That double kill there. And lived. By the team. At, and, of, you and, know, and he lived. Had, you know, had to, had to survive in the end there. And that was the Oni Warriors pushing down to end it. But, I mean, they're the ones to sort of break the mold here. They, they move away from the mage solo meta. And I think Sot looks really solid. Very controlling. A lot of space created. And then... With Tiamat, with the with the pick stick, and just sort of press W key, we talked about it being a re-engage, a counter-engage composition. They get to do it. They, they sort of win one or two fights and then push down an end. Yeah, and if you compare the, the damage of both the solo laners, 17,000 on the side of Final K and only 9,000 for solo, that is the job of the solo lane mage. That is the only thing it really does. It's, its job is there to poke, to control area, and that's really all it does. But the amount of space control that solo would provide, the objectives, the utility, the chase down potential, the peel out potential, yeah. it is more than just that damage. So the damage number maybe doesn't look that great. Stat line looked fine, 3-1-3. Three, three. It's a good stat line for such a low score or score, low, low killing game. But when you play these solo mages, it just comes down to your damage. And if you're not doing enough, then that's all you're good for. Picks and bans for game number three here. After losing the Leviathans, they get their choice. They opt to go into this first pick position. And I think th this, is, this has been an interesting pick ban meta that we've seen thus far in this set. A couple of throwaway bans, as we talked about, from the Leviathans just continuing to target out those gods the Warriors have liked to go back to. Meanwhile, the Warriors sticking closer to the top of the tier list. They've taken away this Opwash, this Poseidon as well, things that they've taken away. The Leviathans have to choose where they want to focus out. This Kepri and Oler have been those staples for them. This Chernobog will be what they go back to. My eyes, once again, fall to the supports. Yemoja and Athena could both be available here. Yeah, that's kind of the prio we've seen with these teams so far. It's those support supports, those the Maman, and then the Chernobog. Now we're going to get at least three of those with those that Chernobog getting banned by the Levi's. Warriors have one ban available here. And, and right here is a good opportunity to just throw away ban. If, if you give up something, say they pick Athena, then you get Maman, you get Yemoja. It's a good two-for-one trade. And we've also seen Levi's prio their solo lane mage. They like to put it somewhat early at least, maybe not first pick. So that's something that they, you can almost guarantee they're going to be picking. Could throw away ban something here, like if you're worried about Final K on that Ryzen again. Because 17,000 damage was a lot of damage. He's do like That's his job. That's what he's doing. He's doing it well. But if you think about the next sol solo lane mage available, it's Morgan Le Fay. She's a very good character, but is she as much damage, as much safety, as much utility, as much CC as Ryzen? Not really. I think that'd be a good place for the Warriors to look. Yeah, we could see a, a little bit of flex into that role as well. I mean, we obviously saw in our set number one, the Agni, Persephone, the Eshell that we've seen as well. Won't see that quite yet, though. Instead, it's the Athena prioritized here for the Leviathan. Saw how this, how powerful this was for the engage potential of the Warriors in game number one. And, and Rongyu has liked to go back to it, of course. Only Warriors, though. Interesting prioritization here. They go for the Amaterasu and the Maman, but I suppose the Leviathan's. I mean, Yemoja's still up, but it would be hard to go both Yemoja and Athena. Yeah, I had the exact same first thought as you. I was like, okay, they're going to go Yemoja Maman here. Oh, no, they'll pick the Ama because they can almost guarantee the Yemoja down at that third pick. Yes, there's some potential for a, an Athena solo or Athena jungle, Athena solo, and the Yemoja in support, but it's not really something you see in this current meta, so I'm not too worried about it. I'm on the side of the words that I think they did this correctly. But now that leaves open, I, I think a mage solo here, minimum for the Levi's. And I also think that while there is a lot of good ADCs available right now, I think this on her just sticks out as a character that I think Panda Cat really does well on, and I think it's something that's not really been something he's picked. Well, 
Maybe he's gonna pick it now. He's picking it now. Yeah, love, love the call there from you on her. Likely headed over towards Panda Cat. And if this Raijin gets locked in, I think probably likely going back towards Fine. Okay, still some flex potential, of course, on that mage and on the on her, right? If we if we do want to yeah. flex that, if the Loathans choose to go in an interesting direction. But this leaves the third and final pick for this top ban phase on the Oni Warriors. And wondering if they, they choose to sort of keep this flex potential where it is. I think with that Amaterasu locked in, can feel pretty confident that's going towards Solo Retrol with how he played it in game number two. This still has, you know, flex potential for the Maman, though. We obviously saw Panatom on it last game. I think they'd like to keep the option open for Pagon to go to this pick, though. Yeah, I, I think they should just default to this Yemoja, just lock that in. You can go to the fourth pick. I think that is where you kind of want to keep this Maman open and then maybe go for your ADC in that fourth slot. There's a lot of value in that. And actually, that is surprising to me. Wow. Genetics not opting for the Yemoja. They go for this Tiamat. I mean... Pegon had a fantastic game. He, he won them that team fight. Let's not, let's make sure it's known that this Pegon Tiamat was very impactful last game. But not having an opportunity now go to this Yamoja, because I assume the Levi's are going to be banning it. What is like that next pick for genetics now? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, we, we saw the Ganesh course last game. He could go back to that. There there are plenty of other support picks. Charon uh, was one that we saw in, in the first set today. Fafnir, one that we've seen before in the past couple of weeks. But, I mean, this Tiamat prioritized. Y you got to be thinking, if you're the Warriors, if you do pick the Emoja there, sure, you know, love the Emoja. It's, it's a good pick. But if you get the Emoja there, almost certainly that Tiamat gets banned away by the Levi's. Yeah, it must mean that they just prior this Tiamat over even the Emoja. Or at least in this current P's and B's, th they're more comfortable with Tiamat than Emoja in this uh, draft that they have. And the, uh, the band that they go for is the Thor, the Levi's on the opposite side, the Izanami. One band available each. Warriors banning away the Thoth, which we saw yesterday. And Shinto had a couple couple big ults, uh, to say the least. A couple game-winning ults. It's no surprise there with that throwaway ban. And then the Levi's banning away the Yamoja. The Ganesh still open, as you said. Could run back four of the same five picks as last game with this Ganesh lock-in. Funny Warriors. With that fourth lock in, though, opt to go for the Hunter. Still holding on for what that support will be. I think genetics, I mean, the, the, the field seems wide open. You could go to a mage. You could go to a traditional guardian. You could even go to a warrior if you, if you really want to go something like Horus, right? Still on the table. Haven't seen it in a while. But I mean, this hover from the Leviathans is fascinating. At, at the very least, right? You already have Athena locked in, so if this Maui does get locked in, maybe to pull it away from Genetics, which, you know, signature pick for him has gone back to it in the past time and time again, but I think I think probably makes a little bit more sense to, to hover the Morgan Le Fay, baiting us out a, a bit with the Maui, but Morgan Le Fay and Raijin on the team, pretty powerful stuff from the Mage Department. Yeah, a little bit of flex potential there, too. Wonder if there's a prio pick that Final K would have in that soul lane against the Amaterasu matchup. Assuming Shinto will play either. Solo will or Shinto will play either, Final K will play either. But it's kind of which one do they prefer where. I think they both have separate strengths in the soul lane. Raijin, a little bit more CC, has... I think better late game, but I think Yemoja or, or Morgan is a very strong laning phase character. She has really good poke and really good setup, but I guess Ryzen has that too. I think is just the best solo lane, even after the nerfs, so I would prefer that and put the Morgan in mid. And with that last pick, Ganesh locked in for the Warriors, running back for the same five picks. Yeah, they definitely liked how their draft rounded out in game number one. We saw, or in game number two rather, and we saw how slow that game was for the first 15 or so minutes. Just, you know, pretty even gold, just playing around the objectives. I mean, if you're looking at this Leviathan's draft, whereas almost nothing, just one pick changes for the Warriors, a lot changes on the side of the Leviathans. You only are running back this Raijin, and everything else is different. Yeah, and it's, it's almost a completely different style. Like, l last game, they wanted to go for that late game and then start playing around those team fights. They only got really one team fight. This game, 
kind of like the opposite. This game, they want to fight. Ryzen wants to fight in solo. On her wants to fight. Athena is always wanting to fight. And then even Kama and, and Morgan have some semblance of fighting. Even if it's not in the early game, it's more of the mid game. So this is kind of a switch up by the Levi's. The Levi's, they want to be able to fight this Warriors comp because we saw the Warriors last game get to those objectives, get out. This time, it's the opportunity for the Levi's to kind of force fights or they can be the one pulling objectives and then looking for the fight after. Yeah, I think it was maybe a little bit tough for the Leviathans to, to decide where they wanted to find that fight, especially with such a heavy scaling composition. You look at the Baba, you look at that passive Martikras over in the ADC role versus the, the Izanami, who just clears wave for free. I mean, if you're looking at this Kamazots, right, especially for adapting to try and push the game through a, a specific lane, where do you think you're trying to focus the pressure through? I think you have to play around on her. That's always kind of like the guide you look at. My one problem is usually you want to play around a 2v2 with on her. You don't really want to leave him alone because he's not that safe. But you, uh, Athena kind of gives you that little bit of safety if you are in the 1v1. She can always just ult over. But I think playing around just your mid 3v3, giving the on her the 1v1, and then just having Athena ult over is your best option. You can dash taunt mid, pull, play for relics. And then when purple buff is spawning, you can start grouping up around there or just allow the on her to walk up and have the Athena ult viable and, and ready to go for that purple buff. But I think play for this on her. When we see on her, you want to play to get ahead. Doesn't even have to be 2v2 get ahead. It can be a 1v1 get ahead. But on her is who you want to prio, who you want to get ahead. I mean, another interesting matchup, we, we talked about adapting to, to try and push the game through a certain lane. How do you look at this jungle matchup, right? Maman versus the Kamazots coming through. The Kamazots, a lot of damage in, in a 1v1, and, and Maman brings the same thing. Who are you favoring if they run into each other in the jungle? I actually think this is one that Kama wins pretty easily. Whenever Party Trick comes out, Kama can just jump it, and then if she doesn't actually use it to hit the CC, throw the bottle on the ground, he can just ult out. Good poke, good sustain. This is one of those few matchups that Maman really does not win. So Kama, little bit of priority. I also think he dives a bit better into the comp also. So slight prior for the Kama over Maman in this 1v1. Well, tied up set between the Warriors and the Leviathan. Somebody looking to take the lead in game number three. We'll throw it over to the casters, J-Mac and Mifflin. Who's going to hit match point first? Will it be the Leviathans or the Warriors? We'll find that out here in game number three. That's right. It's J-Mac, it's Mifflin, and Doug. Here one more time to bring the action for our set member. Winner of this set qualifies the Smite World Championship and is guaranteed at least second seed. Loser jumps down into the loser's bracket and will then have to fight for that third and fourth seed spot, which all those seeding matches play a little bit later in our weekend. Close on the poll, 57 in favor of the Oni Warriors. This time it's been pretty even between these two over the course of this set, but first now one, after, Warriors won. after that first one, or after that last one, I should say, Warriors... Starting to get more favoritism from the crowd again. Yeah, Levi's are holding 60% the entirety of the setup until this point. Fairweather fans, man. What can, what, what can you say? You, you bleed a little bit, and all of a sudden, it's the Warriors world once more. I mean, I suppose I agree a, a bit, considering the only Warriors essentially play the exact same composition this time around. Leviathans, though, have got themselves some scary stuff. Uh, I think the deaths highlight it very well. The adaptation that we were calling for was, what's your answer? to this objective-focused play from the Oni Warriors and the Leviathan say, what if we just fight them now? What, what, what if we just fight them everywhere on the map right now? That seems to be exactly what this composition was built for. I'm excited uh, to watch Adapting in particular where he put some of his pressure. I think that Kamazots has one of the best matchups in the 1v1 up against Maman Brigitte, so significant answers there too. Genetics playing a bit dangerous. Still has that shell, though, so can't get overzealous. Dash in by Netroid. Rongi goes up. Taunt's available for him in just a few seconds. Used against Genex on the way. Both dual lane. And Panda's working Getting them. a little bit low, even with Netroid playing aggressive. His Panic Hatter came on top damage-wise. Taunt by Rongi gets beads from Netroid. An impale follow-up just for the extra damage. Big Relic now pulled away from the duo of the Oni Warriors. Yeah, surprised to see the Warriors... Uh, walk into an on her at level two and say, yeah, this is a fight I want to take. Here's the thing, Panda Cat hits just harder, and it's significantly harder. Two auto attacks from, from Panda Cat is, is going to take three or four from Netroid because of on her's passive at this point. And so any fight that Panda Cat can find is one he would be willing to take. Look at the potion economy of the duo lane. Support, uh, lower. Wrong you uses the majority of his, but we don't really care about support HP bars. It's ADCs, and Netroid's got one HP pot left, and Panda Cat's sitting on three. 
You do see junglers rotate over to the two sides. Panatom to duo. Adapting to solo lane. Now, I don't know if it was an accident or if it was a plan, but... Final K holding on to the first speed buff as opposed to blue. Doesn't seem to affect him in his at least MP5 department. You don't really get a whole lot of benefit from speed buff in lane compared to maybe your jungler being able to pick that one up, so maybe a bit suspect as we have 2v2 in mid. And there's a bit of that interaction that Bobby was talking about. See my mom walk up to you, fast leap out for adapting on the Camazots. Yeah, don't want to get hit by that stun. The reason I say Camazots, by the way, has such a good matchup in a Maman Brigitte is that Maman's damage is so delayed. Notice you got to stack up the passive first. The stun takes a second to come out. Whereas Camazots, it's double scream at you. One Vampiric Bats, one Screech. All of a sudden, you're probably a little bit too low to stick around. And then afterward, by nature of dash, Panaton, for the most part, going to use it to jump into adapting in the 1v1. Won't exactly be able to create a whole lot of space afterward. And adapting can just go up to the air to finish off his kills. Do you see Panatom? And collapsed on by two. Immediately forced to jump away for that. Pagon trying to go ahead. Let's clear out that green buff. Does do so. Give himself fine for the time being. Give himself a little bit of the benefit of that green buff. We see the junglers again, especially adapting, just really sitting over on this right side of the map, keeping those cooldown buffs. You don't see Panatom's rotation over to Duo. But it still doesn't at the Warriors that speed buff, or that shield buff. Keeps themselves just fine for now. Even despite that early scuffle, beats are back up in 25 seconds for Netroid. So unless we see some immediate aggression, not going to get too much value from taking that relic that early in the game. No, it won't be the case. Maybe you can make something happen once those ultimates are available for, for a few more people. But until then, just going to be spinning your wheels on map. I'm trying to figure out if the Leviathans are in a position where they need to play the early game. They're, they're certainly capable of playing it. One of the stronger points of this composition, but it's not as if the, these gods fall off come late game. LNF, Raijin, some of the best in class mages at level 20. Adapting skills very well on the Kamazots. Wrong you on Athena is, is, for my money, the best character in Smite still right now. I just really love what Athena brings to every single composition, especially in a Void of Warriors. That's not to say that we're in one right now, Amaterasu for SOT, but if we're talking blanket statement for the meta right now, Athena is just the one-stop shop for initiation, so global presence on top of that, just even further pushing her value, and then Panicat on the on her. Falls off a little bit compared to some of these other hunters, but still very strong. Still going to be a late-game hunter regardless, so... Do the Leviathans feel like they need to make something happen now? I don't I don't really think they do. I, I, I think they could play it a bit slower, but have opportunities to speed things up. Pagon, feared out, collapsed on by three, surrounded, won't live for very long. It's Shinta with first blood for the Leviathans. And comes off of wrong you hitting that level five mark, getting the access to that ultimate. And just an awareness from the two to dive in, but now it's Jump over towards Fine OK. Beads taken away from the Soul Laner as Panatom has made his presence known for the first time on the right side of the map. Keeps things interesting, but it's still first blood over to the Leviathans. Yeah, and adapting. Going to roll with that pressure, I think. Kill does go over towards Shinto, who's already getting the better end of that 1v1 matchup, but anytime that adapting picks up an assist or something like that or finds opportunities to steal camps afterward, he'll do exactly that. Green buff. Spawning and adapting. Already on the scene to take it away. It's going to be a little while, too. I mean, even going back to the previous match, Panatom on the Maman Rajit took a little while before he was really getting involved in the team fights. I'd argue a very low-impact game from him. Would like to see a little bit more at that 2-3 item power spike. You were even in the early. See if maybe he can burn away some of those relics like we, we, we had just seen up against Fine OK. Because adapting will start to really speed up his game now. Jotun's one-item power spike for Assassins is just one of the best feelings in Smite. Maybe biased as a jungler, but certainly capable of just throwing his weight around, taking those boxing matches, leveraging the self-sustaining kit from Vampiric Bats. With all that CDR, we'll have the safety of Bat out of Hell. Means that he can get aggressive just about anywhere, whereas Panatom needs to play a little bit more safely. Doesn't, doesn't exactly have the same escape routes, doesn't exactly have the same ability to just go in and get out. Which is also reflected in the builds. Relics, I should say. Beads for Panatom in that first slot. Whereas Adapting said, I don't really need that. Picks up the Blink, which has already boosted his aggressiveness. 
So that combo that we saw earlier of wrong you ulting the Kamazots, I mean, you can just blink in and make sure it hits every time. Yeah, Ding jumps away from the tornado from Pagon. Wrong you trying to ult out. Not enough damage from the Warriors to take down the Athena just yet. Starting to get some stacks on that Gauntlet of Thieves. Helps wrong you survive that one. And no ultimate usage from genetics. Means a little bit of a lack of burst to try and kill the support then. But an important cooldown take off because you look over at the first blood, and that's what really kind of kickstarts the game for the Leviathans. A 2v1 Sheesh. probably still could kill Pagon. But that third body showing up, that extra CC from Rongyu, really helps make the difference. Now knowing that's on another 80, 90 second cooldown, gives the Oni Warriors a little bit of time to breathe. It does. Oni Warriors now. Can start to get aggressive elsewhere on map and not worry about wrong you being there. Maybe you can go over towards the, the soul lane. Final K has been playing hyper aggressive over there. I mean, we just saw Dash on tower line. Not something you're used to seeing from Raijin up against a warrior, but such is the state of the world as of now. Could create some opportunities, though, for adapting. Could put some pressure over there. Panatom, of course, would love to make some of those rotations, too. I'm still keeping my eyes on Panatom. Want to see him do something on map. Has easier rotations this time around, too. Taunting SOT back. Swap between damage and CC because Adapting's on the way. Uh, Sot dashes out. Adapting that does have access it. to the ultimate. A couple of swipes from it should take down Sot. It'll be fine, okay, to get the last hit of the kill. Set up from him. Follow up damage from Adapting. Now nets two for the Leviathans. But not much of a lead coming from that one. Still sitting only about that 500 gold that you get from that initial bounty. And XP, dead even. Yeah, deja vu, isn't it? Just Leviathan's getting the better end of these early kills, but not quite able to solidify it into anything substantial. I think should have an easier time of it this time around, so long as they control some of those neutral objectives. And, and the ability to fight that the Leviathans have might just do it on their own. The composition existing as it is should limit the Oni Warriors and their ability to just roll through a Gold Fury. Plenty of burn potential on both sides. Maybe a bit more for the Oni Warriors, thanks to Maman Rajid and the Ganesh. So the Leviathans will still have to play aware of it, but I don't think there's going to be too many situations where the only Warriors are just going to do it in the face of the Leviathans like we saw in games one and two. So now what will we see the Warriors go for? Starting to group up around Gold Fury. Genex going to try and drop some wards down, but the Warriors have now picked up the objective. It's going to do it again. It's free. No one from the Leviathans around to try and stop this one. Adapting's on the way, but by the time he even gets in the jungle, it's already down. The Oni Warriors so quick on the trigger to take down these objectives. And the Leviathan's just caught unaware again. There was a ward there, but Oni Warriors just wait until a couple key backs and a couple players headed back to base. And they're able to pick up the objective with zero contest. The only thing the Leviathans needed to do to prevent that gold tree from going down is have one person nearby. Because Rongyu's got ultimate. He'll get there immediately regardless. And, and it's so early in the game that you should be able to chase out those kills anyway, but instead, nobody nearby, Oni Warriors take notice, immediately burn the objective, and, there, and there's nothing the Leviathans could have done. The, the double back in the duo lane, I think, essentially seals the fate of that fury. Heads up play from the Oni Warriors. Just as I said, they won't do it right in the face of the Leviathans, essentially do, do it on ward. Can't stop these guys, I suppose, but Leviathans do a good job throughout the early, and even with the gold fury going down, hasn't exactly not the, uh, the Warriors anything too big just yet. And I think it's that decisiveness and the confidence of the only Warriors so to pull that objective because a couple other teams, they might walk up, look around the jungle, see, okay, is anybody here? No, I don't see anybody. All right, let's fall back and kind of start it up, maybe slow burn. Only Warriors, they walk up. Genex drops a single ward and says, we're hitting the go button just like Final K. Top of SOT, taunting him and Panatom back. His adapting jumps on in. He's got ultimate. Will use it for one swipe to get the kill. And Wrong Yu shows up his backup. Dash taunt the tower. Gets beads from Panatom. But now Panatom's going to try and fight against three. And he's not winning that battle. It's a double kill for the king in the jungle. Genetics late to the party to show up. And the Leviathans can now collapse in on tier one. Man, Panatom really struggling on this Maman, though, isn't he? He just has not quite had. A good rotation in towards these fights. It's been a little bit too late. Gets unlucky there. I think that first shot from Taiko Drum on Final K was not intended for Panatom, but finds him anyway. And then the triple double taunt, just absolutely ridiculous. Gives so much time for the Leviathans to rotate through. And the classic Athena play of, I may be in the duo lane, but I'll be at the solo lane at a moment's notice. There once more, just pushing the numbers advantage even further in favor of the Leviathans. 
Knocks down the Tier 1 tower early, though, J-Mac. And that's going to make it easy now for SOT if he so chooses. And this is not this is not standard for SOT. No one will ever accuse him of, of playing, air quotes, lame. But if he so chooses to, could just freeze that wave at his own Tier 2 tower. Downside of that play is that it restricts his own rotations and makes it much easier for Final K to get involved on map. But might just be useful considering SOT is sitting two levels down or one and a half levels or so. Doesn't exactly want to take too many more boxing matches. Fight around the beacon. Three already there for Leviathans. A teleport in from behind by SOT. Now gets spotted out by Panda Cat. Pillar dropped down to try and zone away, but adapting versus four is not a fight that adapting can really take on his own. The rest of Leviathan still nearby. As Final K has rotated in, it's all 10 on this side of the map. Dash top out wrong, he doesn't come up with anything, and adapting is low on the side. Panatom lands the ultimate, but doesn't have any follow up beyond there. It's Panda Cat using his own ult in response to SOT. Oh, Final man. K with the Tyco drums drops Panatom and gets the first kill for the Leviathans. Maybe trying for a bit more. A greedy Thunder Crash not punished by the Warriors. The Leviathans up 5 and 0 can now go back cap this beacon and keep themselves this lead. Man, Panda Cat just hits so much of his ultimate there. Simplifies it for Final K, who just need to connect the one taunt to guarantee the damage ability and does exactly that. Panatom does a lot of work, but does that work on Adapting, who still had a bat out of hell, so just removes himself from the play field and says, even if someone were nearby, no one is, but even if they were, they're not going to be securing a kill onto me. Only Warriors, though. Classic MO. Grab themselves the Pyromancer. Nice little steal attempt from the Leviathans. Goes unrewarded. And those neutral objectives just keep them in the game. J-Mac, I mean, it's it's gross. This is, what, three times now where the Leviathans have just dominated the PvP early and, and have nothing to fall back to afterwards because the Oni Warriors have stripped the map. It's almost like your classic like MMO style of players. You've got the guys who like to jump in, just go around PKing all the time here with the Leviathans, and then you've got the raid squad of the Oni Warriors say, all right, we know what to do. We're going to go here. This is our play every single time. Don't stand in Very red circles. Very objective-minded. Avoid red circles. Don't be the dumb standing green. That's good for your team. Are they going to do and fire? Back over to fire giant. Wrong use here. I don't no, think the can't. only warriors go for it this time. The Leviathan's just going to get some ward coverage out. Taunt misses on the side, and he pulls the play of stand on top of the ward. Can't hit us both. It was keep that one alive while the rest of his team still keeps their vision control in the pit. Yeah, and Sentry Ward's in pocket. Still pretty decent for the Leviathan, so they could try and wrestle back control around the Fire Giant. But this early on, I mean, that was a crazy just heat check from both sides. Is anyone at the Fire Giant? Both teams answer yes, and both teams say, well, not exactly a great time to fight for it either. Genetics, really good ultimate there. You use the silence. Now Panda Cat collapsed on. There's four chasing down the on her, but he's able to jump out and sense a fear by Shinto to kick the fight back off for his team. Frenzy already used ultimate by Shinto. Gets a lot of damage and a bat out of hell to chase out Panatom. And now Adapting will be in the back line with three. It's a turn and burn back into genetics instead. In. Surrounded by five. Taunted in, impaled against the wall. And Adapting on a killing spree. The Leviathans for honestly what it feels like the first time in the last couple of games. They're the ones who get the chance to go for the objective and grab it for themselves. Yeah, Leviathans for the first time in three games find a kill, look around at the map and say, what can we do? Oh my god, a neutral objective. It's still up. Grab themselves a Fury and put themselves right back in that driver's seat. Love what we saw from Final K over the wall with the Thunder Crash and then uses the fear to just shove genetics into the entirety of his team. Adapting's target selection drops Panatom low. And I think Adapting realizes there, 0% chance I actually kill Maman Brigitte, very high chance I remove Panatom from this team fight entirely and does exactly that. Six around with the rest of the squad, secures himself. Yet another objective with the rest of the team. And the Leviathans now could likely just start to group up and knock down some of these tier one towers. I'd like to see them pressure mid, take a, take a play from the Oni Warriors book. Around that 16 minute mark, they were holding a similar lead. It was just group up, knock down these objectives. And when you have Athena on your team, even if you are just there to take down a tower, there is always a threat of, oh, I just found a stray taunt. Happens that uh, Panatom doesn't have beads, and, and it's a free kill and potentially a bit more afterward. Don't want to see the Leviathan slow down from here. So I'll be keeping my eyes on Rongyu. He's going to be the progenitor of the majority of the aggression here. Dash taunt, just such a simple tool. And in smite, simple is generally strong. So could be he starts fishing. One entire minute 
until Panatom gets those beads back and available. So it's a minute of power play potential for the Leviathans. Three level difference in soul lane means potential feast for Final K and adapting. SOT able to dash away before adapting shows up. So he'll be spared for the time being, but a three level difference in the soul lane, two in the jungle. Everywhere else, even on the map, it's been this right side for Leviathan that's been winning out. Has now netted them nearly a 4,000 gold lead. Close to about that 3k point for the time being. With Pyromancer still down for a few more seconds. Could see the Oni Warriors group up on that way. That's been their call this entire set. See who's on the map, who walks into the wrong side of the jungle. Take whatever neutral is left on the opposite end. Look at Panatom's build. Previously, it was third slot poly, and then Magi, it seems to me. Needs to get that Magi's a little bit faster this time around, so we'll go for it in third slot. But this build is not exactly strong just yet. Doom Warp, Spear of Desolation, on their own, very strong items. Maman Brigitte needs some sort of just percent pen. Like a Typhon's Fang would, would go a long way, or maybe a Spear of the Magus, but hasn't quite picked either of those up just yet. Levi's finally able to desync those neutral objectives themselves. Take the Pyromancer for themselves. Put the Runic Bomb in pocket of fine, okay. And, and all of a sudden, the only Warriors reeling, trying to figure out where can we draw our line in the sand? What, what's our opportunity to take a fight? Jungle Corridor team fights look pretty good with this composition. Tower defense, not awful either, but it's going to be a, a long time, I think, until the only Warriors are the ones actively seeking out engagements. It really feels like this game's almost similar to game number one in the support matchup, where game one, there's a Nox versus Athena. What does Athena want to do? Dash taunt, drop a silence puddle right in front of my feet. Can't do anything. Your taunts are mitigated. Feels like Genetics is trying to do something similar here this game with the Ganesh. Last couple of fights where Wrong Yu's tried to get to the back line, Genetics is there. Pops that ohm instantly, so Wrong Yu can't go for the taunt. And it's kind of forced Wrong Yu to, to kind of turn his attention elsewhere, but even in using that silence just for the taunt, Genetics hasn't really had it for the rest of the team fight that's ensued afterward. Has not, but does have the, the opportunity to say, okay, I'll use my taunt on the Athena and I'll throw my Dharmic Pillars behind, right? So I'll stop the rest of the team from moving forward. So there, there are ways and, and unique opportunities for Ganesh to deal with that Athena play. I, I think the primary issue the Oni Warriors are running into right now is that their backline divers are not enough of a threat to deal with the, the backline carries of the Leviathans. Panatom probably could close gap on, onto Morgan Le Fay, probably could find Panacat. Do you really want to do that, though? Because Chinto is nearly full build. And Panacat is just about full build and has got a little bit of crit, too. So even with Panatom getting back there, has been forced into Magi's third slot, so doesn't have the most damage output, doesn't have any life steal and build just yet, so survivability not the highest either. SOT could get into that back line, but two levels down on the Amaterasu, not exactly a massive threat there. Fire Giant pull for the Leviathans. The Oni Warriors are stepping up, wondering if there's going to be a full commit to it. Wrong Yu goes in, finds the taunt onto Genetics. He's pushing him around inside the pit. The Dharmic Pillars are used, and Genetics tries to get out, but he's being taunted back by Fine OK and slammed by damage from Shinto. The Fire Giant reset by the Leviathans, but being down one support on the Oni Warriors. Some of that steel potential may have been pulled away. SOT nearby. Pagan and Detroit on the way as well, but Panatons at half health. Sot goes in, and he's already half HP. Force out of the pit, but Wrong Yu gets caught in place as well. And the damage for Pagan and the Fire Giant's enough to take him down. It's a coin toss on fire. Warriors. And the only Warriors get it. Panatom to the back line to try and take down anyone on the Leviathans, but it's adapting instead, turning it right back around. Pagan dives in, but he's feared out. CC away. It's fine. Okay, crashes in. Shinto tries to make things happen. For his team, sought low, but the only ones falling have been the supports and the fire giant, which goes to the Warriors. I cannot believe adapting makes himself scarce there. Just passes by SOT in the middle of that fire giant fight, both low HP. And it's like ships in the night don't even get to see each other. But it's the only Warriors who walk up, find their first kill of the match, and also steal away the fire giant, securing it on all four. Only one not benefiting is genetics, but support with Fire Giant really only helps out in the sustain department. I'll tank up a few tower shots. I'll use the, the healing from Fire to be able to do it again a little bit later. So having all of your carries with it and a different tank, SOT, tankier, by the way, means that the ability of the Oni Warriors to start attempting some sieges 
still certainly there. Gold equalized a good deal too. Experience starting to matter less and less as the clock ticks onward. Knock down a few towers, and it's the only Warriors back in the driver's seat themselves. But I still haven't seen enough from the Oni Warriors in the true five-on-five -five engagement. I, I, I'm still struggling to see where they're going to win out on these team fights. This one, the most recent team fight, I think only goes the way of the Oni Warriors because Rongyu gets knocked up by Fire Giant twice and then is essentially killed by Fire Giant by walking through the Ring of Fire. If that's not the case, if you don't have that unofficial six-man helping you out, where do the Oni Warriors find that dive potential? I guess we'll have to find out. Group up by the Warriors towards Pyromancer. Leviathan's not as many here to try and defend. Darming Pillars used. Final K. Thunder Crash out. As Warriors grab Pyromancer a second time this game. Runic Bomb in pocket once more for Genetics and for SOT now. So with that 2,000 damage in play, it's still quite a few towers to go through. Warriors really just feeling like they're using this Fire Giant time to regroup regain some of the gold that they lost over the course of this game. Was sitting at four, nearly 5,000 up for Leviathans at one point now. Only made it down to a couple thousand between them. J-Mac, I, I have never once claimed to be a, an item smith. You know, there, there are people out there that are much better at, at building, making builds than I am. I'll, right. I'll be completely honest. Usually whatever, like, Panatom's doing, I'm just copying. Or whatever Shinto's building, I'll just copy. But I'm looking at Panatom's build, and I'm thinking to myself, is, is this really the best we could see from Amon Brigitte? I feel like Spear of the Magus is so core on that god. Just standard percent pen, things like Typhon's Fang, so core. That you'd really like to have at least one of them. And instead it's this Polynomicon again. And I understand that, you know, auto cancels are there. You could do the stun, it's a big burst auto attack. But we're not really seeing a lot of that. I, I, I've yet to see Panatom connect that Polynomicon in two games on this Maman Brigitte. It's more so a poke-based god, and I just don't think he has it. Pillars used by Genetic. It's a 1v1 in the back line for the junglers, but Shinto is going to show up and ruin that 1v1 and give an opportunity over for himself to get the kill. But now in the left side of the fight, it's one down. Pagon takes out fine, okay. And Genetics is on thin health bars, but he's taken out by adapting. Jump in by Panacan. Netroid's low, and Netroid's gone. Pagon has to go for another 1v3. He won the last game, but he's not winning it this game. Adapting shuts him down and grabs the double kill. Leviathans get four. But all the while, SOT going to go for a bit of a split push. Right side Phoenix for him with the help of his Rudic Bomb. It's a low-value Phoenix, but it's the best I think the Oni Warriors could have hoped for. And now, should the Oni Warriors win out on an engagement, have got a win condition on map to just walk down that Titan. Still three towers standing, though, for the Leviathans. Means that they're going to be dealing with a very tanky Titan if that opportunity should arise. That, that, that exchange we saw in the jungle, though, was my concern for this late-game matchup. Adapting is just going to have much faster damage onto Panatom, and... Panatom's safety does not work against Kamazots. Kamazots has a leap as well as Bat Out of Hell to chase down. If you're worried about Maman, Brigitte, Ultimate, both of those abilities I just listed for Kamazots also just immune that Ultimate. So lots of opportunities now for Adapting to just spend his entire game hunting down Panatom and, and making it miserable. And also Adapting's got sustained advantage. So Rated Edge Lifesteal on auto attacks, plus passive, plus Vampiric Bats, means that if you are playing the poke battle, Especially because Panatom has not gone to poke items. Adapting wins that one too. He can just sit max range, throw a screech out every six seconds and and win by death of a thousand cuts. Panatom's gotta find some sort of answer on this Maman. Gotta find some way to have an impact in these team fights. And I think the really the main thing he should be doing is jumping onto Shinto and trading his life. Go for one for one trades. Back to fire for Leviathans, teleport by Sot. Gets him back to the fray, but it's adapting and Panatom in mid and adapting, winning that 1v1. Taunt onto SOT, pulls him into the ring of fire, which fire still at half health. Wrong you tanking this one up, avoids a knock up this time. It's fine, okay. Thunder crashes in, gets caught up on a Dharmic Pillar. Asad tries to steal this fire giant away. It goes to the Leviathans this time. Asad dashes out, but Pagon low, and Pagon CC down. Panacat catches the leap with his own, and it's fine, okay, with the first kill. Swipe in from adapting in the screech after will take one down. Shito credit for the kill, but genetics low. Genetics slowed down and nowhere to go. Tries for the runic bomb, but it's a double for fine. Three kills for the Leviathans and maybe a bit more as Netroid 
has to try and bail out through the jungle, and Final K can keep him busy. It might just be Panatom alone to try and defend the Phoenix. Pa Final K might just keep them both busy if he needs to. Could. There's a back channel now from Netroid. Panatom has to win this 1v1. Will slowly work through fine, okay, but it is slow. Throws out the ultimate, won't have it for defense. Four versus one at the Titan as Netroid have the damage. Jump in by Panacat, a lot of damage ringing through. Pushed them back into the Hit fountain. The Titan. But now Final K's got to come back. Titan's at half HP as Panatom jags into Panacat. The Titan has got to go down, and Final K's got a full commit with the ult. Netroid gets one, he gets two, but he doesn't save the Titan. The Leviathans take it in 27. And the Leviathans look good in the Fire Giant pit themselves. It was essentially a four versus three because Adapting was hunting down Panatom the entire time. By the time the Fire Giant was down to 50%, Panatom was attempting to channel backs. There was no way afterward to prevent Adapting from just going around the backside of that team fight and corralling the rest of the Warriors towards his team. I mean, that that's just clean stuff. It's really nice. But I, I got to think things could have been just a little bit different if that Maman Brigitte's in any other role. And that's the first time you'll hear me call for that. I mean, you've been the, the primary you know, caller for, the jungle, for jungle Maman, but in Panatom's hands, and even in the game that they won, it wasn't really necessarily off of, the, off the back of Panatom. He was just sitting there, get a little bit of damage here and there, but wasn't really the carry that we have seen potential from this god just yet. No, I, I think get Panatom onto something he's, he's more comfortable on because that Maman Brigitte is just not working out for him. Maybe you have to dedicate a pick towards him on to essentially just to ban it away from your enemies, but put it in a different role. We know it can work elsewhere. We'll have to see what adaptations get made for the Oni Warriors in game number four. It's the Leviathans now up 2-1, one game away from going to the SWC. Can they close it out? We'll find out in game four.
Less than two months away 
from the Smite World Championships in Arlington, Texas. Come join us. Have some fun. Bring the hype, man. There's so much going on in January. We've got the group stages. We've got Worlds right after. Even if you can't come join us in person, make sure to check us out on twitch.tv slash smitegame, youtube.com slash smitepro. Anywhere where you can find Smite Esports, you can find the Smite World Championship. Less than two months away. And that's what these teams right here are fighting for game number three and the Atlantis Leviathans put themselves on match point here up against the Oni Warriors take a dominant look at this one I'm not sure maybe maybe I spoke too soon dominant's a little bit too harsh yeah. of, of, of a word definitely continuing to keep it close but Leviathans they they pick a composition that maybe gets them a little bit closer to parity with fighting in that early game and I think they, they look a little bit cleaner here in game three uh, I think that's for sure. They started picking stuff that could actually contest the early portion of the game. I think this on her looked fantastic with Panda Cat. They were able to play around that lane. I think they have to be more wary of objectives in the early portion of this game. Because this game should have been a much larger lead for the Levi's, but the Warriors are able to sneak these objectives and kind of keep that gold lead close. And I think that's what you're talking about. This game was a little bit closer than kind of expected because of that. But, I mean, Maman, as you told me, just got her first loss now. And... Maybe something to do with this Kamazots matchup. It seems like, I mean, Miff talks about it a little bit. We talked about it a little bit uh, on the desk last game, but not a matchup that she can really win. It's not something where she can get enough of her ticks off, enough of her passive proc to actually do damage to Kamazots before he can actually burst her. So maybe something to look forward to for the rest of this set and the rest of this weekend. Will Maman still be prioritized as much as she was? Is there going to be a counter, you know, pick here with this Kamazots? Interesting to see, especially going into this game for P's and B soon. Yeah, I mean, want to be clear, what wasn't Maman's first loss ever. Oh. Just, you know, just in, in this set. We saw the Jade Dragon. True. We lose with it in the last set. But, I mean, still a, a powerful pick. I'm looking at more more on adapting. Like, M Maman's a great pick, I, I think, does a lot for Panatom. But adapting, I mean, and this is to be expected come around Worlds time, once we start talking about SWC, you would expect nothing less than, than the King to start popping off a little bit. 5, 1, and 7 on this Kamazots, just pretty much being the facilitator, being, being the, I've said this a bunch today, being the driver, right, of this team and trying to, to make those plays happen, especially, you know, you pair that with the sort of early to mid game focus of this composition and the 1v1 potential on the Maman. I mean, this is a, a adapting show a little bit, especially into that newer jungler that we're still trying to see teams work out how to play against. Yeah, I think adapting is a great player to highlight. I mean, even going back to last set yesterday, uh, adapting again was, as you said, the driving force. He was the driving force in this game. And a lot of the plays that the Levi's opted to make were usually around adapting either doing something or adapting cleaning up the fight. So that's something we kind of got to keep our eye on going into game four. Hopping into P's and B's, Oni Warriors taking first pick. So far, I think it's 3-0 for the first side. Or first pick side is now 3-0 in this set. I think Oni Warriors started first pick in game one, but that was also like Oni Warriors got the EFG and then the Levi's won on, on one fight. But I think they did start the, the set in the first pick position. Regardless, I, I mean, both of these teams, when they have had the choice, they've gone back to this first pick slot. We've seen Athena yes. picked here. We've seen... Uh, did we see Chernabog? No, I think it was just the supports, right? We've seen Athena now pick twice in that top slot, and then when it was banned in, in game number two, we did not see that, and we saw a, a different pick instead. My memory is completely failing me. Luckily, I don't need memory to watch the picks and mans happening right now in front of me, where the Atlantis Leviathans, they do decide to switch things up. Instead of taking that Uller off the table in that second banned slot, they take away the Athena in the Kepri instead. And you were correct, it was Athena. Two first picks, the other one was the Maman in game two, ah. which is uh, the, the one game the Warriors have actually won so far was with that Maman. Now going into the last ban for the Warriors here, still a bunch of high prio picks available. We talked about this a lot today. There is a wide variety of high tier characters currently, a bunch of mage solos, both of the supports, and then beyond that, Chernobog is also another one, and Chernobog catching a ban here. Leaves open, Baba, Yamoja, not the Opwash, the Ryzen, MLF, a bunch of characters to go to. And then last but not least, can't forget the Maman, another available pick. Levi's with one more ban available. Kind of taking a little bit of time thinking it over, trying to figure out what they want to do with this. Because if they take home this one, this is their ticket to Worlds right here. 
Yeah, on match point and want to join not only their ticket to Worlds, but guaranteed top two seats, right? They're going to be whoever, if the Leviathans take it down here, if the Oni Warriors push it to five and then take it down, whoever wins this set is going to be playing up against the Styx Ferryman to guarantee either number one seed or number two seed for that World Championships. With that last ban, Leviathans go back to the Uller, continue to take it away. Don't want Solar Troll or Pagon to have that pick, both signatures for them. And will allow the Oni Warriors to go back to the Maman. So now they've had this Maman three games in a row. One win, one loss on it, but not really unhappy with its performance. Last game, they choose to go back to it. Yeah, no real surprise. I, I think it, it felt more like a comp problem than a Maman problem. So I I'm fine going back to this. Curious to see if it goes back to Panatom, if they do try it in that mid lane like most oh, other teams are oh. doing. But before we get that question answered, the Levi's locking in the Ryzen, hovering the on her. I really like this top two by the Levi's. It doesn't really show anything in their P's and B's. Yes, it shows that they want to play through duo. But I mean, that's just on her in general. On her wants to play through duo. Well, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised by it because there's no Yamoja. The, the, the Yamoja prize just fallen all the way down in these P's and B's. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, not banned away, not picked. I mean, we saw it a huge priority even early on in this set in game number one, but gone by the wayside. Oni Warriors, they had the opportunity to pick it in game number three. Chose not to, went to the Ganesh instead. So we'll see if anybody wants to grab that support pick here. Just now, though, looking towards the Izanami, which is an interesting prior pick, but, I mean, you are really prioritizing, it seems like, comfort a bit for these players. You get the on her in the hands of Panicat. He's feeling good about it. You get Izanami back in that pressure, the hands of Netroid, and back to, to vibes of game one. This East Shell played by Solar Patrol. Have to assume it's going back to the solo lane again. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good assumption to have. I think with how comfortable he looked on it also, it makes sense to bring it back over there. But uh, I mean, again, Yamoja falling down even farther. Is it even going to be picked here? I think... Finally, it seems like Yamoja with that Fae Blessed uh, nerf, and now no longer can she just spam her two and spam right. the Fae Blessed. It now feels like there's some semblance of counterplay to her at most points in the game. Early game, she's really relying on Omi. She can't really spam abilities. And then late game, Onk. Onk is a really big counter into her F Phantom Shell. There's a few options you actually have. And also, with locking in a lot of these characters that o the Warriors are going for, they're looking for stuff that can kind of match the lanes the Levi's already have. E Shell to match the Ryshin. Izanami is one of the few hunters in the game that can actually match this on her. But to pair with that on her, this Aphrodite, which is, this is the Dragon's two picks right here. This is Afro on her, play to dominate this duo lane. And we've seen so many pre level five kills over in duo with just these two gods. I mean, if I took away the team name at the top, I think I would guess that this is a true dragon Very strap. True. They like the Raichin solo as well. You mentioned the on her, not a huge fan of being left alone. Well, if you've got the Aphrodite fighting with you in duo lane up until that 10, 15 minute mark, you don't really have to deal with that problem. You get the Afro link and you're able to, to fight in that 2v2. Bands come out here though, second phase, Yamoja and Sobek taken away. Interesting that the Leviathan's not really worried about this Ganesh pick that Genetics has gone to these last two games. So that they'll be still up on the board if the Warriors want to go to it. But key point for me, they ban away that Kamazots on the side of the Warriors. So they're not going to have to deal with that 1v1 in the jungle. Yeah, it seems like they're almost pushing genetics towards that that Ganesh pick again. And then also, yeah, Kamazot's not available here for for adapting. Not a ton of not a ton of jungle bands. He's still got the Ratatasker available, the Awilix, those are the other two gods that he goes for. And they still have to look for their jungle pick here, or their sorry, mid pick here, assuming the Ryzen goes to solo lane. So a couple of available picks. Maybe they opt to keep this Ryzen flex. They pick Adapting's jungle here, or they could just go the other way, where they lock in. I, I guess some semblance of flex potential with this Ama. I, I think we have to lean solo because we've not seen Adapting play this yet. We kind of have to get proven to that jungles will play this Ama. But seems like they want to hold this last pick for Adapting in that last 10 spot. Yeah, adapting more of a traditional jungle player, of course, will go back to those assassins. So I would be a little bit surprised if we saw this Amaterasu yeah. head over there. 
think that seals Raijin perhaps towards this this mid lane role, which we saw him in a little bit earlier today. Definitely had a, a decent performance when we saw him there. But this leaves the question up of the Oni Warriors' last two picks. And we'll have to answer the question here whether or not they want to keep the Maman in the jungle or if they want to push this Maman towards that middle lane. Looks like they will decide to keep it in the jungle, assuming this team act gets locked in, and it will, but that's not nearly the most exciting thing that happened in the last 10 seconds. I'm, there's a tier lock in on the other side, Bobby. And they have truly no normal support available here. So either we're having tier support or e shell support. And if you've watched in that extreme- Or Maman support. No, we gotta, we gotta put that one away. <laughs> we're, we're done with that one, Frog. Okay, no Maman support. With support, if you've watched it at extremes, you see he actually plays both e shell and tier a lot in his queues, and he likes playing both of them. And then you look at the opposite side, both Solo also loves both e shell and tier, so some flex potential there. And then last pick for the Levi's going for this Mercury. No Willix, no Rat, does not matter. Late game, Mercury, Afro together is so scary, so much one shot potential, survivability for this Mercury, and burn potential on objectives. These drafts have, have rounded out. These last couple of picks are, are interesting to say the least and on a deciding game here. The Warriors, I mean, if they lose this game, it's not they're not knocked out, right? They got yeah. another chance tomorrow. But I mean, if they lose this game, they don't like they, they that's it's all on the line right now for today. It's all on the line to push us to a game five to get to worlds. And it's either tier or e shell support that I mean, it is, a, it is a hill to die on. And for as much as we can say, we were questioning the Oni Warriors' play style back at the beginning of the phase when Pagon was locking in Pele mid. And how did that go for him? I recall it going pretty well for him. And, you know, like if they stick to their guns, they stick to their comfort. You, you got to have faith in this team. That's what they're feeling right now, I think. I mean, also, if this is what they feel the meta is and they just kind of felt like they played last game incorrectly or they did not play it as well as they expected to, this is like the meta that they've kind of composed after the first three games and going into this fourth one. And I, I mean, other than whatever their support is, I think the rest of the picks make a ton of sense for the Warriors. Sure. They want to play through duo, play some pressure over there. Pegon's team at was fantastic, even though they lost last game in the game before. He was kind of the reason that they won that final fight. I, I think my question mark kind of goes to Panatom. So far, he's one and one on it. But has he looked like a, you know, top player like he usually does. I think he looks worse on this Maman than he does on most of his other picks, which is a, a, a little crazy. I think he's just trying to get more comfortable on the character. And a lot of times it comes down to, he's kind of just getting counterpicked. Is this a winnable 1v1 late game Mercury into Maman? That is a lot of burst potential that Mercury has. Miff said it on cast that Maman has really good matchups when she can kind of play around not getting one shot. Kama has one-shot potential. Mercury has probably the most one-shot potential in the game. So is there a risk there with this Maman into Mercury matchup? Yeah, I mean, you you have the the huge amounts of burst damage. It's going to come on a line a little bit later, though, right? Have to remember that. And that scaling was maybe what caught the Leviathans out in game number two. They're looking to close it out here in game number four. Leviathans win one and go to World Zoni, trying to push us to a game five. We'll throw it to the casters. Our Leviathans go to Worlds on the Oni Warriors going to game five. We find out here as we jump in to game number four. Thank you so much, Frog, and inbound on the desk. It's J Mac Mifflin and Doug back here in game four. As we have genetics going to the tier support. Sop played the E-Shell earlier on. Worked out fairly well for the team up until the very end of that game. Going back to a once more the amount of healing, the sustained utility that he provided to not only himself but his team really kept that one going. But the tier support, I think we've seen Genetics pull this out once before. Did all right, wasn't something insane from him. But how do you feel about it in this set in particular, Miff? Well... It's good into Mercury and Amaterasu. It's going to be easy to line up Fearless for Peel. Uh, whether or not he's going to be able to deliver Shinto or Panda Cat to his back line, I think probably pretty unlikely come team fight time. Should Genetics get a strong early game lead? Oh, God. Oh. Should he get a strong early game lead? I think there's potential for him to absolutely snowball the map. 
And I'm getting out. Do, do your thing, J-Mac. I have seen him do this before on a video, and he's now going to do allowed? it in a pro game. An invade of the blue Whoop. buff, not stolen away. 2 HP. But does at least delay the jungle farm of his team a little bit. Hurt Panatom not a lot. insanely. Panatom going to be slowed down on his farm. We'll get to the rev up in time. I've watched him do it before on stream. I did not think that Final K would try and pull in an SPL match. Isn't successful on the steal, but... Just keeps that fear in now. Stop his own blue away. It's the karma coming right back to him. Yeah, don't uh, don't do that to SOT, I guess. Fine, okay. Maybe the biggest loser now on, on that trade. Panatom, of course, misses out on a good deal of that blue XP, but doesn't seem to matter if Fine, okay loses out on all of it. Does at least have teleport, so even if he's going to get bullied... Uh, why did I say if? So even when he gets bullied over, over the next few minutes... We'll be able to get back to lane pretty quickly. Should be able to prevent himself from losing out on too much of that farm. Unless SOT does this. I mean, just just Good don't Lord. let him farm. Fine, okay. How much can he even get? I think he got maybe the smalls. I think he got uh, one small on one, Sot. And then I don't believe he got any of his own. Because I think Sot was able to steal those. So he has gotten likely one, if not two creeps of XP so far. And right. he's got a few archers this time. Four of them. But uh, he's level one to SOT's level three. Root set up. Gets nice damage, but adapting is recognized. And Fido needs a bit of a bailout. Missed the dash. Walking up just a punch for punch if possible. But Sock can stand his ground. He's level three. What's Fido okay going to do? Especially when it's about to be two level threes on this side. Oh, Root no. knock up damages there. Sock doesn't even need the help from Panatom. 2v1 is all SOT. And now Fido okay doesn't have teleport to get back. Is still level one. SOT's going to shove another wave in the tower. The minions that Fido K got while adapting were there got two split. Yeah, man. Uh, Fido K's game is chalked. It's chalked. It's over. I mean, <laughs> he's not making a comeback in the lane. There, it's a three-level deficit already. One more, and Fido K is worth nothing. That's so harsh to think about that this early in the game that Fido, a kill on Fido K would legitimately mean nothing at this point. Is he going to hit two Does off that arch? Two? No, it doesn't even hit two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah, he's close. Solar Troll. One minion. Level four. 2,000 damage already this early in the game. And Final K struggling to get any farm. This time will be allowed by the good graces of Sot because he had to go back and get his own blue buff again. Yeah, work on that, We'll be K. able to uh, clear out minions, though. It's going to take Fino a while. I think now the immediate response is, what does the rest of the team do around that? Adapting steals away a back harpy camp. But he's going to need more than that to try and help alleviate some of that pressure and try and build back some of that lead the Warriors have established. Yeah, I'm thinking Fine OK is a lost cause. Let him sink on the right side of the map on his own. Maybe SOT gets a little bit overzealous on rotations, and that's your way back in. Because Fine OK is not fighting back in anytime soon. The only reason I would imagine adapting comes back over to the soul lane is if he thinks he can solo SOT. That, that's because because you're not getting help from the Amaterasu. It's just not going to happen. That is a very rough start. Adaptic can just play other places, though. I mean, rotations over towards Izanami could go pretty well. Locking down a Tiamat, not exactly the easiest thing. Quadrupedal stance, CC immunity, plus having beads means that really Sonic Boom is going to struggle to find value. Yeah, just anywhere but solos where I want to see Adapting. Fine, okay, doesn't even get his next rotation of blue. That one stole by Panatom earlier. And now I see Panatom rotating to the left side of the map. Level five for the Maman. Genetic still at four, just hits five. So extra CC afforded to him now. Through his stance switch into the blue for ultimate. But Fine, okay, gets his dash block. Knockout missed by Sam. The rest of the damage there. He's got ult, but he needs a few extra ticks of it. And he's got the shots for those. But it's a Sonic Boom by a dash. Get the beads. From SOT, does SOT have any cooldowns to help him out? He's trying to juke around, adapt him, but adapting. He's got the hits. The knockout's not going to save him. Will the minion wave do so? Sot trying to get any farm, but he's got nothing left. The root will slow down adapting, but it's still a kill for the king to try and bring things back on the right side. Talk about trigger discipline from adapting. Any other jungler on the planet just clears that wave. Fine, OK needs it desperately. Great rotation, good trade. That's worthwhile, even losing Fine, OK again. Knocking down SOT so significant. And Final K might be able to tick over to level 5 pretty soon. 
catching up and build, though, I don't think going to happen anytime soon either. Yeah, Wave, Wave should just about do it for him. So survivability going to be there soon, especially once he finishes up that first item. He'll be out of the, out of the fire, the proverbial fire, if you would. But catching back up, finding parity. Yeah, I'm not sure that's in the cards. Yes. Final K proc to five with the last minion of that wave. SOT hits seven with the first minion of the wave. So still that full two level difference between them. And even Janax is going to get a piece of the action on the right side. So he's rotating through enemy jungle. Adapting still no old, used it earlier. Final K is just going to get bullied once more. Now with Panatom showing up. Final K's got ultimate to bail himself out. We'll land the sun on the sot. As Genetics ooh, pushes two ooh, through the jungle. Ooh. But the double knock up once more. An extra push after that. Forces Shinto to separate from the fight. And an ultimate in catches wrong. You gets the undying level away. A Panatom still just going to chip away at their health with that party trick. And yeah, Shinto is going to confirm that speed buff, prevent any further aggression from the Oni Warriors. He steals it. Yeah, that's, that's just Genetics. Takes it away. Panatom shows up. Sonic Boom being channeled for the time. Meanwhile, Final K dying under Tier 1 tower. And even beyond there, Sots chased him out of Tier 1. Has now forced him all the way to Tier 2 tower at this point. Still that three-level deficit. He should be Final dead K for this. Hit six. Sot has to die. Sot is between two towers. No minion way to back him up. Genetics, Genetics is here. there. And oh, now with man. Panatom, Sot might just get out of this. Final K teleported back in. SOT goes for a little bit of damage, but he's low on mana himself. Oh my Which god. It's another push. This time on final K, Great End's gonna get some good heals and a little bit of damage to the rest of the team. But Sot, not punished one bit. Even with a sonic boom from adapting, it only clips SOT in the knockup from Sot in response. Panatom dives on top of Shinto with some big damage. But even in the backside, adapting's trying to kill Sot all by himself while the rest of his team's getting ran at. Shinto goes down to Panatom and Genetics who are pushing 2v3 and now it's a like 3 versus 3 once again. Yeah, this bleed out on the right side of the map has really extended. Fine, okay. His struggles have gone global, I suppose. Call him Mr. Worldwide because there's a 3,000 gold deficit that starts at minute zero in the solo lane. That is tough stuff. SOT's walking between towers on Ixgel. The rest of the only warriors say, well, I want to play where the where the Eaton's good, and that's over here. So Fine OK has not found his bailout just yet either. And had to delay his build a bit. Goes for round shield second slot. Doesn't finish up his magic defense. So SOT still has solo potential. Yeah, things are they're getting real ugly. And it is worth noting that Panatom Finally on the board on this Maman Rajit. Gets a little bit of action going early on. Also burns through the Relic of Shinto. Aegis off the board for the next two minutes. So further rotations might just hit pay dirt. The, the silver lining for the Leviathans is that there is nothing to do on the right side of the map. You know, Final K could die five more times in two more minutes. And, and there's just not, you're not going to do Fire Giant. Pyromancer's not there yet. Wrong you slowed down. Beads used early. Undying Love still available to get away from Genetics, but there's still so much more damage that you have to deal with. Detroit gets one, and Panacat stands by as that playstyle now moves from the right side over to the left side of the map. And the suffering that only Final Cade incurred has moved to dual lane. Highlight there for Pagon, or I guess for the Leviathans against Pagon. They get his beads, but it's two levels in mid. Dueling can't even farm up their own purple buff. Red buffs being stolen. Yeah, the, the trickle down economics is not working well so far. Leviathans are losing out everywhere. I mean, only one who's not suffering is Netroid. Two levels up on Panda Cat. Uh, Izanami pressure looks pretty good. But are they willing? Oh, excuse me. No, Net Panda Cat's two levels down. I got it so yeah. twisted in my brain. Sorry, I'm just so desperate to find something that's working for the Leviathans. Hold on. Netroid's going back. He's not there anymore, Panda. Do something. No, something, something's got to be good. Daphne's got Rage, no stacks. Okay, hold on. Shinto stacking Book of Thoth. Found it. That's a good power spike once that one gets fully stacked up. Oh, it's not stacked up, though. But it's not yet. It's at 52 stacks. So he's well, on the way. Oh, he's two levels down, though, too. Adapting's got a kill. There, there's, our, there's our good so far. So Adapting's oh, got one. Okay. Still 4,000 gold, 5k XP. But getting that first kill on adapting slowed it down a bit because it was getting really out of hand right side. Still a bit out of hand, but 
No, Maybe not I, as much as it could have been. We're trying too hard, man. No, nothing's going good because even adapting is like behind. Right. Right. So for the Leviathans, then <laughs> I, I, I pose the question: <laughs> What in the world do they do? They, they've lost just about everything on the map. They're losing a tier one at ten minutes. What do the Leviathans do to not lose out in the next 10 minutes at this pace? And, and if you figure it out, you let me know. Oh, I uh, was asking you, hoping you yeah, would know. Yeah, I mean, look, fixing the Leviathans' game position from here is like Gordon Ramsay on Kitchen Nightmares, man. Like, I, I, I'm not qualified to find the answer. It's slow down the game. It's prevent Gold Fury for sure. That's step one. Well, Gold Fury stopped. Four Leviathans versus three. Pagon on the way will even things out for the Warriors. Maybe try and go for the pull once more. Genetics does have blink if he can find a target out of position. Bead still down for Rong Yu for 15 more seconds, but their only safe haven now is a Tier 2 tower because of the Tier 1 that got knocked out. They can't even get their own jungle at this point for Leviathans. Panda spotted out Genetics, who wants to go for a blink play, maybe go for an ultimate. But trigger discipline on the support of the Warriors. Means that for now, it will just be a purple invade. Just a purple invade, but can become a bit more of an issue as the game develops. I mean, push out a wave. You can force the Leviathans into Tier 2 and Duo, fall back towards that Gold Fury. Burn potential not exactly there unless Panatom is there, though. Panatom's hit his power spikes very quickly, by the way. The Spear of Desolation already finished up. I'm thinking Oni Warriors just do whatever you want on map. 6k at 12 is just insane. I mean, I just looked up and we're 11 minutes in. The entire chess camp was a five-star meal for the Leviathans that half of it got gobbled up by Genetics as he walks through and Greeley takes those chests away. Yeah, little stimmy chests. Keeps the Leviathans down. Ward thrown around the Gold Fury. And that's about as far up as Panda Cat and Wrong You are allowed to play. It is the what existed of a Tier 1 tower before because it is just Ward control and pressure across the map to make sure. Whoa. Okay, there's the silver lining. Saw doesn't have beads now. Right. Who's going to kill him? Uh, may, it's got to be adapting. Maybe adapting finishes this crit item, just sends it right down right. So adapting finishes Deathbringer, lands four crits in a row, and Final K has to do something as well. And maybe you knock down SOT. Here's the thing, though. Sot's got to double dip on defense against a warrior. That breastplate of valor feels pretty good. And against crit adapting, going to feel pretty good as well. Only warriors. Could just pick up the pace. I'm surprised to see them not just grouped on Gold Fury. Legitimately, it is very surprising. They, they, they haven't forced a fight there. Haven't at least tried to pull it at least once or twice. I mean, they've got so much burn on the Warriors that if the Leviathans don't show up, that objective goes down just about immediately. And they've got such an advantage thanks to resources that if the Leviathans show up, that's also good for you. Blink to wrong you, gets beads away from him, still has undying love. We'll head back over to Panic Hat. That's just the ultimate. Just from the push on genetics against the wall. Because Nitro and Panatom have really just pitched the tent over in the left side jungle. Not very much room for wrong you and Panic Hat to breathe. Meanwhile, Leviathan's trying to go for a pirate. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa, hold on. Four levels up for Pagon. That's got to be illegal for how much damage he just did to Rip. adapting. Shinto dead. By the way, four levels up for Pagon. We've been talking about everywhere else on the map, and Pagon is level 15? Well, he's four levels up on adapting. Right. He's only two levels on Shinto, which is still not good. Caught three now as he takes the 16. Stole Pyromancer, by the way. That yeah. went to the Warriors. That's the closest, by the way, is now three levels. Everybody else is four or more levels down to him. And I, I, I want to get ahead of it because the only Warriors have done this themselves in the past where they just dominate everywhere on map and they've got leads like this. The Warriors did not win this early game. Final K lost it. Like, let's get it 100% clear. That was all self-inflicted pain for the Leviathans. That was an attempted invade that failed, and then a blue buff stolen. SOT level 2, and then a death on a Final K. Fury. No, it was forced goes back to, to base on first wave, then death on second wave. Yeah, and teleport expended on that force back. Now still three levels down to Sot. We can essentially just play with this food at this point. Two level difference only between the solo laners, but the difference everywhere else is starting to add up because it's not just two in one lane. It's two or more in every single role, so much so that Panatom's comfortable dashing up against well, Final K. Be big. A kill here would be a great turn back okay. for Leviathans. One for Shinto. 
to shut down Panatom. Look at that Get dent in the charts, J Mac. That's a little. That's a nice little bump there. They're so back. It's Jover for the Warriors. Uh, no. I think the Warriors could just wait for Panatom respawn and go pull Fire Giant. They're that ahead. They could just do it right now if they can get enough out of Wrong Yu. Use the Undying Love. Genetic trying to close gap, but could back off. Pull something down. Knock up is going to hit Wrong Yu, and he's going right. to get pushed against the wall by Genetics and shoved in the locker. It's six kills, and only six kills, surprisingly, for the Oni Warriors. But the lead they have accumulated with those six has been immeasurable. And the Leviathans, they, they found their one answer. They got their one kill. But it was against Panatom, who is weird to say might be the least valuable target for them to kill right now. I mean, it, it's somebody. Killing the jungler is always pretty good, but I don't think Panatom's the reason the Warriors are winning right now. If you want to address any issues, it's got to be SOT. No, it's got to be Pagon. It's, it, Pagon is the looming threat that, that has gone quietly through the night here. Level 17 on this Tiamat has Runic Bomb in pocket, still maintaining both relics. Someone's got to do something about that. And here's the thing. I'm thinking, like, even ideal scenarios, it, it would be real difficult. Five-man dive on a Pagon. Pagon might win that fight. Fino knows the Fire Giant's happening. Can the rest of the team even get there in time? Fino K, turn and burn from Panatom and Solar or Troll. Do we see the Leviathan's answer back? Adapting does have ultimate. Can charge this one up? The Fire Giant's not done just yet. The Leviathan's could make a path in, but they're just going to give this one up instead. It's the tier one tower for adapting, but he can't even get that one. It's the Warriors with Fire Giant, and Leviathans have got to turn tail and run. They've got no legs to stand on. they got Panda Cat with a tier one tower, but the Warriors can just collapse in and make sure that that's all that they're going to get from it, and maybe oh, not even no. that. Back stopped on Panda Cat. Oh, from Panatom, a dash in avoids the entirety of Panda's ultimate. And Panatom picks up the kill, 2-1-4 and four now for the Mamon. Yeah, I bet Panacast thinking to himself, guys, uh, look, I know that you can't continue pushing mid. Please do not lead them to my side of the map. And that's exactly what happens, adapting. Retreats to the lower side of left jungle. And, and it's so simple for Panatom to say, you know, I'm probably not going to catch adapting. But here's the thing, Panacast on my tier 2. I'm just going to go ahead and grab him and does so very easily. Fire Giant on all five, massive gold lead, massive experience lead. Relics in a good position as well. Only 10 seconds left on Panatom's beads. I'm thinking tier two tower is just going to fall down here. Genetics stops some backs. Keep it even simpler for his team. Doesn't stop wrong you, but keeps adapting from heading back the fast way. Said adapting going to try and steal some jungle. Dash does. Helps secure blue for adapting, but he's only a level up against Genetics, who has already bought spectral armor to deal with the crit that adapting has picked up. Double dipping into it with the rage and the deathbringer. I Means Genetics is going to have a field day with that second item of his. Yeah, I mean, this is this is long shot odds, J-Mac. It, it is a very rough position. Oni Warriors, if they're playing slow, Pyromancer, Oni Fury, back to base, spend gold, group up, knock down tier two tower on right. If they're playing fast, just go force a fight anywhere on map. I'm thinking every individual member of the Warriors wins their, their 1v1. Genetics might just be winning 1v1s against carries as well. Yeah, I mean, look at that damage. Panatom and another 1v1 against Panda Cats winning that one. Adapting shows up with a sonic boom. Can Panatom turn this one around himself? A couple of crits from Adapting would really help out. Panatom does go down. So a nice kill for Adapting to shut down the jungler that just picked up two more. But they're going to need a little bit more than that because tier two in mid knocked away by Sot and Pagon. Fine, okay, pops the Frenzy to try and deal with his own Tier 2 tower, trying to get himself back in the game, but Leviathan's still down 10,000 gold. I can't believe Panatom said, yeah, I'll just auto-attack adapting. I think if he just like walks in a straight line and waits for his first ability to come back up, he might have been able to turn that around instead. Adapting gets to leverage some of that crit and puts his first stack on Rage. Significant, significant power spike there for the Mercury. Finished up the Serrated Edge, so a little bit of penetration and lifesteal should help him out against some of the tankier targets of the Oni Warriors. That said, Tier 2 Tower as well for right. Final K puts a little global gold in the pocket. And I do mean a little, because the Oni Warriors' lead has not exactly changed in the last five or so minutes. I'm surprised. Once more, Oni Warriors showing a lot more respect than I thought they would. Maybe still do have time to just go ahead, group up, knock down Tier 2 on right, even if Fire Giant Power Play comes to an end. I mean, you can restrict some of those rotations, prevent people from farming freely. If you trade out your own Tier 2 tower, 
I don't think the, the Warriors are overly concerned about that. The only time you're really, really worried about tower trades is if the game's relatively even. But the Warriors are so far ahead that it's worth it for them to expose the base of the Leviathans, even if it exposes their own base, because the odds of the Leviathans going to a Phoenix anytime soon are close to zero, but not zero. Infinitely approaching it, but not there. So I, I like this from the Warriors. Group up, knock down a tier two, see if there's any farm to collect, go back, spend some gold, get some vision on fire, and just run it back. Small wins where they lie. At least Panda Cat able to get a purple off stolen away. Big. No, Netro not really needing that for himself. Level 17 to the 19. Again, nearly everybody at least a level or two up at this point. Pagon already level 20 and has finished the starter. I mean, he's five items deep in the build. Panatom blinks in. We've seen this many a times uh -huh. already. Lather Rinse repeat says Panatom. Third kill on Panda Cat this game. No towers left standing for Leviathans to fall back to. It's only Phoenix's left standing, and wrong use health bar, a bit worse for wear. Dark Portal, not enough damage for the kill, but plenty of time and energy saved up now for the Warriors to go right to the Phoenix. Runic Bomb dropped on mid bird, and the mid bird's health bar depleted. Genetics gonna try and zone out, but Final K goes for the ultimate. Should only hit Genetics in this case, but he's got an ultimate to bail out. And now the only Warriors get to walk away, having broken the base of the Leviathans. And they've completely done it, man. I mean, the Leviathans can't take a fight in neutral territory. There's there's a 0% chance we see them walk into that Fire Giant pit unless they're willing to coin toss the game just a little bit faster. But also, if the Fire Giant goes down, I think the Leviathans straight up lose as well. Rock in a hard place. Fire Giant not pulled just yet by the Oni Warriors, but just biding their time. Positioning of the Leviathans tells me that they are not interested whatsoever in heading over. Maybe you can kill genetics? Like, at least try? Maybe. We won't see it for now. Genetics just gonna keep rolling you and Shinto busy. While the rest of the team goes for fire. Dash away by genetics. Still doesn't have ultimate yet. But the Leviathan's gonna play discipline, not go for the tower dive, even with four people standing by. Instead, we'll fall back through the left jungle. No fury for them to grab, no shield buff. There isn't an ounce of farm aside from this purple buff that has respawned here in just a second for adapting the take, but the Leviathans just have not been able to win on any fronts. They've gotten kills on Panatom when adapting shows up, and adapting really feels like he has been the key factor, kind of holding all of this together, the glue for the team, but the seal on that glue is starting to fade away. Yeah, and if we take a look at the damage charts, let's see how much is adapting really done. 6,000. Second highest on the team. Second highest on the team, you know. Fifth highest in the game. Then you look up and he's nearly tripled by SOT, doubled by Panatom. And Genetics just gets to do this. Walk up, 1v3, 1v4. Walk out scot-free for the time. Adapting going to deal with a couple of the lizards dropped by Pagon in mid. Annoying to deal with the save at the least. There's a whole group of them. Yeah, he might have lost that fight. They get help a little bit of push. As the Oni Warriors now head over to the right side. Phoenix, tornado dropped by Pagon, heal. From Sod to keep the team alive, but Final King's getting chunked again. It's half his health just by a couple abilities from the mages. Renew Bomb's in pocket of Panatom, so not here for right side bird. Not that it's necessary. Down to 10%. Would have secured the structure, but I'm thinking gonna go down regardless. Can the Leviathans all in the fight to try and turn it? I mean, they, they've gotta find Pagon, and Pagon's playing so safe. Phoenix, gone. Only Warriors take that one down. Only one bird left remaining in left side. And they might not even need to go for there, but they do still have Runic Bomb for Panatom. Minion Wave pushed very far out, though. They might wait to see if they can get that, or if they can find a pick. Try and push forward. Nitro moves in. Sod leading the charge with the team. Big stun and damage by Pagon on a Panda and Wrong Yu. Both of them poked out. They're going to need to resustain for the fight. Meanwhile, the Warriors can just wait for SOT to just drop that heal on cooldown. And Panda doesn't have beads now, so it's into the back line for Genetics, but maybe too far. Taking a bit of damage, but heals are still there for Saad. Sheen, so going to be chased out by the Tornado. Phoenix at half HP, and Panatom still does have access to the Runic Bomb. Great end used by Saad for damage and for heal, but it's mostly just for damage up against Panda Cat. Starting to get a little too low on the Warriors' side to keep pushing the Phoenix. Yeah, Panatom spending a lot of his time trying to keep adapting out of the fight, which has merit in that adapting is like the only guy who's got fight potential, but also gotta think that Runic Bomb's gonna get some use somewhere eventually. 
maybe just waiting for that mid Phoenix to respawn. He could solo it out. Over the Warriors, Panatom. Trying to find his way to the back line. Shinto getting poked out by Pagon's damage. And even what SOT is able to spam on cooldown. Midbird is there. Panatom not able to take that one down. Yeah, he's just holding yet. it. Metroid is nearby. I don't think Adapting realizes the carry is with him. Half health on the Phoenix on left. Phoenix in mid down to the fire minions in a group up now. Around the left bird, genetics in, but it's just to zone the Levi's out for all three Phoenixes to fall. So what do you do now, Warriors? Do you continue poking into the Leviathans in their base, or do you fall back, collect all the farm on map, get yourself a Fury, and get ready for a siege attempt once more? I'm thinking it's option number two. Do the Levi's have a win con? As the game goes on, eventually they'll hit a state of parity. Eventually they'll catch up and build. It's going to be a long, long time. Still working on fifth items. Haven't quite sold their recipes just yet. Relics unupgraded. Starter is starting to upgrade now for the Leviathans. If the Levi's can buy 10 more minutes, they might just have the opportunity to be strong enough to attempt a fight in neutral territory. But to survive another 10 minutes... They're going to have to win a fight somewhere. Unofficial six-man Titan? That's pretty good. Don't have the Titans marching up yet, in fact. Is it even worth it? in there for a while. If I'm the Warriors, I'm not dropping that. Yeah. Well, then again, I'm not the Warriors. And what do you know? Apparently nothing. That's right. Apparently I don't know anything. Instead, Genetics on the platform. He'll cap up that third beacon. Never mind. He'll walk away because Final K is a much more enticing target for himself. SOT still there to make sure that it does go up. Adapting walking by with wrong you. It's just Gen X by himself. He, he, he doesn't get anything from this except for maybe a pick to find. Okay, Dark Portal's there. Ultimate from Genetics off the mark. And Saw doesn't have enough with his. So Final K is out. A couple hundred HP to his name. But the only Warriors can just go right back to the beacon, reel back up, and it's almost like it never even happened. Yeah, maybe they're trying to time it with the Fire Giant spawn, so they delay it. Now we'll be able to pull the Fire Giant, and the binds of Tartarus will be broken. A little bit later on. Maybe back after fire, group up, knock it down the Titan in mid. Could be the case, I suppose. It's going to be a little bit, though. Timing of it, a bit strange. Regardless, another Runic Bomb in pocket in just a moment here for the Oni Warriors. Right side bird going to be back up relatively soon, but Minion Wave already pushed up so far. Might just be able to take care of it on its own. Levi is just scrounging for farm anywhere on map. Yeah, I just I just don't see it, J-Mac. I really just do not. The Oni Warriors are, are just far too ahead. Shito needs a massive... Ult I was wondering what that noise was. It's the sound of the lizards just trotting up the mid lane. Titan's been unleashed. Leviathans know they have at least a few more seconds on life, but that Titan's going to get chunked away by Netroid and by Pagon as it walks in. Fire Minion Wave is there. So Titan is gone, sent back to the base. Now the Leviathans have Phoenix and then their Titan to defend. Panatom's already on the right side. Two Runic Bombs in pocket. Leviathans need multiple defenses, and it's going to have to start here if they want to try and crawl back into this game. But as Pagon continues to put out the poke and pressure against Wrong Yu, against Final K, these two mages, and Pagon and Sot, are just chipping away at the health of the Levi's. So right side bird, the only bastion of safety for now. And how safe can it keep you against the double runic bombs in play? SOT, real tanky, sonic boom, off the mark. Doesn't find anybody, but adapting's distracting. Final K tries to ult, but he just ends up dying instead. Netroid with one. Shinto, 30% health. The Titans battling it out. The Leviathans can't stand for much longer. They've got to go back and defend their base, but they've got to deal with their own health for the time. Panda Cat. Does get one for trade, but it's a double kill for Netroid. The Titans battling it out as the Oni Warriors march in. They take down Adapting, they take down the Titan, and they take us to game five. Crazy. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think. Like, go back to where it all went wrong, minute zero, zero, zero. It is only two HP that the blue buff survives with. Is it a guaranteed win for the Leviathans if they steal it? No, but they'd be in a much better position. This game's likely much closer. That's a very, very risky play, and clearly the downsides of it I don't think make up for the the, the best-case scenario either. That's tough stuff. I mean, it happens so quick. That's easy, though, to let roll off your back, though.
Just say, uh, look, fumbled my, my goofy little invade. Uh, better get him next time, I guess. GG, go next. Yeah, it's the, the combo of the failed invade. Finos Gabelf getting stolen after that, and then getting sent back, back on, on wave, first wave, and then teleport dying in. After that. Yep, yeah, all it was of that so ended bad. up so early that it got out of control right side. But Leviathan just didn't have an answer anywhere else on the map at the time. Adapting tries to help bail out Final K a little bit, because damage just is already done farm. by that point. And now we push up into game number five. Winner of the set guarantees their spot at Worlds. Losers has to fight just a little bit longer. Who's gonna be? We'll find out in game five right after this.
Welcome back, Smite fans, to the Road to Worlds playoffs. If you look behind me right there, you'll see it is 2-2. Two to two. Game number 5, right around the horizon, right on the horizon, not around the horizon, right around the corner. And man, if you if you miss that game number 4, well, it's frog and inbound. Inbound, why don't you break that one down for me? It was a disaster. That's, that's, that's what it was. It was a level 1 game deciding play. That didn't work out well for the Levi's, and from that point on, it was all Warriors for the next, how long was the game? 25 minutes? Something like that. 25 minutes. Yeah, it was, I mean, it, and I think Miff, Miff characterized it pretty well on, on the cast. The risk versus reward calculation there just did not seem worth it. And, and you know, we, we do put a lot of pressure on that one play. We absolutely, and there, there were 25 minutes of gameplay, and there were opportunities perhaps for the Levi's to get back into it. They they could have perhaps found a way back in, maybe adapting plays to another lane. But Probably. you also got to imagine top three teams in, in the game, top two, two of the, the best teams in the game, perhaps in the history of the game right here. If you are going to give the Oni Warriors an opening like that, an opportunity like that, you have to expect that what we just witnessed is the result of that. Yeah, I think that really puts into perspective where these little mistakes, especially at like that point in the game, rarely do you lose a game in the first like 30 seconds, but that is one play that allows you to lose the game in the first 30 seconds. Yes, as you said, they could have played through a different lane. They could have just literally left that side of the map to find okay and, and tell them good luck. Uh, they tried to fight over there a little bit, and they lost just about every fight over there. But it's it's a little, it, it's a tough spot to be put in because if you do make a play like that and it works out, everyone's looking at the play like this really helped decide the play. But as you can see, I mean, Panda one four, O two, Ronnie, Shinto went one two, adapting two one, sm small bright spot there, and then final K O four. I mean, across the board, it was just advantage everywhere towards the Warriors. It was a it was a difficult game to to play for the Leviathans, and I think if you're fine okay and you're the Leviathans, you're probably saying, hey, cool it, man. Like, we we, we tried something, we were up a game, we, we maybe went for that little bit of an advantage, maybe just cool it here in this game five, just, you know, don't go for the invade, play that standard start, and and try and focus on that team fight phase that they've been so successful with. Picks and bans, game number five, and the stakes here, I mean, this is now best of one essentially right winner goes to worlds loser has to try again tomorrow and it's so we we're talking about this in between games leviathans they get they're they're gonna get their choice of first or second pick here because they lost the game number four they've chosen first pick so they've got their what at least what what they believe to be their pick and ban advantage here in this final game and with this, this advantage, they're using it to ban away this Izanami, which there are two wins. The Warriors, two wins. Izanami ADC was the ADC for both of them. And the other two, no Izanami, both losses. Maybe some correlation there. Netroid plays a lot better from ahead. Maybe this Izanami pick. Whatever it is, that is going to be banned away. On the opposite side, Warriors banning away this Opwash Poseidon. It's been consistent this entire set. This meta has been established. And the Levi's opting for the Maman ban instead of the Uller. So that leaves open an Uller here and no Maman for first or second side. Yeah, I wonder if this is something the Leviathans will like to go to themselves. We've seen Pandacat on it before from that ADC roll. Shinto could go towards it if they want to prioritize taking this pick away. But I mean, that being said, you're absolutely right to, to make that causation, I think, or the, the correlation rather, not necessarily causation. But yeah, that's a link, man. Like you don't get, you don't give Netra the Izanami, perhaps you win a couple more games. This 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 is the other link though. This Chernobog wow. goes over to the Leviathans. This is not a pick I was expecting Shinto to get after game number one, where they got the Chernobog Maman. And, and felt pretty strong in that game, but I mean the, the bands come through. Those those are three valuable bands from the Oni Warriors. I'm I, you know I, I don't want to see any of those in my game, but I also don't want to see the turn of hog. Yeah, when you're on the second side, you feel like you're at such a disadvantage with how many OP picks we've seen. That's why a lot of teams are prioring that first side because I I mean you ban the Posh Poseidon Athena just like you said. These are gods you don't want to play against. 
but then you're forced into playing against this against this Chernobog, which even after the nerfs still looks great, still is able to impact the map. Maybe it's not as strong in that middle portion, but it scales nearly as hard. It's not as safe. We actually saw uh, Cyclone on it in this first set die a couple times, ulting in because the mitigations have now been lowered a little bit. But now with that first pick on the second side for the Oni Warriors, opting for this E shell, which Sol has now gone to two times before. He's looked strong on it. Maybe a little highly prioed for it. Maybe they could have waited a little bit. But, I mean, when you have a pick that you like, you think it's a very good pick, you go and get it. And that's what they're doing with this E-Shell, pairing it with that Uller, which has been banned in the previous four games. A lot of... I don't want to say a lot of flex potential, but there's a little bit of flex potential with this Oni Warriors draft. How many times have we talked about this meta developing in a best of five game, right? You play the four games before this, you, you start to value certain picks, this E-Shell... Certainly looking like one of them as the Oni Warriors' top pick that. On the other side, the Awilish locked in and the Raijin taken here for the Leviathans. This will be adapting back on the Awilish pick. We saw that yesterday from him, had quite a bit of success. And I almost, I mean, this would be 10,000 IQ, right? But like, you ban the Uller four games in a row to make them think you can't play against it, and you bait them into the Uller pick, and then you pick the Awilish. Is that big brain gameplay? I actually think it is a little bit like that. It's like, we don't want to play against this Uller, but, you know, if it, if we have to, we have to go to game five, we can't ban it anymore. We got this pocket of Willix we can pick into it. And it's a very hard matchup for Uller to play into. And then the Oni Warriors picking this older one, which we have not seen, I don't think, this weekend. But this kind of has that same style as the Izanami, where it's a god who wants to dominate laning phase. Arrow early game, Telkines, yes, caught a nerf, but it is still very, very strong. You dominate laning phases, and that's how Net wants to play. Yeah, not needs that, not necessarily needs that. He pressure. needs it. You think he's a crush player, like Genetic <laughs> says? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I did, did slipped out right there, right? He's been playing the Izanami, <laughs> but gets the pressure here regardless yeah, on the Ola run. And they make sure to take that pressure away from Panic at that on her ban coming out immediately. After they pick the, the Wheelish Raijin here. That Chernobog still obviously has some flex potential, but we've seen it more often than not in the hands of Shinto. So I think if you want to go a standard ADC course, things like Hachiman Rama still on the table if you want to have something standard, but the pressure through duo, you make a valid point. Something that they've consistently liked to, to go back to and where they found the success the success the last couple of games. And with the Emoja Afro being banned by the Oni Warriors. Support is something where we've seen genetics kind of go to different picks at this point, and Ganesh has been something he's kind of defaulted to a little bit, but that's not something that's really winning lane. So I expect him to actually kind of opt for a more lane dominant god. I, I don't know entirely what he's been practicing, but there's a lot of different gods. I mean, even that tier last game surprised us, but if you pair it with a god that can clear wave really well, I mean, Charon, again, you pair it with a god that can clear very well. Charon fights well, so now you have a god that can clear the wave basically for you, fight with you, and, and you have a good 2v2 fight. So that's something that the Levi's have to be worried about. You pick the Chernobog, you're not really winning duo lane, but you pair it with something like a Sobek, and you play it into something that does not have a dash. This Ola run, <laughs> I, I, I didn't even think about this, a Willix on top of that, there's a lot of kill potential onto this Olo, onto this Uller. Positioning is going to be very important into this Sobek. We were thinking this duo lane, would just be pressure for Ola Run, right? You take the Ola Run, you pick the aggressive support in Chiron, you ban away the on her. But this is a, a pretty standard kill lane as well from the Leviathans. You get the Sobek pluck into the Ishtar combo, a lot of raw damage coming from that Ishtar as well. That's certainly where we would expect to see a little bit of volatility over there. But this last pick for the Oni Warriors will be the first time in a couple of games that Panatom will not have the option to go towards that Mon and instead opts to go for the Pele. We saw Sino on this a little bit earlier in the day, plays the Facilitator Pele, the, the Absolution build. Yeah. I, I don't think I expect Panatom to go that same build, maybe a little bit more damage coming from his pick. Yeah, I think you'd be right in that assumption. I think we could see the Brawlers, the Erundite. I think that stuff makes sense. But beyond that, I expect a power item third. I don't expect to see that Absolution. But 
that was tech. That was that was pretty cool to see Sino do it, even though I don't expect it to be happening here. Maybe something like a Magi is a little bit more aggressive uh, with the Magi's Revenge. But, I mean, looking over the drafts, I, I think we have pretty obvious ideas of how both teams want to play. When you look at the Warriors so far have made a an advantage playing through duo. That's where they want to go. And I think that's what their comp really likes to do. The Levi's on the other side kind of picked a duo that can match this and has kill potential into it. So it's going to be a early game duo-sided comp for both of these teams. And then when it scales into late game, I mean, I've talked about it a lot. You have a Chernobog. Macro play is very easy with a Chernobog. He can go down any lane and then just ult towards the team fight. And it's something that Shinto does very well. Most mid laners, they can't do that. But Shinto will happily go switch over to duo, send Panda Cat mid, and he'll split and then ult over to a team fight. You get that global pressure coming, which is why we've seen Chernobog so heavily focused out in this set, just the, the raw amount of pressure that can come from this pick. And you, you look at the rest of the draft and, and how it sort of phases out. There, there's some help for this Awelish as well. I was initially, it's always dangerous for me to pick a Awelish in the top half of your draft, right? You're second picking it and you're like, oh, you, you, they can just not pick jumps. But I mean, this Sobek is going to do a lot for that setup. And on top of that, it's a pretty easy matchup into the E-Shield. Yes, you don't have, you know, the free knockup. She doesn't have a jump or something like that. But knockup immune when you use your ult as a Willix. So there's nothing the E-Shield can really do to get you off. The root, you're also root immune. So pretty easy, maybe solo camping. Ryzen also has some decent setup for the Willix. While it's not knockup setup, it's a lot of CC. So I said solo or dual lane is going to be a little bit of prio for both of these 2v2s. There's pretty free ganks over onto this E-Shield, I think, for adapting too. Could be solo focus as well. We saw that solo focus in game number four there. I think, you know, obviously. Well, we <laughs> technically you're right, technically. <laughs> we did see that solo focus maybe, uh, you know, off that off that botched invade a little bit. Does he do it again? Uh, no, I'll be... No. Wait, no, what do you mean, <laughs> does he do it again? I think that I think everybody's pretty settled on, on maybe a fine okay. Should just, you know, take a step back, just chill, do the normal start. Either way, though, all five gods locked in. A best of one here in game five. Winner goes to Worlds, loser has to try again tomorrow. We'll throw it over to the casters to find out. One final game to determine who is going to lock in at the very least second seed going to the Smite World Championships. Their opponents will be the Styx Ferryman to battle it out to see who gets the claim first seed. But it comes down to this game here. It's the Leviathans and the Warriors in game five. It's JMAC, Mifflin, and Doug here to bring you the action for our fifth and final game of the day and of the set, and our closest Twitch poll yet for the set, 49 to 51, still in favor of the Oni Warriors. And maybe surprising given how game number four went that it actually still ends up being that close in the in the poll. Well, you gotta take into account the full, the full scope and context of game number four, right? I don't wanna, I don't wanna break it down anymore. What's, no. oh, man. Sot got a little too close to that buff for my liking. I was getting oh, a, see part two. Bit, of, bit of a flashback there. Let's see. Standard mage solos. Final K is on his side of the map. Jungle buff's going to get cleared normally. J-Mac, dare I say it? We might have a smite game on our hands. I think we got a game of smite ready to go. Final K going to grab his blue. Bring it back to meet up with Shinto on the Chernabog. And I think this is an important one to go back to because Chernabog... Did receive some nerfs coming to this patch. We wondered how much are we going to see at Chernabog. The answer was still a whole lot. Teams are banning it out. Teams are still able to pick it up. Though I will say it hasn't been banned as heavily as it was in the phase of past. You know, look back to the Road to Worlds phase. This guy was near 100% pick ban. Sitting at like 99.2 or something like that over the course of the phase. Now still getting through a little bit more. See genetics thrown back by wrong use, slowed down by the emblem, but not quite enough damage for the kill just yet. But some pressure in dual lane, something much needed for the Leviathans. So you do see adapting, taking a bit of damage from Panatom, putting the hunters in mid. Uh, I, I see double hunter composition from both, double physical from Leviathans, physical magical split for the Warriors, going over to this Olorun, even despite the nerfs that went to some of his itemization. Yeah, I think Oleron's still in a pretty decent spot, too. Itemization as it stands, sure, maybe not as good as it once was, but still still pretty decent. 
and, and could always go towards maybe some of the more standard items. What? Oh my well, the god, pop the pop-off off was the insane. The pop-off from Sun, a full combo on fine, okay? I don't Solo need, I don't need two blue blood. I don't need two to take you down, loser! <laughs> You're free! That's that's my sought impression. I think it was spot on, spot on impression for Pagon going down. Two damage from Shinto is there, and he returns the favor. Notable no pop off from Shinto this time, but Stone Cold still gets the kill and the assist from adapting. So where where, where does that leave us? Hold on, genetics fucked back in. Might be dropped low here. He might just die. I don't know if he has dash. Does hit by Stunts by Panda Cat, and now it's Genex trying to fight back. Netroid might go down They're too. They're in the wave. Genex is still there. The pluck misses. It hits the minions. He's out. Somehow the no one in the dual link dies despite three low health bars. Man, that's crazy. Pagod in some trouble. But I think maybe a second to breathe is what I would say if Panda Tom weren't making it happen and left. Luck throws him right at the waiting wings of the tier one tower, but not in the line of it to take any damage from that tower. So Panatom should be fine. Give us a moment to breathe is all we ask from both these two teams. We went from some fairly passive early games to a wild west of a game four. And now all of a sudden it's just fighting across the map for the two teams. And we only really got to see the tail end of that solo kill for SOT versus Final K. Okay, now we can watch it in its full depth to see just what even happened, because full HP, Final full K, mana? I mean, Final K was down half his health by the time we even get to that tier one tower, but it's a full two combo. Gets, or so I'd say the root combo in, and uh, just gets just, it done. It's a full rotation of abilities for a kill. Just that easy. Yeah, just that easy. Ixchel, so much damage there. Final K decides to stand his ground, does not have the Thunder Crash available to him. And uh, unfortunately for him, uses beads just a little bit too late. Doesn't immune the knockup, but doesn't immune the damage. And so, loses his life for first blood. Fortunately for Fine, okay, the Leviathans answer it elsewhere on the map. Shinto able to pick up his one on his direct lane opponent, Pagon. So, are you picking Ool to lose the early game? Not exactly. Going to be a little bit of pressure lost there. And now Chernobog access to the ultimate can get active just about anywhere on map. High pressure game on both sides, both teams, playing everywhere and all the time. But as things start to slow down a bit, we can start looking at itemization and how it's developing. Gone are the days, I suppose, of ring first slot on Olorun. Now it's Tiny Trinket first slot. Likely just Typhons. Could be Pythag's piece if you think it's that valuable. Soul Laners seem to think exactly that. And on the other side... Just standard itemization across the board. Maybe the, the largest departure is Death Toll in mid. That's a little bit interesting, and he's also slotted at second, so I automatically don't like it. And but, it's got an Aussie next to it, too. Yeah, I mean, this guy's he's, he's doing it different, but if you're worried about poke from Ool, and you should be worried about Ool poking you, Death Toll plus Aussie, it's one way to keep yourself topped off. Now, typically when we see Ola run, some of the questions that get asked are, what are the answers to Ola run in a game? See things like Kamazad at times, Cthulhu, Vamana, whenever he was uh, at the top of the meta. Don't really have those same levels of answers this time for the Ola run. So for this Leviathan's comp, as we start pushing to the team fight stage, we start getting towards sieges and, and battles around objectives, what is their answer to dealing with Netroid on this Ola run? I mean, avoid it. Just don't get your time dilated. It's like one pretty good place to start. Otherwise, Tycho drums just to like peel out throughout the fears uh, in the sanctified fields. I think going to be pretty valuable. Wrong Gyu can just walk out of it with lurking in the waters. CC immunity for Panda Cat and Ultimate too. So th there are certainly some answers. I think the the biggest point of difficulty we will see for the Leviathans of dealing with Olderun is how adapting addresses it on this Awilish. If he's going to be leaping into the fights or blinking into the fights, might just put himself in some awkward positions. Saw taking a bit of damage. Shinto though flies in to join his jungler. Adapting blinks over. The feather step is good, but he doesn't have the damage follow up. Maybe some help from Final King as a team. But it's a team. Panatom turn it to get one before losing. It's the junglers who both go down. Ultimates used across the board. Three on the side of Leviathans, two from the Warriors. But now Pagon is here. Gets a big damage on a final K, but doesn't have the chase to follow up. Yeah, I was surprised to see Adapting try and reinitiate on the SOT there. Sot's low and doesn't have defense just yet, but all that mitigation in the ultimate makes things tough. Just barely off the mark with that axe. Good dash from Shinto. Keeps him safe. Wave going. 
Which wave? There was a wave. Uh huh. Where the was it going? Today. Oh, there it is. Oh, that, that wave. wave. Not the minion wave. No, no, the, stu the summon sticks mi uh, stygian wave that goes through. Understood. It was going to Soul Lane. <laughs> yeah, it didn't hit anybody. Almost. You got good eyes, Jamie. I didn't see that at all. Look, almost only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. So that's what my dad used to tell me when I was young growing up. Yeah, you're from the south for sure. Yep. <laughs> so, pulling things back. Oni Warriors, small lead for them, about four or five hundred gold over the Leviathans. Some of that, most of that, forward over to SOT for a solo kill up against Fine. Okay, now battle around mid. She took oh, his dash shot, and now he has to try and just fight back the best he can, but he can't stand his ground against three. Panatom gets one and might be able to close gap to adapting. Has the wall to jump over if need be. Wrong Yulo and Mana won't be able to be of too much use for abilities. But can still be there as a sponge for some of these in-hands. It's another kill over to the Oni Warriors, this time around mid. And three minions denied there for gold. Netroid make sure that it's shoved back in towards that tower. Panicat has to go back to base. I wonder, do the Oni Warriors have enough damage to go for that objective-style play that served them so well in games one and two? And I think the answer might just be yes. I was wrong, by the way, about the first item for Netroid is Bancroft's talent in first slot. Bancroft is fine. Great stat stick. Has always been a pretty decent stat stick. Good life seal. Good amount of power. You are sacrificing penetration, but not exactly too concerned about it. I think maybe it's just the glyph that attracts him to that item. But the Bancroft's glyph, Nimble Bancroft's, a little bit different from the majority of other glyphs in Smite in that you kind of want to upgrade into him immediately. You need some power stacked up before you're going to find the value of that one. So might be a little while until we see Netruid upgrade it. I wonder where the rest of the build goes, because it has typically been ring in the first couple of slots. Just like double maybe ring Typhons. Steal. Maybe we'll see if he just goes one ring into Typhons, goes straight into Typhons for double life steal. I think you still have to Demonic. I, I really do think you have to. Unless he goes like full mage build and just has attack speed from Nimble. I am unfamiliar with, with this Olaron build, though. I mean, in honesty, really only win. Hold that thought. Fine, okay. Half health. Why do you hit so hard? Back to tier one tower. Really, we haven't seen much of Bancroft outside of when Bancroft's claw was kind of the meta yep. go-to. Panatom lose the beat that again, pulled back by adapting. Over to Genetics, does clip adapting, keeps him away from Panatom, and that's Shinto as over to the back line. It's SOT under fire, but he pops the beads, tries to get to the tower, but there's just too far to go. And Shinto now pulls up the third kill for Leviathans. A Pagon's on the way. Won't jump into the middle of four, but get some good damage on adapting. I'm surprised Pagon's done so well keeping up with these rotations that Shinto's made. Shinto has a global ultimate. Pagon has to walk like a mortal, which still makes himself at least a bit known over in that soul lane and will prevent any further aggression from the Leviathans. SOT, it's been, what, three attempted ganks? Three attempts at his life. Finally hits Pater at adapting. Significant power spike from that Hydra Star, one of the most valuable tier two items that assassins can pick up. A little bit of penetration, some cooldown, decent passive. Will is able to finally secure that kill. Tough stuff, man. SOT is still in a really good position, though. About level parity, itemization slightly ahead. Final K has made his way out of base, wasn't quite able to finish up his defense item. So even with all this pressure from the Leviathans on the right side of the map, stopping SOT has just been a, a Herculean task. It's not just... I think complete control of this soul lane over the course of really this set. No matter what he's been going towards, this E shell, I believe now three times on this pick over the course of this set. Game one, game four, and now here in game number five. Look great on it every single time. Ooh, new Arendite. Arendite picked up. We've been seeing a lot of Arendite. I believe Sino was going on this on the Pele, but he was going a little bit tankier immediately after. I think his Absolution was typically the follow up, but. It's an early slot. The extra 7% movement speed that you just get inherently from it seems to have really made this an enticing item for junglers. Yeah, here's the thing about when there was an entire item tree that had movement speed on it, and it was every jungler's favorite item every single time. Turns out you put 7% movement speed on just about anything, and junglers will gravitate towards it. It is overall, in ideal situations, when the passive is utilized, less movement speed than it once was, but it's only 3% less total. Uh, now 20% from the passive of Arendite, but 7% all the time. Puts you at 27%. Still get the CDR. Still a massive, massive infusion of power. One of the highest power items for physicals in Smite. So a lot of potential for Panatom to start getting involved. His chase down potential much higher post-Volcanic Lightning as well. And looking at the targets that he's likely to be going towards, 
Panda Cat, Rong Yu Shinto, Adapting, they all have some sort of mobility. So anything that makes Panda Tom even more threatening, even faster, I, I, I tend to think will serve him well. Fury for the Oni Warriors. Panda Cat going to get clipped by a bit of damage from Panda Tom. Rong Yu and Shinto show up on the scene, but Genetic's trying to zone back. Pegon fires a few abilities over the wall. No Gold Fury attempt even any further than that from the Oni Warriors. They'll just see. The Leviathans have at least shown up, so they know there's some ward coverage around the area. You get a bit of a heat check on how long it would take those rotations to go through. So now they'll fall back and try and get their farm back up. Pagon falling a bit behind over in mid. One level up for Shinto, but as mentioned, still able to decently match the rotational power that this Chernabog has had for the mid laner. Three and one now for Shinto with this mid Chernabog pick. Been a part of every single kill, gotten every single kill for his team, but does make him an ideal target for the only wars they can pick him out. Yeah, but how often are you going to want to jump on a Shinto right now? That fail not power spike makes him a very dangerous target. Natrioid dropped low in tower. I don't think Adapting is going to be willing to go all the way in, especially considering Sanctified Field's still available, Bead's still up too. Adapting spotted out by Panatom. A couple of Pyro class for damage. Just to scare Adapting away. Tidal Wave will Ooh, just barely catch Panda Cat. Pulls him over towards the side, just for a time being. And that's now global down from Genetics. It's one of the slowest moving globals in the game, actually the slowest. But not gonna have that CC if that immediate kind of crack of CC that you would want in a team fight from your Charon. Yeah, that, that ability, I think, is Charon's entire contribution to objective team fights. We saw it from Aurora earlier, just the ability to walk up to a Gold Fury and threaten massive jungle lane corridors worth of CC would restrict his efficacy here, should the Leviathans be able to get into range. It's burning fast. Panda doesn't have ultimate. Sanctified Field has been used, but a wrong you able to walk wow. up and help steal that one away, even through... The ult from Netroid it is the lurking in the waters. 300 damage from the support. Steals that one out. Leviathans feeling great to get themselves, more than anything, back in the game. Is a 1,000 gold deficit between them and the Warriors. Now things even back up and even, even slightly in, in the Leviathans' favor. Yeah, and even if Genetics has ultimate there, he's not changing the outcome of that one. Rongyu early cancels lurking in the waters. Just has the perfect secure. Strips it away from the Oni Warriors, who are lacking for secure in composition. I, I, I think best case scenario in the latest portions of the game when they're five on five has got to be SOT if he stacks his abilities properly. But otherwise, they, they haven't got on the Oni Warriors just one ability that's, okay, that's it. We're going to confirm. Pyroman, sir. Can Leviathans take a second one away? Pyro's low. Warriors get this one, but adapting. Has found Pagon by himself. Beads and Aegis forced away from the mid laner, and so is his health bar. Panatom jumps to the middle of four, gets a big damage in the tidal wave. The Adapting jumps over it, but Netroid's got the follow up. But Panatom low, but Rongyu and Final K make sure he goes down. Rongyu might lose his life, but a quick dash out, a big ult from Panda Cat inside of the Fire Giant pit, bails out the support and solo. Leviathans, they don't get Pyro, but they take down two. They take two, but at what cost? Rongyu's still very low. Hovering nearby, Panda Cat in a very poor position. Genetics on the chase. The double root misses. Panda Cat's got turn and burn. <laughs> Look at the damage Sot's able to put right back out. A third or more of Panda Cat's health bar just with a quick combo from the solo of the Oni Warriors. Means they will give up that chase. Tier 1 tower safe. So is Panda Cat's life. Didn't even have to use a relic for any of that either. No, he's in a very, very good spot. And Panda Cat's impact on team fight with that ultimate was huge. Peels out for wrong you. Make sure that nobody else in the Leviathans is dying. The double stun over the wall. Very clean. One of the threats of Ishtar is just how quickly that CC comes your way. And the fact that it gives her CC immunity while she channels it. So Panda Cat playing well around his god's kit. He's on a lot of opportunities. A lot of impact already early on. And I like this adaptation. Panda Cat kind of taking over the mid-roll a bit. Sends Shinto over towards the left side of the map. He can pressure the tower or collect the wave. And if anything happens on the right-hand side, he'd have been there at a moment's notice. And it's that, that versatility of playing around the Chernobog, I think. Just makes him so, so powerful. The global presence just cannot be understated. It is so difficult to control the map state when one team has something like Chernobog on their side. And the only Warriors have got really no answers to it. Sure, they've got a global. Charon Ultimate's not, not even 
no. one one hundredth the impact on, on map state that Chernobog has got. So if anyone's going to dedicate time to stopping Shinto, they're going to have to de dedicate a lot of time to that side of the map. Five then starting to group up around fire. Shinto still on the left side of the map. The only warriors. Five strong in the left jungle and mid lane. Wrong you. Gonna have to dash to get past the warriors back to the tower. Runic Bomb dropped down and not broken in time. It's a tier one tower now for the Oni Warriors Traded. to be able to collect. Shinzo's able to get one of his own. Might just go for a second because nobody's coming back to stop him. Don't know if he'll be able to fully take it for the time. Oh, but he's got Panatom it. will rotate over just to try and answer back. Make sure Shinto can't push any it. further. A couple more in-hands would do it, but Shinto might just stand his ground and fight against Panatom. Crits are good, but dash into the wall means that Shinto can bail out for now up to the sky. Does he go back to the team or does he drop right back down? He'll land back in place. Even the tidal wave Ooh. a bit slow on reaction to get there. And Shinto's out for now. Good defense there from Panatom. Does lose him his blink and the volcanic lightning. So ability to threaten the back line of the Leviathans at an all-time low for this Pele. But the only Warriors have always been a team to play fast on the objective. Fire Giant pulled. The final K is there. Does throw out the ultimate, keeping genetics locked around the Fire Giant pit. It does manage to scare the Warriors away from it. But as long as SOT is alive, plenty of utility from the E-Shell to make sure to keep the Oni Warriors topped off in HP and in movement speed. Just to continue to jump right back in and re-pull the fire if needed. It's a dead even game nearly here. A thousand gold between these two teams. 18 minutes in. Might be one of the closest games we've had so far this set. I think so. I wonder what Shinto's play is from here. The Leviathans are strong enough. Should Fido K okay not fall here? To defend the Fire Giant, avoids the Sanctified Field, needs that slow to connect. I'm not sure he's out, though. Knockup and Root are there. Frenzy and another Root from the Charon. Even if he Thundercrash in Tower, Sas got hit everything, but he doesn't. The Great End is there, but he just can't close the gap in time. He's starts to bail out Panatom. The Panatom goes down. One for one trade. And now it's Sot at a quarter HP. Trying to bail out, but he's got the knockup. He's got the sustain to stay alive. Where's the targeting? Who is they going to try and go for? Sot's still alive through all. Instead, they sacrifice Netroid, who's walked too far in. But a play for Wrong Yu, right into the arms of Adapting. Meets a double for the jungler of the Leviathans and three kills for the team. Genetics, do you make it out of here alive? You're burning fast. Dash got to be coming up soon. Two more seconds until he gets access. Thrown back and adapting there to heal the damage. Credits the kill for Wrong Yu. And the Leviathans never had to leave the pit. The Fire Giant pulled out. Oni Warriors, massive commitment on the Final K, and I get it. Final K lives far longer than I thought he would, but you got to realize how many members of the Leviathans are nearby and ready to punish you for it. Walking through that tier one tower, overzealous at best. Tough, foolhardy at worst. The only warriors punished massively. Fire Giant, Pyromancer, Primal Fury, a tier one mid tower, all on chopping block in the Leviathans. I mean, you called it, close game. It wasn't close for that long. Now we're sitting at 5,000 in the blink of an eye with three, four kills, Fire Giant, Pyromancer. Now they can head over towards Primal. Started up by the Warriors, but fine, okay. He was first on the scene last time for his team. We'll kick off the fight with the Tycho Drums. Only going to hit a couple of those. Immediately an ultimate used by Sot, and the Warriors get Primal. The Leviathans have now shown up. Late to the party is going to be wrong you. But first on the scene now, adapting. Going to wait on the jump in as Shinto jumps in with his own ultimate. And SOT, the first one down in the team fight, adapting on a killing spree. And the Leviathans can just keep going. That tier two tower has, what, 150 HP to it? The Leviathans knock it down. They keep up their surge as Genetics is caught out, able to roll away for the time. But he is half health and might have to head back to Fountain. Brought the Raiju to the, his whole squad. Slowed and forced back. The Oni Warriors, no defense. Left side bird taken. And once more, it's the Oni Warriors trying to get aggressive on map that gets them punished. SOT sticks around a little too long, but... He's really not able to walk out of those situations easily. Ixchel, not exactly the most mobile god on the planet. Only Warriors, in attempting to take the Gold Fury, lose their life, get the Fury, but lose their Phoenix. A trade the Leviathans would take every single day of the week, put another Tier 1 tower. All of a sudden, it's, it's simple. Pull up the charts for me, Doug. I mean, this has been a tumultuous last three or four minutes for the Oni Warriors. Levi's now in complete control. Difference being, though, this gold lead, although massive and starting to approach the levels that we had seen in the previous game, does come much later on. 
So, itemization, although favoring the Leviathan is not nearly as bad as it was previously. Experience, I mean, massive, but Shinto's been level 20 for a while. And you can only hit 21, so not all of that experience is impact. He's the only Warriors are not completely removed from this game just yet. The one thing you need to see if you're a Warriors fan, you gotta see SOT start hitting some waves. Level 16 on this X-Shell ain't gonna cut it. No, it needs a lot more farm to catch up to fine, okay, and really... The rest of the Leviathan's team, 20 for Shinto, Panda Cats at 19, adapting at level 19. We're about to hit these level 20 power spikes for the carries. Even Wrong Yu now at 15, able to upgrade his starter item. So just wait for a little bit more gold in pocket for the Leviathans. Don't imagine we see them push too much further until they can get those starters and those levels ready to go. We are approaching dangerous waters for both teams. We've seen what one single team fight can do post 30 minutes of the game. Not quite there just yet to see a game end off of a bad team fight, but these teams are really battling out for that second spot at the SWC. But look at map state difference. Even if the Oni Warriors win out on an engagement, let's say cleanly, five towers still standing, that's a lot of defense, a lot of HP for your Titan to play with. So I think the Leviathan's in a position now where they're allowed to make some mistakes unless they're just overly egregious. If you get five-man wiped cleanly on your own bird from here, the only Warriors might be able to clear it out. But Leviathans take a fight here and lose. I don't think the only Warriors get too much. Leviathans with an 8,000 gold leading climbing up against the Warriors. Fire Giant still about a minute and a half until it's respawned on the map. Leviathans already starting to group around there. A couple of players have gone back. Got their items up. Adapting, now upgrading his starter. Shinto, Pandacat got theirs. Final case still waiting for 20 before he can get that blood soaked shroud. The only warriors, their Phoenix is still down. Pagon's able to push that wave out a little bit. Still an opportunity to push up to this fire giant. Watch adapting. He's alone here. Heading towards Pagon. I'm not sure Pagon even knows that He's this is no idea. Blink over, waiting out. The Aegis adapting, used his ultimate already in a tidal wave. Just make sure that Pagon has an option out. Weird. But that was Aegis down for the Ool. Bead still available for Pagon next fight. Yeah, very strange. Maybe uh, adapting playing off to just sound cues. Here's something and assumes it's going to be the leap. Instead, gravity surges nothing. Or maybe just wanted it for the stim, but if that's the case, Pagon able to make himself scarce regardless. Even just stripping away the Aegis, though, a much... Higher value wild. trade. Pagan, are you sure about this one? Just jumped over to adapting while the Leviathans is forming a line all the way across the map as they sweep through the middle of the lane. Look at the vision coverage. And towards left. But it's Gold Fury for the Oni Warriors. As soon as that Q sound is heard, all the Warriors are on left. The fire just spawned in. The Leviathans, you just trade the eject to say, sure, you can have your pitiful gold. We want the fire giant this whole time. And they'll get so. Left side, Phoenix is respawned. So it'll be fine for now, but... Leviathans get a major objective for free. Look, Warriors have got really good base defense. Oleron on his own, going to give that to you, but SOT on a standard mage will help out a good deal on that regard too. So it makes sense to me that the Warriors are willing to trade the Fire Giant, especially when you take into account how much vision the Leviathans have on that right side of the map. Just about every path in towards the Fire Giant covered by a ward or maybe even two wards. And so grab Gold Fury, put some gold in your pocket, and just buckle up for a hard-fought defense, I think, for the Oni Warriors. Probably going to try and play it 5v5. The Leviathans have opportunity to try and split the map. That's always the MO of a team composition that's got a Chernabog on it, but a little bit harder to leverage that when it's just Phoenix's remaining. Genetics and Panatom. This is dangerous. Ultimate by Genetics. Throws it towards Panatom to give him the movement speed, but he's being caught out. The only Warriors are being collapsed on. It's Genetics down already. The Leviathans now have a 5v4. A win in this game guarantees at least second seed going to the SWC, and the Leviathans might just be one push, one fight away from doing so. They'll take away the weakened Phoenix and left and march over towards mid lane. But there's no Titan in the throne room, so the opportunity to close out the game, not there until someone goes to address the Chaos Titan on the right-hand side. Blink from adapting. Not going to find anything there. Panatom able to get out. Does trade out his own blink. Titan being addressed now by the Leviathans. And Wave already pushed up in mid and leaking into left. Leviathans playing with infinite map pressure. 
Should give them every advantage they need as they approach this right side bird. Genetics rejoins the land of the living and nearly has his ultimate back up. But I'm keeping my eyes on some of those relics. No beads for Shinto. Could be some room for play for the Warriors. I'm keeping watch on Panatom. He just got back to base as the Leviathans group up on right Phoenix. Pagon gets hit by the Raiju, but it doesn't detonate yet. Fine, okay. Trying to get that poke. The Leviathans playing cautiously. That Titan gave the Oni Warriors an extra second to breathe, but now it's the Leviathans Titan pushing in. The Oni Warriors have got to put up a defense. Shinex will start the fight with an ultimate, but it's only going to grab maybe one at the end as Final K goes up for the old Sanctified Field in response for the Warriors to defend and try and take down this Titan and keep their bird alive. Right side bird down to 50. Leviathans playing it slow. Big knockup connects to three. And Leviathans can't break the bird just yet. Fire Giant going to keep them sustained relatively well, but the only Warriors have not taken a lot of damage either. Panacat only hits Sot with that ultimate. So now two down for the Leviathans. Two ults from the Oni Warriors. Their siege defense might just be gone as far as ults are concerned, but can they hold out with damage? Wrong Yu walks in with Panacat and fine. Okay, the fight breaks out. The Phoenix is nearly gone, but the SOT is keeping the team alive. The great end, making sure to keep the Leviathans pushed back. The Leviathans not going to give up just yet. They still got fire sustain. But that Phoenix is just proving too much to take down. Tycho Drums coming back up shortly. Panicat a little while till he has his own ultimate. But no easy targets here on the Oni Warriors. Really want to knock down that bird. Don't want it resustaining back up. But with HP bars as they are, it just does not look good for the Leviathans. And Discipline wins the day. It's a back up. Maybe grab the Pyromancer. Put a Runic Bomb in pocket. Simplify your siege a little bit later on. The Oni Warriors. They play it perfectly, keep their base alive. Pyromancer will be the next answer for the Leviathans. They drop that one down. Their lead still sitting around that 10,000 gold mark for the Atlantis Leviathans. XP doesn't matter at this point of the game with all these level 20s kicking in. So for the Leviathans, moment to reset. Fire Giant back up in a minute. They'll just strip out any objectives still left standing in the jungle. Pyro, Primal. Give them an easier chance on this next fire giant. The Leviathans going to have to wait a little bit longer. With that left side Phoenix down, the only warrior is going to have to keep somebody over there to protect it or could see them make the Hail Mary play and try and stand their ground at fire. Could be, but do they even have the resources to take a team fight around the fire giant? I mean, Sanctified Field, it's going to be a pretty impactful ultimate going forward, but you're still waiting on that true six slot. Don't get fooled by those recipes. I nearly did. Still waiting on a lot of six slots here for the Oni Warriors. Desperately in need of some gold. And the Leviathans have done such a good job up until this point just clearing out the entirety of the jungle. But this next fire giant will be enhanced. And the ability to defend the base, I think, completely contingent on the fact that the Oni Warriors were able to keep those minion waves out. Minion waves not required when backdoor protections have been removed. And so, I think the Oni Warriors might feel pressured to step up to this Fire Giant. If we lose it, we lose the game. Wouldn't be surprised if that's a thought process. Wrong you. Wrong you goes in a bit too far. Let's listen with the Leviathans. They try and bail out of the fight. Hey, back, back, back up out, back up out. Back up out. They're holding. Okay, I'm good. They They're trying they to fight. Group. They They're all leaning. Watch Pele on the left. Group, the group. Yo, Pele, yo, Pele. Look at Pele. Pele's one. Beats that. Pele, my G. I'm ulti guys, I'm ulti guys! I chase them all! I'm looking at the shell. And Karen? Kill him on the right, kill him on the right. We just slow chase these guys and kill them. Right side, right side, right side, right side! Kill them all! Right side, right side! Careful, careful, careful! Kill her! 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 Atlanta Leviathans will be your second team punching their ticket to the SWC World Stage. One team fights all they need. They knock down all five of the Oni Warriors. Only cost them adapting life. And you hear it in the confidence in their call. We kill this guy, we win the game, and they do just that. Panda Cat, cooler heads, calls to the end of the game. Did you hear what Shito said? I'll kill them all. And he meant it. The Leviathans, a team that play with momentum, thought maybe they lost a bit of it. Off of game four, clearly not. They bounce back fast. And that was a dangerous spot for Wrong U2. Plucks in, misses everybody. I thought he was dead. Not a single person nearby in a sanctified field dropped on top of him. 
And he just walks out with ultimate. And the rest of the team says, okay, back up. Wait for them to go too far forward. And it was Panatom who got a little too far up on the Pele. Gets picked off, and then from one by one, it's Leviathans taking down the Warriors. And it's great target selection, too. I mean, you heard it throughout the entirety. Jump on the Pele, jump on the Pele. She's low. Okay, we got her. Go right now. Oh, I got my fight on left. Someone help this guy. The, the, the communication, although cluttered, although uh, maybe a bit overly energetic, all the information that you need to know, uh, that everything you need to know to make informed decisions about the team fight was there. You just have to have the skill to hear it. Uh, and I couldn't. I don't know. Those guys are loud. Yeah, I'm surprised you heard anything other than Pele, 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 because that was what sounded like 90% of the calls until that Pele all you need to know. was down. Goes down. The Atlantis Leviathans in a five-game barn burner the set. They win this one out and will be your second team to go to the SWC. They'll have their seating match on Sunday. And that's it for Miff and I here on the cast. We'll throw it over to the desk to break it down. What a game number five there. The Atlantis Leviathans, they punch their ticket to Worlds. Still Frog, still inbound. We're closing out the action. That, I mean, dude, the, the, the listening, I think, seals it all. So much energy, so much passion coming from these guys on the Leviathans. I, they, they couldn't be happier to have punched their ticket. I mean, Levi's comms have been consistent since they came into the league. There's always energy. There's always excitement there. And it's still, even through that, you can kind of make out, like, pretty easily what they want to do and in game when you're so hyper focused it's really easy to kind of pay attention to what the team wants to do with that final fight it was a pretty clean fight all be told yes Ronnie missed pluck but I mean baiting out a pluck for an Oleron ultimate happily taking that the Warriors choose to chase that fight down Panatom goes in Panatom goes down and the rest of the Warriors fall and only adapting falls with them overall I mean this game started out pretty heavily in favor of the Warriors, but this play right here, this game was even, and then you had the Warriors diving past the Tier 2. The fight gets split, but the, the Levi's are able to walk through their own tower, and the Warriors cannot. I think this is the big game-changing fight for the Levi's. After this, Fire Giant. After this, Towers. After this, Phoenixes. And then they get another Fire Giant, and it's just kind of all be told. Levi's on that one fight just snowball it. Yeah, perhaps that overcommittal of trying to chase down Fine OK on that right hand side. But then this fight, naturally, Shinto, a big player in this last one, grabs a couple of them, adapting, grabs Panatom, and the entirety of the Leviathans bring the energy, bring the passion. They'll be playing their seeding match come Sunday up against the Styx Ferryman. With that DSI, they take it here in game number five up against the Oni Warriors. And it was, they let them have Uller, man. Like they, I, I don't know if it's a bait. I don't know if it's gonna, we're gonna call it Crazy IQ. I, I was a little bit confused by that ultimate before the jump on the left. That was side. a little weird. That was a little bit weird. Um, but I mean, they almost, I, like the Oni Warriors felt like they got everything they wanted in that composition. And still the Leviathans just clean play able to take it. Yeah, I mean, you look at the Levi side, and they're probably thinking, hey, you can have Uller all you want. Give us Chernabog, you can have the world. Because when you get Shinto on this Chernabog, good, thing happen, good things happen. He team fights well. He 1v1s well. And, I mean, overall, it was most of that game decided in the late. Shinto's just popping off. Yeah. No, I mean, you, you get one, maybe two fights that come down to it. But it really is just that one fight on the overcommit on the final okay can that right hand side and then like you said it's a fire giant it's a it's a siege defense that the only warriors they look to, to fight back into but then they, we only get one more jungle fight from that on the on the efg yep. and you, you saw the the pressure around that you can't let them have that pick i mean i i want to hear from the team themselves you've got fine okay standing by for an interview that's right i've got fine okay the soul winner for the leviathans first off congrats on making it to the swc how does it feel knowing you've made it to Worlds now? Feels really good. You know, we're super excited and happy. We know we're going to play the Ferryman, another good team for uh, seeding. And you know, obviously, punching your ticket to Worlds is the most important thing this weekend. And we got it done. That's just rude. I just looked over at the lower third. That's just toxic. <laughs> that, By the way, that was a request from your own coach, by the way, to have that put there. So a little bit of an inside at least there. Uh, talk to me about game number five, though. It's back and forth. You guys are finally able to uh, get a big lead about 20 so minutes in the game. Riding that through. Wrong you goes in, missed that pluck. We obviously listened to the team fight comms. But I mean, over the course of this set, I mean, how has this team just developed to, to really adapt to what the Warriors have been doing? It was a pretty close game. And then they 
came to kill me in right, and they like chased me out, and they dove the the tier one, and it, it sort of like baited the whole fight. That's why they call me the master baiter, first of all. So, um, but yeah, it just ended up being such a good fight for us because they all got really low. They used all their ults. I ended up dying, but I was pretty useless as uh, last two games anyway. So, I mean, to be fair, um, that game four was just really unlucky. Like if that was a scrim session, we'd start that like right away. I think my first, the, his blue buff lived with six HP, and then mine lived with ten. He got both, and then I was level one, and I couldn't even walk up the wave. So that was a. Uh, my mental is a bit out of it, and then I get soloed in game five. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know how we won that. Um, but I think it's a testament like how good our team is. We can be in that bad of a situation and keep our mentals, uh, you know, strong and still come out with the win. Uh, tell me about really the growth of this team from phase one. You know, it, it's a bit of a rough patch for you guys to start the phase out. I think only a few wins over the course of it. Get your nice little break for the summer. Come through after Masters into phase number two and really just have this whole kind of kickstart momentum, adding Panda Cat to the roster. How much more has really this team improved, not just together, but through communication and everything like that over the course of this year? Well, it's hard because Zap was actually in like the real games. We, uh, he was talking a lot and communicating around like Fire Giants and the important stuff. Like he was, um, he was communicating well. Um, so once we replaced him, we kind of need to figure out how we were going to go about like who we were going to listen to, who was going to make the calls. Um, and we've gotten better at that as the, the split has gone on. Um, and I feel like we're really comfortable with what we want to do, basically in every, any given scenario. Um, and I think the, the best test of that is against the Ferrymen because I consider them like the best objective team in the league. So um, if we can play clean run objectives against them, then we can beat anybody. I'm excited for the set on Sunday. At least the guaranteed second tee going to Worlds. Congratulations, Final K on the win. I'll let you get back with the team. We'll throw over the desk to close things out. I mean, here there from Final K, the story behind this Leviathan's team. You, you have maybe a middling, not the phase one that you wanted to have. You pick up the, the retired Panda Cat. You push yourselves to, to, at worst now, second seed at Worlds. Great story for them. We can take a look at the bracket, see how the day rounded out, see what we've got planned for tomorrow. Styx Ferryman and the Atlantis Leviathans, they're obviously headed to SWC. They'll play for seeding on Sunday. Whereas Saturday, we've got our losers bracket matches. Jay Dragons, Camelot Kings, and the Oni Warriors going up against the Highland Ravens. Both those matches tomorrow, and those are do or die matchups inbound. The winner goes to Worlds. The loser heads back down to the group stage to try again all the way in January to see if they can make Worlds through the group stage battling against the, the Hounds, the Gladiators, our SOC, SOC SCC teams in that playoff event. So so important elimination matches coming up tomorrow. And you, you still get to decide as the third seed who you play against. It's a lot less teams you get to decide from only the two. So these are still very important matches. Yes, you, you can still make it if you have to go through the, the elimination uh, January tournament, but you want to establish your world's you know, entrance right now, so you can start actually getting ready for it, preparing for it. You're going to be scrimming anyway, so these next, this next day of, of games is going to be very and very important, and they're going to be very exciting games. Kings Dragons looking to be a great start to it, and then ending the day with Ravens Warriors. Both teams probably expected maybe to be one of the teams that won, because I mean, Ravens. A lot of players or a lot of people expected them to at least compete, maybe even beat the Dragons, and they ended up losing that one. So tomorrow's game is going to be very exciting. Yeah, I mean, the number one and number two seed from that chaos division, right? The, the Highland Ravens coming out and, and that, I mean, they were the four seed, I believe, coming into to this tournament. So yep. would have expected them potentially if you were just classifying it by top four, that'll be a tough matchup for tomorrow. But I mean, you got you got predictions, you got predictions. Who, who takes these last two spots going to Worlds? Uh, the Dragons looked really good yesterday. So I'll take Dragons in that first set, second set. I, I think the Warriors are still a step above. So those will be my two picks. The Dragons and the Warriors. I think I, I think I got to match the, the predictions. The Dragons and the Warriors, maybe the predictions. We'll have to see in the matches tomorrow. But for today, that's going to do it for us. I've been Frog, been joined by Inbound from us, from everybody behind the scenes, the casters, the production uh, behind the studio. Thank you so much for coming out and watching, and we'll see you tomorrow.